you doing? All right, nice, nice to meet you, buddy. We will take you to the car. Just get through, okay? Yeah, what a drive. Okay. Yeah, oh, well, 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 thank you. Yeah, yeah, well, thanks for coming. Jeez. <laughs> what a, what a was, the, was the flight smooth? You know, it was. I loved it because, um, you know, you fly American and all those other airlines, like when I went to Kenya and when I went to Cuba, they, you know, you paid two, three thousand dollars. Yeah. This WestJet, 500 bucks. That's, I've never heard of it so cheap. And they give you all the alcohol you can drink for free. <laughs> when have you ever seen that, brother? Come on now. <laughs> so how's everything? Yeah, it's going good. How are you feeling energy-wise? You, you have know, you rested? I'm, I'm good. It's just like right now it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, that's what we were calculating on the but way I'm here. I'm good, brother. I just, uh, just a long trip. How long was the flight? Well, it was a six-hour layover in Canada. Oh. And then... About 10 hours and 40 minutes, and then they were running late, so, but uh, it was great, it was cool, you know, it's, it's nice to be here, it's nice to be here. I think we got to go to the car park machine first, so it's on floor zero. I was like, wow, I couldn't believe it. How's the weather difference then? You're going to feel that in a bit. It's 104 degree, 104 degree in LA. I thought it was warm. It was warm? I thought it was warm. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't think that was like, I'm going to have to buy as I go. While Francis was here, it was warm. You know, I, I, I'll tell you, how about that other cat that you had on there? That Abbott guy, was he here too? Abbott. Abbott, yeah, he lives in England now. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Yeah, he I'm wondering how you're getting these people in the, he, in the he, studio. He, he lives on the south coast. Of England, yeah, yeah. So much for me and uh, and Zoom, Zoom my ass. He was like, my story's not gonna go on Zoom. Uh, I'm better than I'm Zoom. I'm gonna fly my ass over there. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's you know what's bizarre is I didn't I didn't know who you were till like yesterday. <laughs> no, watch this. I didn't know who you were. I contacted you because of what? I was trying to send word to Michael Thompson. Yes. To give me a call. Yeah. yeah. And then I saw the interview and I'm like. And we started conversing. Yeah. And then my 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 wife tells me, you know, you just gotta go there. You, you gotta get this done. Yeah. Well, there we are. Got you. Got you, President. I, I, I got a present for you. Oh, thank you. Right. We need to go up now to level five. So is it here? I'll follow your lead. This is your bed. Was it round round there? Wasn't it? Isn't that lift? Says lift here as well. Oh yeah. Oh, sorry, for you. So, it's first time in England? Oh, no, I was here in 73 and 75. Okay. When uh, we used to have Piccadilly and Square, I don't know if they still got it, but they used to have yeah. the, the Playboy Club. You have now. My uncle used to be a croupier. Yeah? Right there, yeah. Oh, cool, cool. In the 80s and 90s. Claremont Club, have you heard of that one? Claremont and uh, I think there's what. I was a youngster, so I don't appreciate it. Like, I'm gonna just, uh, yeah. I'm already looking at Paris for a week and Sicily, Catania. Wow. And to go smoke a bowl in Still Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. Sounds it. good. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta love uh, You gotta love it. After 40 years, you gotta see the world now and enjoy yourself. Well, I did Kenya. Kenya. But then what happened at the Hotel du Set? What are the odds of that? It's crazy. I thought it was a movie. It was they were attacking. Terrorist attack. Yeah. The 17th of July, three years ago. Wow. And when they said all Brits go in the chow hall and all Americans go in the gymnasium, I said, no, I'm going to stay here in the room. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I like this one. Like yeah, it's, it's more relaxing. It got too hot, I think. We don't have AC. I love this. This is beautiful weather right here. Yeah, we have a heat wave in LA right now that's unseen. 115 in the desert. Oh, it's Arizona temperature. So. Yeah, 115. It's 105 in Imperial Valley. Where I live, it's going to be 103 today. Wow. I, like, I got out just in the nick of yeah, time. <laughs> hey, I'm proud of you. Oh. 
Me no, too, man. Hey, I'm telling you, I'm proud of you. You know, uh, money don't make a man, but uh, when a man has a good heart, it's doing what you're doing. So, you know, that's, that's where it's at, man. Everything we do, we try and do it with love and purity. That's all you got to do the day. Yeah. You know? There's too much hate in the world. You know, I love Charles Manson. Charlie didn't kill anybody. People need to understand that. He was 20 miles away from it. Tex Watson said, hey, I'm going to go kill And he goes, hey, go ahead. I'm having an orgy on over here. I don't care what you do. Tex Watson was the killer, not Charlie. Not heard this side of the story. Yeah, either. Charlie's not. Charlie's a hundred pounds soaking wet. You, 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 uh, uh, a nine-year-old could beat Charlie's ass. <laughs> and Charlie's a, fa a fraud. He's a he's a facade. He, they made him into that. He, he would do an interview and he'd come by my cell and he'd look at me and he'd go, "Showtime!" And he'd go out there and go crazy. And people ate it up. I do I I do his mail for him. Me and Michael. I do his mail. We stole the central file and sold it online. I used to have uh, my attorneys mailing eight by tens of them. And I'll tell you, people were paying us for his hair. So I go to the barber shop, pick up a bag of hair, and would set it out in letters. And for ten dollars, they get a strand of Charlie's hair. And a lot of it was from over here. He had a he, there's a motorcycle club here in England, Manson. There's a motorcycle club you know from Charles England. Man. That's Charles Manson. Yeah. Wow. What but, about Sirhan Sirhan? But did you oh, speak man, to him a lot? Listen, the man that's sitting here in front of you was schooled by two people. Michael Thompson and Sirhan Sirhan. Michael Thompson reviewed my legal work that I would put in. He'd correct my spelling with the computer he had. He was the only prisoner in the system that had a printer in a cell. And Sirhan would give me a word every day out of the dictionary reciprocal, fundamental, and every yeah. morning he'd school me on what it meant and what would the, it, it was just, you know, a, another man that didn't speak. If he said one word a day, it was a big thing. Did you, so you know about the assassination of Bobby Kennedy? Yes, did he, well. did he, um, he, he Did he know what happened to him in the months leading up to the assassination because they, they say if he was brainwashed he had to have been taken away from his family for so much time that, does he that, remember that period no, no that isn't what you know his, his story is he left an abusive family came here and you know they, the, the gun the, the, there was too many shots I mean he even has the family members of the Kennedy now going to the pro board trying to get him out because yeah. new evidence has come up but it's beyond my uh, my my knowledge right now to, to to say something I don't know. So yeah. all I know is that uh, does he feel he was um, part of a plot? You know, he never told me. He never spoke about it. Right. He never spoke about it. Yeah. But uh, like I say, every every day he he tried to enhance my vocabulary and make me a better person. So yeah. I can't say anything bad about him. Yeah. Either, you know because. I looked into the MK Ultra thing, and they they um, reckon that he was taken away from his family, and it took a couple of months to program him. Oh well, yeah, you know the, the speculation. Yeah, you, know, you, you could think any. You know, they say that about Charles Manson as well, don't no, they? That Charlie, he was part Charlie's of just his... a, Charlie's just a Southern California hippie that just got caught up in the media. That's that's all Charlie was. Yeah. Charlie wasn't that. He was out in the Spawn Ranch, and uh, he had five, ten girls, and and all he was doing was getting high and fucking. That's all Charlie wanted to do: get high and fuck. Tex Watson was the evil mind, yeah. not Charlie. Charlie, like I said, if you would if you would have spent ten minutes with Charlie, you'd be laughing your ass off. Yeah. Charlie was just uh, he was the guy that you'd bring to the party and just. Yeah, yeah, Charlie was just a character, yeah. man. There wasn't a bad bone in Charlie, man. I, I, rest in peace. But, uh, yeah. But you have to understand, I've known these men since I was 18. So for 20 years, wow. I woke up every day with these men and went to sleep, had dinner with them. 
But um, yeah, we used to have a hellified poker game with Charles Manson, Juan Corona, Michael Thompson, and Sirhan. Tell me that ain't a poker uh, game. Wow. Huh? Who used to win? Uh, <laughs> Well, everybody pretty much yeah. did because we were after 20 years of playing poker, we were all sharks yeah, at it. Pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's been a hell of a journey. It's been a hell of a journey. I still laugh when people ask me my cell number. I tell them cell block six. <laughs> you get it? CB6. No, when they say, what's your cell number? They mean phone. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That yeah. threw me off. What's your so, cell number, cell block six? So here, we don't say cell phone, we say mobile phone. Oh, mobile, okay. Yes. Oh. California cell number. What's your cell, yeah. <laughs> it's your cell number, yeah. But yeah, it's it's a blessing, you know. You know, and I'm here not just only for them being a part of my life, but for me taking the time to get educated, to receive my associates, my bachelors, to put myself in law school find the way to get out, find that writ of error quorum novus that hasn't been used since 1942. You know, if you ever get a chance to Google it, Google writ of error quorum novus. It's so obscure. Yeah. I'll, I'll never forget, brother, it was my birthday, May 4th, and it was 2002, and the attorneys were coming to visit me to represent me for the pro board. And they said, we're here to represent you. And I said, well, I just filed a writ of error quorum novus. And these two Harvard attorneys that are donating their time, they looked at each other and looked at me and said, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> and if anybody gets a chance, Google writ of error quorum novus is so obscure, it hasn't been used since the 40s. How did you dig that up? Well, see, every day, every day, I would go to the law library and I'd come back with stacks of books under my arm, my beanie rolled up, a big cigar. And all the guys, all the lifers would be playing poker saying, hey, what are you doing now? I go, I'm going home, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And about a year into it, about three o'clock in the morning, I found it. Rid of error quorum novus. At any time during your sentence, if an error was made that isn't a fault of the plaintiff or the defendant, you could file back to the original sentencing court for a modification of sentence. And that's what I did. And it was denied over 50 times because there's no limit to how many times you could file it. So what I would do is all the girls would send me naked pictures and I'd make copies of the naked pictures and I'd sell them for stamps so I could pay the postage to keep fighting for my life. Wow. And that's what I did. I sold porno pictures and, and did immigration cases. I did a lot of immigration cases a lot of divorces, and that's how I made my money surviving there by doing law work. When that writ went through, did it, it was, didn't you abbreviate it from previous filings? Um, no, what I did was see, this is so, this is so, this is what makes the writ such a phenomenal legal tool. Because a writ of error quorum nobis, N-O-B-I-S, once it's denied, it turns into a writ of error quorum vobis, V-O-B-I-S, which makes it straight federal. So now you bypass the state. Now you're in the federal courts. And Judge Richard Camby from Phoenix, Arizona, Ninth Circuit, he was the one who granted it, sent back, ordered them to release me. They refused to release me. I had to file again. Because what happened when I went back, brother, this is really bizarre. When I went back, they sentenced me to 25 to life again. But they didn't give me credit for the 30 years I had served. Yeah, I read that. that so was here I was with a V number. I get you a new number and everything. A new number, and I wasn't going to the Pro Board until 2041. And I was like, no, and nobody in there wanted to hear about it. But let me tell you, brother, this is my, my wife, she always tells me this. So one day it's raining, and they call me to the warden's office, and I'm thinking, wow, my mom and dad are dead, so it can't be that. So, you know, what could it be? And it was some Mexican guy, and he sat me down, and he had a young kid in there. He goes, you remember me? I go, no. He goes, the year was 1986, Tracy Prison. You told me to take off my badge and come in the cell. See that scar on my head? I go, oh, my God. And he told his son, I've been telling my son about you since he was a kid, that I got knocked out by the great Joey Torres. <laughs> and he... That man, his name was Warden Solis, he had my counselor 
say, contact the district attorney. This is wrong. So they changed my V number. They gave me credit, made me eligible for parole. And then henceforth, I had a fight again. And that's how I had the state order the parole board to show cause why I shouldn't be released. Those parole people had it in for you, didn't they? Especially the head. Yeah, but what happened afterwards, what happened afterwards is that the governor, uh, Governor Jerry Brown, he came in, brother, and he took all those guys, those board members, and fired them. And he put in all ex-CDC captains, lieutenants. So when I went in there, he goes, hey, I knew I was good when he said he called me Boxer. He goes, hey, good news, Boxer, you're going home. <laughs> Bad news is that the governor has 90 days to either grant it or deny it. So for 90 days, my asshole was puckered. Woo! And when he granted it, I cried like a little girl, man. Man, that was amazing, brother. Amazing to get out after all those years, you know? Yeah. And freedom is a beautiful thing. People don't understand it until you lose it. For, I mean, 40 years, that's just mind-boggling. Yeah, I figured, you know, that's why I said I've known Charlie, I've known Michael, I've known Sirhan since I was a kid. A kid. Yeah. It was saving the life of a correctional officer being raped. I mean, come on, tell me that won't change your life. Yeah. How, what man could stand by and watch two black guys beat her in the face and suck her titties? Who, you know, what? Do you guys think you could watch that? Come on, yeah, man. Stuck him. Man. I sure wish I had the video for that beatdown I put on him. You would have loved that one. Yeah, brother, it's, it is what it is. So this is the first on our channel. Joey has just basically just jumped on a flight and come from LA. Like he's only known me for a couple of days. And we had some great conversations on the phone that led to this. Joey has served 40 years in the California prison system. Well, some of it was out of state as well, but 40 year sentence. And he served a lot of that with Michael Thompson, Saran Saran, Charles Manson. This whole thing came about because he saw the Mike Thompson interview and he contacted me and we started chatting. And the scope of his story though, so his book is Bamboozled. And it starts with a young lad growing up in the hood in Cali, LA, um, 18th Street Gang is a big part of his life and boxing gangs, fights, and there's a quote which is still going on to this day, it's where are you from? So if you're from the wrong part and you're running you know, in the wrong, the wrong area or the wrong guys come up to you, it's on site right away. Then Joey ends up, he has a boxing manager and the boxing manager gets murdered. Joey gets sentenced to five years to the youth authority as a young person, but there is an illegal resentencing where he receives 25 to life. He saves a female prison guard from getting sexually assaulted. He does get out because he studies the law and he finds this obscure method of getting out, but they put him back in. And when were you actually released? I served another 10 years. I was released on uh, the 15th of December, 2015. It's, it must be mind blowing for people that you've gone through this. So out of that 40 years then, I know we're going to get to your whole backstory soon and start it, but I think it will be quite gripping for the public. If you just talked a bit about this prison that you were in with Mike Thompson and Saran Saran and Charlie Manson, how long were you having lunch with those guys for? 20 years. 20 years. 20 years. I've known Charlie and I've known uh, Juan and Sirhan since I was 18. And that was 19... 94, so you figure 20, 25 years I've known. I've known Charlie since I was a kid. I've known uh, Sirhan. Sirhan, as I told you earlier, Sirhan was my, uh, my mentor. You know, he told me that I, I was intelligent and I should stay away from the gangs and start educating myself. And then Michael Thompson, the briefs that I would do, Michael Thompson had a printer and he would correct my spelling and and give me insight into how to attack the system in a fundamental way that will get the attention of the courts. And that all came from Michael Thompson and, and Sirhan. 
So people hearing these stories like Mike Thompson's in the comments, they say, there's no way prison could ever have been like that, that violent. So I'm just going to read something from The Independent, which is a newspaper, a prestigious newspaper in the UK, one of the prisons you were at. And Thompson touched on this as well. So the headline is staged fight, betting guards, gunfire and death for the gladiators. So violent inmates at California's top max security jail prison were purred off in staged fight as guards bet on the outcomes. This was reported by the LA Times in 1996 as well. That's, that's, that's weird. That's... In, in some cases, prisoners who refused to stop fighting were shot dead. Shot dead by the guards. This is documented. In a ritual that became known as Gladiator Days, known enemies at Corcoran State Prison were released from their cells and purred off like fighting cocks in empty prison yards. So were you forced to participate in that, Joey? I fought three times. And then uh, after I made the lieutenant some money, Lieutenant Riggs, um, he made me the, the office clerk. And right when you were saying that, I just had a flashback. It was about the size of a football field from the captain's office to the housing unit. And when I would get off work or they knew something was happening, me and the lieutenant and the nurse and the doctor and an ambulance would slowly go across the yard. And before we even got to the unit, they would, you would hear the gunfire. They, were, they knew ahead of time that they were going to kill somebody. Think of that. You think that that would happen, the ambulance would come and the office would come after the shot. But before we got to the building, they would kill somebody. That's when they killed Tate. That is cold, man. And there was a guy in here who was an inmate who was killed that you knew. Let me just keep going down this article. Um, Warden, it was done under Warden George Smith. Yeah, George Smith. It was dubbed Mushroom George. Yeah, he had a mushroom nose because he drank so much his nose looked like Rudolph. <laughs> yeah, the John Wayne uh, uh, picture in his office. Yep, yep. He, was, he used to say there's a new sheriff in town. Over eight years, seven were shot dead. Five in the 18 months after Smith took over, more than 50 were wounded. More than in any other prison, gunfire rang out every day and yeah. shootings were covered up. Yeah, yes they were. The disclosures in the prison built in California's San Joaquin Valley come against a drumbeat of demands for tougher treatment of prisoners. Guards and inmates described scenes in which prison officers gathered in control booths overlooking cramped exercise yards in advance of the fights, which were sometimes delayed so that female guards and secretaries could be present. Yeah, they would, they'd all go there for lunch and they'd put two guys out on the yard to fight and they'd bet on who they think is going to win. And if they didn't win, they'd shoot them. The officers were armed with gas guns that fired wooden blocks and rifles. Yep, yep yes, sir, yes, sir. So they purred off members of rival black and Latino gangs. That's what they would do, north, south, whites, blacks, and they'd bet on them. So who were the gangs that were dominant in the prison system in California back in that year? Still are. Uh, that'd be the South Side, that'd be the Southsiders and the Aryan Brotherhood. And now they have a clique called the Pesetas, which are the PCs, guys. They have their own gang now. So it was. it's usually just, like I said, for me it was different, Sean, because I was a lifer. And I don't know if you know this, but when you're a lifer... It's a whole different ball game. Because nobody's going to fuck with a lifer because you're doing life. I have no reason not to kill you and they can't give me any more time. So lifers didn't go through as much as other inmates went through. Lifers showered together. Lifers knew. I would ask my friend, how's your daughter? And he'd say, Joey, she graduated college. And I'd remember a little five-year-old in the visiting room. So when you're a lifer, you spend more time with your fellow lifers like Sirhan, Juan, Michael, you know, Shorty Shrek and Ghost, Lyle Hood, we'd play poker all day, and that was our life. So this article references Preston Tate. Who was he and what happened to him? Preston was a good kid from L.A., and they just, uh, they set him up. They set him up. So he had one of these fights? He was a good fighter, but uh, he lost. <laughs> and that made a lot of the... Um the guards got exposed after this killing, did they? 60 Minutes came in. 60 Minutes did a, a big investigation. The FBI came to the prison. 
um, they just ran roughshod because uh, the warden was running a prison without no he had no one to answer to. He would tell Sacramento, "I'm not listening to you. This is my prison." So if he wanted you dead, you were dead. Who were the sharks? They were the sharks were the. I don't know what sharks you're talking about. A group about. of officers known as the Sharks. Oh, that was their gang. I thought you, we call we call the child molester sharks because they're always in the shower looking at. We call them shower sharks. <laughs> shower they're always, sharks. They're always looking for your dick in the shower. <laughs> so I thought you meant those shower sharks. No, the uh, the Corcoran officers had tattoos of sharks, and they had their own gang. Corcoran cops had their own gang. I mean, I'm sure Mike will tell you about the the Telus guy. Uh, Tomas, he was an officer in the building, and Michael told me to put paperwork on him because every time he would come in, he would lock me on the tier, my handcuff on the rail, and leave me there the whole shift. And that's why I, I say so much about Michael because I didn't know how to litigate at the time. And uh, Mr. Thompson, Michael showed me how to do it properly. And when I needed help with arranging it in a, in, in, so it could be unheard and understood, then I'd take it to Sirhan, and Sirhan would say, no, you spelled this wrong, got to bring this over here. So when a busload of new arrivals came, how did the Sharks receive them? Just looking as, who's the next gladiator? Who's the next going to make some money? Because this was a betting thing. You'd have officers coming on lunch because the prison's locked down. So you'd have officers coming from other buildings at lunchtime. And we would be in our cells watching them up there and just waiting for the gunfire. There'd be like four girls up there. They'd be eating pizzas, the cuss, and then they'd let one in from one side. And it's the same thing as here as you have. It'd be them up here looking down. And they'd say, stop. And if you didn't stop, they'd shoot them. And that's why I say it's so ridiculous because I got off work at 2 o'clock every day in the office. And I'd see them stroll across. When you see an ambulance go somewhere before the gunfire, come on. <laughs> that's, that's, you can't tip a hat no more than that. They even let Charlie's door open once. They wanted Charlie fucked up. So they left Charlie's door open. Why did they want him fucked up? Because Charlie, Charlie's Charlie. Charlie get on a jump on a table and go crazy and tell the cops where to go. And so they opened the gate for him to come out so he'd get attacked. And you've got a completely different perspective of Charles Manson from what the media have portrayed him. Well, any, anybody with their salt that, that, that you know, uh, would, would to look into it would understand that the murders transpired in Los Angeles and he was in Santa Susana at the ranch with his girls having orgies. He told me, he said, Joey, I was having orgies with 10 girls doing meth, doing, at that time, LSD, and Tex came and said, hey, I'm going to go you get, Go do it. I don't give a shit. They say if that crime transpired now, they, Charlie wouldn't have been arrested. Because it's, it, it, it's all about you telling me to do... It's hearsay. That's a hearsay case. So when you say crime, you're on about the Tate. The Tate LaBianca. He was a whole city away. But yet Tex said Charlie told him to do it. And Bugliosi, the district attorney, it was Vietnam going on. They wanted to take their eyes off of Vietnam. And they made Charlie. And Charlie was the greatest patsy of them all because he wanted to be an artist. He wanted to be a singer. He had relationships with the Beach Boys. He had relationships with... He, want, he was, a, a, you know, an up-and-coming artist. And he, he grew this cult with these girls. He was a major pimp, a major player. But he was never a killer. Charlie weighs 100 bucks soaking wet, and uh, any, a girl could whip Charlie's ass. Charlie was just the right person at the right time. And, you know, I remember he would go to do it. Jar, Charlie, you're doing NBC. And he'd come out of his cell, and he'd come to me, and he'd go, how do I look? And he'd go, showtime. And that was Charlie. But Charlie was a good guy. He'd give you the shirt off his back. So when he was pulling all these faces and going and saying hell to skeleton, all, that was all an act, was it? That's, yeah, that was all an act. He'd, he'd get bags of mail every day. I, 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 received, I, did, I responded to all his mail. And he was loved because they loved him for that, but they didn't understand that he was the biggest farce there was. 
And was it an industry created around his her? Excuse me? Selling his her? Oh, we would take the bags of hair out of the barber shop because people wanted locks of his hair. And we'd send him to, I remember writing to England many times and said, he, he, mostly all his fans were from England. All the mail I received were from England because I remember the envelopes had red, green, red going all the way around the end. You don't get that in LA. Those are via airmail ones. <laughs> and they were from England. And you said there was a guy called the Booty Bandit. Or... The Booty Bandit was uh, the same thing as uh, when they had the stage fights. If you fucked up in there, they had a big old guy they called the Booty Bandit. And it, that guards would open your door and he'd go in and fuck you in the ass. Yeah, he's, he was notorious. Maybe you should put Corker and Booty Bandit and see what pops up on that. But yeah, the Booty Bandit, was a, he's a legend. <laughs> So this is just the introduction to Joey's story. We've not even started yet. I forgot to mention, he's kind of got this um, ability, this unique ability to create an enterprise and a charity to help young people with the top sports cars, sports stars in the country. Uh, Daryl Strawberry, your friends with Mike Tyson. And he, he would phone them from prison and get them to go to these events and organize these deals with them, sending them to Japan, around the world. You'd get your piece. But the bottom line was, quite quickly after you were apprehended, you were on a mission to keep the young kids away from drugs. What, your Boxers Against Drugs? I found it bad, Boxers Against Drugs, in 1986. After saving the officer's life, I was sent out of state. I was sent to uh, Gene, Nevada. And I remembered Eric Davis, great ball player, Cincinnati Reds, Los Angeles Dodger, and Daryl Strawberry, whose mother was so great to me. I grew up with her. I grew up with the family. And I contacted them from prison. And uh, they would do anything for me. But they let other players know, like Deion Sanders. And so the word got out that sometimes during the ball game, they'd hit a ball and end up at first base. And the conversation was, how's Joey doing? So I started representing athletes because their agents would only focus on the contract to play, not to get them endorsements. So the players would give me permission. I would contact Reebok, Nike, and say, hey, I'm Joey Torres, the ex-champ. I represent Emmett Smith. I represent Daryl Strawberry. And I would negotiate deals and then turn it over to the player for a finder's fee, all from prison. And another huge theme of your story is the mafia, your connection to the Gambinos. And um, as I was speaking to you in recent days, I told you I'd just got back from a tour with Michael Francis, and you were aware you had some association with those guys as well? Well, I grew up, my brother Luigi, my, my mother Sicilian. My mother, uh, my mother married, my mother did something in 1940 that no Sicilian girl did. She married a Puerto Rican. So the uncle said, you go or you die. So we moved to California, but we stood in, New York, every year we visited my Uncle Frank Genovese, my, my mother's uh, Conchetta Gifrida. They have that Gifrida Anisette company in Sicily. So I came up in that environment. I, uh, I remember 1973 being 13 years old, me and my brother driving to Chino Prison to pick up Jimmy the Weasel Frediani, who took me straight to the gym with Ray Giarusso and Billy Bonanno and he's trying to show me how to throw a left hook. So that was, and, and when I became 15, 16 in the Golden Gloves, if they needed somebody taken care of, that sent me to uh, baptize them, as we call it. And what's your thoughts on Michael Francis? Uh, salt of the earth, straight shooter. Um, I know him through Cha Cha. I know he, I don't drop names, but he's, he's uh, you know, it is what it is. It is what it is. He's a good man. He, everything that he says is truthful and honest. He knows where the bodies are buried. So, uh, but he's, he's, he's a man among men. So, pa Panorama City? Panorama City. What was that like? Um, you know, it, it was a good life. It's just, uh, I was too big for it. I was too violent. But know? when did it start? The violence? Yeah, when did you start getting into trouble? What, what age? 12, 13. 
What kind of trouble was that? I would fight. I would love to fight. I wanted to be the best fighter. And I fought at the ups and downs. It was uh, back in the 70s, everybody was skateboarding back in California. So we'd go to an empty pool, and whoever came out of the empty pool was a winner. And so my sister would take me, the family would come, and they'd bet, and then I'd, I'd take on all comers. At that time, I was training with one of the greatest of all time, Benny the Jet Yukitas, the world full contact karate champion, and his sister Lily and Blinky, and uh, we trained every day. We ran every morning, we trained. I taught uh, beginner's class on Saturdays for karate, and we toured around the world fighting. So when you're 15, 16 years old, and you're going to school, uh, not too many kids could deal with you. So when you first met the karate guy, is this the guy that you said to him, you're a boxer and you'd beat up any karate guy? Yeah, I learned the, I learned the hard way. <laughs> what happened? Because uh, he, he told me he fought for money, so I went out and stole a bunch of eight tracks and stole a bunch of money, and, and uh, we put it up, and I think he knocked me out in maybe the first minute with a spinning back kick, his trademark. But uh, we were unboundable friends after that. And uh, my sister baptized his daughter, and I would eat there. His mother was a wrestler in Mexico. They're five brothers. Like I said, again, if you look it up online, he's a legend. Anyone that knows martial arts knows who Benny Yukitas is. If you watch the movie um, Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze, Benny's the choreographer. So Benny's, uh, he's legendary. And what about siblings then, growing up with brothers and sisters? My brother was in prison in Arizona in Florence Penitentiary. My brother got arrested with a gas tanker full of marijuana, and he ended up in Florence. Um, my, my brother, uh, Morrow, I didn't know too much because I was always in jail. I was always in juvenile hall. I started going to juvenile hall in 1972 when I was 12 for runaway. So my life was spent on the streets because I loved the streets. I loved walking the streets because the streets had no rules. What about school and studies? Never graduated, never graduated. It took me to go to prison with a life sentence to, read, to obtain my associate and my bachelor's degree. And how did you get introduced to drugs? Well, I, my manager, well back then in the 70s fighters, I saw fighters Alexis Arguello, I saw so many fighters that were doing cocaine and partying, and it just became a thing where on the weekends, during the week we would train like a beast, but on the weekends I'd hit my cavassier and a couple lines of cocaine, and it was disco. At that time it was Donna Summer, and everybody was disco ducking it. <laughs> and you had some female friends back then, but one of them got killed by a serial killer. That's... Um, That'll stay with me forever. Mm. Who was the killer? Um, Klein. He was, uh, they called him the West Side Killer in L.A. And, uh, yeah, he killed her in Venice. I'll never forget that one. Did they get him eventually? Yes. Yes, they did. Was he death penalty? Or? Yes, he's, he was death penalty. I don't know what transpired after that. So... The violence escalated, didn't it? And you started to go uh, collecting? I collect money for my brother. Uh, you know, good issue is um, there was a muffler shot. They owned Frank Sica. Our, at that time in the 70s, Frank Sica and Joe Sica were the representatives of the New York crime family in the Los Angeles area. And they ran the show. And my brother had Luigi's Pizza Parlor on Lancashire in Van Nuys, California. And uh, we, it was a family. I mean, we all knew that they were mob, but when, when something's mob, you don't say it's mob because you grow up with it and it's just part of your being. It's not a big thing. But uh, yeah, Frank and Joe would, would tell Louis, uh, hey, send, send your brother. And I'd go do what I gotta do and they bless me with uh, a lot of money. A lot of money for a kid. <laughs> You had an altercation on the streets with a guy you ran into later in the prison system, and this guy was trying to kill you, didn't he shoot you? Yeah, he shot me. Could you give the whole story of that? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, he shot you, and you didn't you chase him down after he shot you? Yeah. 
Can you describe that bit? No. No? Because <laughs> is there a statute of limitations on that stuff? Or? Yeah, yeah. Okay, gotcha. All right. And then you were also teaching boxing. Um, was, but was that in the youth authority, was it? I had a program in prison, boxing program in prison in Tracy. And that's when we were fighting in Tracy. So they had, back in the 70s, the California Department of Corrections, I thought it was a great program. And I thought they should have never stopped it because it stopped the violence. Because what happened is if I have a problem with you, would say, okay, next month on the 1st, we're going to fight. So I'd see you running, you see me running, and for a month, everybody's betting on who's going to win. And they would come to fight night at Tracy. They called it gladiator school. And you get in the ring, and uh, whoever won, won. So that went on for years. So the guy whose murder you were sentenced for, because you were sentenced, you can, you can explain what happened there, can't you? Oh yeah, oh yeah. That's uh, I served forty years for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jose Luis Ramirez. I was introduced to him through Carlos Palomino, the welterweight champion of the world. He told me he could make me famous, and I believed it. I started doing fights. Uh, back then, it was they called them tough guy fights, and I started winning and making money. I had to keep my amateur status because I was still an amateur fighter. And if you accepted money, you could no longer keep your status. So I fought anywhere for money. And uh, I was told that he had spent the money that he was supposedly saving for me. I went to see him. He pulled a gun. We fought. The gun went off. Um, I was arrested. I pled guilty because I was guaranteed five years in the Youth Authority. In fact, he was shot in the shoulder. And with my luck, the gun bullet ricocheted through his body. He was shot with a, one of those Derringers that shoot a mini 22. Yeah. And I was told that because I was 18, 17, turning 18, that if I pled guilty, I'd be sentenced to five years in the California Youth Authority. I pled guilty to first degree murder. I was sentenced to the Youth Authority not to exceed my 21st birthday. While in prison, I had a girlfriend that was living near the prison. She was scared of the area in Stockton, California. So I told her, go to, the, go to a pawn shop and buy a gun. And I put it in the mail, and they took that letter. And at that time, 1978, uh, the law, law would reflect they were trying juveniles as adults. That's when the law came out in the United States. They remanded me back to custody, back to the L.A. County Jail. The judge refused to withdraw the plea bargain. He said, you pled guilty to murder one, that's what I'm sentencing you to. He resentenced me to 25 to life. How did that feel? That's, that's uh, well, you figure I was 24 months to going home. Now I've got 25 to life. So I, I went off in prison. I just, uh, there was nothing I wouldn't do in prison. I was a beast. I was a beast for many years. I was a beast up until the officer got raped. That's what changed my life. All right, let's, let's, let's stay on the early stuff for now. So, 18th Street Gang, what does that mean for the English public who are not familiar with all this American gang culture? 18th Street, what, what's that about? That? Yep. <laughs> Explain to them what, what it means. 18th Street, 18th yeah. and Grand. We used to be called Clanton, Clanton Boys. And Were you a founder of this gang? I was a founder, co-founder with my, my, my big homie, Boxer, the big Boxer from 18th Street. Two Boxers. Yeah, I, I was Baby Boxer and he was Big Boxer. And he was your crime partner on the streets. Yeah, I was my he? crime partner. And uh, we started 18th. We were living on 18th Street. But see, the reason why our gang is the biggest gang well, at least that's what it says online. We're the biggest gang in the United States. Presently? Presently. Wow. We are the, the biggest gang. Uh, because our gang, being Puerto Rican and Sicilian, Mexican gangs weren't accepting anybody. But because he was Salvadoranian and I was Puerto Rican and Sicilian, we were the only gang in L.A. that has blacks, Chinese. That's why our gang is, is so big. I'm still, I still love my gang. Hope you're enjoying this podcast. There's a word from our sponsor, Rocket Money. The other day, I had to cancel free Amazon Prime memberships. I had a personal on the UK, Amazon, US, Amazon, 
company account, US Amazon, UK Amazon. Do you understand how hard it is to cancel these bloody things? That's why Rocket Money makes these things so much easier, formerly known as Truebill. The app shows all your subscriptions in one place and cancels what you don't want for you. Rocket Money can even find subscriptions you didn't know you were paying for. Just like with me, with my four Amazon Prime memberships, you may find out you've been at least double charged for a subscription. To cancel a subscription, all you've got to do is press cancel and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Get rid of useless subscriptions with Rocket Money now. Go to rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Seriously, it could save you hundreds per year. That's rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Thank you for supporting our sponsor, Rocket Money. Links in the description box. Cheers. I'll always be boxer from 18th Street. I wear it on the back of my head with pride. And I shave it every day so people can see it when I walk in the room. That's my gang. That's where I'm from. What kind of stuff did you and Big Boxer get up to? There wasn't anything that we didn't do. Is there any stories you can tell the viewers about that's not too heavy? Well, you know, it's, it's the gang life in L.A. is every street corner. Every street corner is a different corner. So you have to walk where you, you have to watch everything you do in L.A. Living in East L.A., you don't go to the West Side. The West Side, you don't go to Compton. But um, 18th Street has no problem anywhere. Wasn't there a funny story of how you met Big Boxer? Because didn't you guys fight in the beginning? Yeah, where you from? Uh, yeah, SS. How did you meet him then? Oh my God, I can't even remember. <laughs> it's been so long, brother. <laughs> it's been so long. But there was a dispute. Yeah, over the, yeah. Right. And then you beat him, didn't you? And he was respected you. I beat him and we became, yeah, that was it. Yeah. <laughs> this is what happens when you get old. <laughs> So, um, do you want to just leave it at here, here for now? Um, keep rolling. You want to keep rolling? Yeah. Cool. Okay, okay. All right, so we'll go forward then to um, where you're in prison. So what were your early years like in the youth authority? Just gangbang. Just violent gangbangs, violent. You know, when you go to bed at night and you hear shh, shh, shh on the floor... And you know, they're sharpening knives and you don't know if it's coming for you. And when you have to live with that every day, it's, um, it's unimaginable. I mean, to think being in your bathroom, a room as big as your bathroom, and there's 5,000 other guys in there on lockdown and all you hear is nothing because it's so quiet because something's jumping off. And you hear the, sh the sharpening of knives. And you see kites being passed under the door. It's, um, it's very strenuous. It's very taxing on one's soul. And to live like that for 40 years, it, it, I don't know how I did it. I really don't. I, I have to say the only reason, the first person I saw when I got out was Benny Yukita's. And I told him, if it wasn't for you, I'd be dead. What you taught me in the dojo, how you taught me to be a bad son of a bitch at 15, saved my life to this day. I mean, I sent you the video. <laughs> you recently got in a fight. Got in a fight over a parking space. Where are you from? First thing he said, where are you from? And he was 20 something. 22. And you kicked his ass. Beat him like a drum. <laughs> <laughs> I, hope, I hope you show that video. <laughs> do, you think we, do you think we can include that video? It's a violation or? No. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're going to show you the video now, so stay tuned. And, man, you've still got those skills, haven't you? I'm 62 years old. I try to work out every day. Um, but I think it was just muscle memory. It, you know, it's, it's, it's like when somebody says, watch out, and, you, and the dummy goes, huh? Or the guy that says, watch out, and he bobs underneath it, you know. I think it's, like I said, it was the training from Benny that kept me alive. It was the constant daily front ball kick, roundhouse kick, bob and weave, to, to be able to know it and feel it. So from our interviews with Mike Thompson and John Abbott, we know it was like Aryan Brotherhood, La M.A., yes. um, Black Girl Family. 
If you're a founder of 18th Street, which is multiracial, Emma. how do you fit into the mix in prison? Emma. Let Emma? Yeah. But didn't they have beefs with you in the beginning? Weren't they sweating you to try and pay them something? Yeah. At one time, they greenlighted 18th Street because we weren't paying rent. And um, they put a green light on everybody from 18th Street. And so you had to stay on your toes for a while. And then after a year, members from my neighborhood became Emma, Emma soldiers. And uh, that's what's made my, neighbor, my neighborhood strong. But yes, Emma, Sureño, Southside, S13, Sur. That's our, uh, that's our moniker. That's who we are. So during that beef, did anyone come to you with a blade? No, I was affiliated with the M at the time because of my brother's connection. I got blessed in there by Big D, Donald Garcia, or rest in peace. And uh, I, had, I never had problems. Uh, I was ordered to kill one of my own, and I told, they wanted me to kill my homeboy Penguin. And so what I did was I told Penguin, hey, I got to kill you, so lock it up. But uh, that's, that's the life in there. And then you got the, you got the Aryan Brotherhood, you got... You, and they're, they're back in the Eme, and the BGF is black in the Northerners. So it's a constant, but, but now that I reflect upon it, Sean, and that's why I've tried to change this, to break it, is that it's more input by the guards in the system to make it continually happen, because that's their job security. If I have you fighting that guy, you gotta, Christmas, Christmas is the best for the guards. They throw a couple bullets over the fence. They lock the prison down. Now they get overtime while they're looking for the... And there's no bullets. They just did it so they could get overtime on Christmas. Triple time. So we know from Abbott and Thompson about San Quentin, how violent that was. Was the youth authority, was that a gladiator school? Yes, YTS, youth training school. That's... Uh, YT, Preston. Preston was the dungeon in Northern California. That's where they housed the baddest juveniles there were. Did you spend I, time in the dungeon? I, I spent a year in the dungeon. For I, what? For stabbing, for a, a suspicion of stabbing someone in the chow hall. But... Um, what was conditions like in the dungeon? Just dreary and cold. It was built back in the 1800s. It's, it's called Preston Tamarack. And they put you down there and they just forget about you. Did you get a green bologna sandwich at least? You know, we didn't get that. We got what they call yard bird. It was a piece of chicken, but it had hair on it. So you had to pull the hair off the chicken and try to get some kind of, ch out of a whole chicken, you were happy it, that it wasn't green and the bone wasn't green or red. Yeah, that, that's some bad food, man. There's some... There's some bad food in there, and I, I can't eat another Top Ramen. And if I see another Top Ramen, I'm going to kill somebody. <laughs> Did you get two meals a day? Um, two meals a day, a lunch box, a box full of bologna that I gave to the cats. I threw it over the fence for the dogs and the cats because you couldn't eat it. And then at nighttime, you were happy if you got a warm meal. Yeah, it's, it's, it, was, it was very bad. And at this point then, if you're locked down in the dungeon, what was your daily routine? Um, just burpees. You were, I'd do burpees in the cell, a shadow box. I'd try to read anything I could get a hold of. You know, the guards would leave a newspaper a month old and I'd, I'd read it 10 times over just to, just to read it. But um, it was, you were on 23 hour lockdown. You came out an hour a day to shower, to use the phone. And then you were back into the next day. Never saw the moon. I tell people this. I never saw the moon for 30 years. How did the guards treat you in the youth authority? Then they treated me as boxer from 18th Street. They treated me very bad. And, um, but it was, I didn't know anything else. That's the thing. It was the culture. You know, it, like I say, everything in my life, Sean, reflects upon my life changing when that officer was raped. So when you ask me something, I could tell you the baddest son of a bitch I was. But I also tell you that once I saw that officer getting raped, I thought of my sister. I thought of another woman. And that changed my life. And that really turned the whole perspective for me into saying, hey, that's what they want me to be. That's who they're showing me to be. But I'm better than that. 
And that's why I say it took Sirhan Sirhan to tell me, out of all these guys, you're the most intelligent, articulate one, better yourself. You're going to get free. You're young. And I took those, I, I heed those words to this day. Did you discover the art skills that were used in tattooing during that incarceration, or was that from earlier? I always drew. I've, I've been drawing for, since I, I was a kid. So when I arrived in prison, I would do tattoo patterns for people, and I survived doing artwork, making cards up for holidays to the inmates so they could send to their kids. Then I was contacted by Teen Angel magazine. I started becoming an artist for Teen Angel, doing covers and centerfolds. Um, artwork was artwork was a good thing till I got educated and found out there was money in law and doing divorce packages and immigration packages. So the guys would be getting deported to Mexico and they didn't want to go. So I'd file a writ to the court telling that their life would be in jeopardy and using the constitutional law to substantiate why they should be given a 90 day hearing and not transferred out of the country. And for that, it would be $300. Yeah, we had a guy on called Jamie Morgan Kane who was doing a similar thing. And when he was getting deported, he, they, they were keeping him for so long, he started doing all these writs. And he was getting so many of these guys, writs approved, they were like, right, we're going to release you. We're just get rid of you. Yeah, 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 yeah. The warden called me to the office and said, how come every writ has your name on it? <laughs> I was like, wow. <laughs> so how long were you in the Youth Authority? Um, I was in the Youth Authority from 1978 to when they took my YA number in 1984. 78 to 84. And in 1984, they sent me to Tracy, which they call Gladiator School. And uh, that's when I was uh, um, accused of a, a prison murder. Uh, another kid was killed in there, and I was, uh, I was charged with murder. And what were the circumstances of that person getting killed? Where are you from? Like that thing again. Where are you from is... Anybody that's out there that knows what I'm saying is yeah. where are you from in L.A., where are you from in Cali in the, across the pond is a life and death. People are killed every day because if you answer it, it's called, did you squeak? If you squeak, that means you said, I'm from nowhere. Because you told me to Google something before we sat down today. You said, look at the deaths, the murders in L.A. County. And I, I, I Googled the Los Angeles, the homicide report and this is for the present day, 747 people were killed in L.A. County in the past 12 months. Nine in the last week in L.A. where I live. As I was telling you, it's, 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 I can't sleep until I hear the helicopter or above my house. Uh, me and my wife, we, we, we've, it's a running joke now when there's gunfire. and She says, that's an AK, and I go, no, that's a 38. So that's how common it is. Just last night, or the night before I left, a husband and wife were sitting in their car and they got shot. Kid at the liquor store on his bike, a pizza delivery kid, they shot him for his necklace and it wasn't even gold. And you and helped it, with the funeral on that one, didn't it, you? I paid for his, his cremation. But it, that's why I, I believe something has to change and that's why I'm here. That's why I came, Sean. I didn't come here to tell my story as a bravado. I came here to make a difference, you know. Because if people reach out who've watched this video, you're willing to travel anywhere in the world, aren't you, to speak to young people? You got to. I mean, you got to. I mean, if they're not going to listen to their parents, maybe they'll listen to Joey. Because if you go to prison, you're going to shine my shoes, wash my clothes, and you ain't going to like it. And that's reality. And you, you, you know, brother, if it, I'm only here because of the time you did. If you, if you were a man there and what you're doing and you didn't have the lineage that you have, then you know what I'm telling you is right. You know I'm telling you is right. The saddest thing at night was hearing kids scream because they put them in with a grown man and the kids fucking them. So that's why I've put my life to helping kids. That's why I said YouTube the Joe Torrey story. YouTube it. See the kids that I've helped. That's what it's about. No kid should have to go to prison and serve life. You know, everybody's a gangster till a gangster walks in the room. I always tell people that, Sean. Gangster is me standing over your bed at 3 o'clock in the morning, eating chicken wings out of your refrigerator, talking about where you're from. Where you from is life and death in L.A. You say the wrong thing, you're a dead man. 
And it's factual and it's true. 790 murders will tell you that. So in L.A., because California's next to Arizona, you were familiar with the jail I was at then, oh, Sheriff Joe Arpaio. Very what are your familiar. thoughts on him? Come on. The man should have been put underneath the prison he was running. You know, when you go after people by the their shade of their skin, get every Mexican, and then you get found guilty, and it takes Donald fuck you Trump. It takes Donald Trump to pardon him. That, 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 speaks, that speaks volumes. You dress grown men in pink? Come on. He was a powerful guy. He was on George Bush's steering committee. Yeah, well, George Bush said there was no climate control problem either, huh? <laughs> so, L.A. presently then, do you think it's just getting more and more out of control with these murders? Since, the, since COVID, I, and I called it. I told my wife during COVID, I said, you know what? Because the word came out from prison the Emmett had sent word that nothing was to happen during COVID. Everything ceased to exist. But after COVID, it's, it's, look what's happening in Hollywood. People are getting robbed for their Rolexes and killed it's every day. They just shot a kid last night on Hollywood Boulevard for his Rolex. So that's why I told my wife, I said, as soon as this, this, this COVID's over, Everybody's buck wild. Everybody's shooting and killing in L.A. I feel, when I got off the plane today in England, I breathed such a sigh. I don't have to worry about dying tonight. And that's a good feeling. It's got to be relaxing for you. Oh, I, I, I wish I could stay here and never go back. I mean, how, how do you feel your story is going to influence the young people then? I think it's going to take somebody who sees the story to believe in what I'm saying and apply it to getting me on a tour. I always had a dream since I've been in prison. While I was in New Mexico State Prison, I, uh, I would go to the warden's office and they would split screen me with the schools in Harlem. <laughs> and I would speak to the kids and they were just enthralled. They just wanted to know so much more about it. Because kids aren't dumb. They're not going to listen to their parents. They're not going to listen to this guy or that guy. They're going to listen to somebody that was there. And I always had a dream. And it, it, I'll keep the dream. It's standing in front of a group of children and saying, let me tell you a story. You know, you think you're tough. And you don't know what tough is. Tough is coming out of your cell and seeing four guys with knives and saying, oh, shit. You know, I had a plate put in my head, stabbed in the neck. I wear this to cover the stab wound in my neck. You know, that, that's the life that I chose. And no children should ch choose that life. So I don't think it would be the children that see this. I don't. I think it will be someone who has the power to put me out there on a 300-city tour, hitting every elementary and high school, going to colleges, symposiums, and telling people the story. We, we don't have enough crusaders out there, Sean. Think about it. Who's out there? Not many. Who's out there? Think about that for a moment. We have everybody in every field doing something. Who's minding the children today? I grew up in an era where if you weren't home when the, when the street light went off, when's the last time kids sat down with their family for dinner? That doesn't happen anymore. How was your day? How was, now everybody's hustling and bustling. We've lost the fiber and the fabric of our life. So those injuries you sustained, were those before 1984 or after? I got hit in uh, the head in 1986 because I saved the law officer's life. And I went through the turnstile, and the, the guy hit me with a curling bar, and it put a plate in my head that when I, go th when I went through the hospital TSA, the airport, they pulled me over because I had to tell them I had the plate in my head and the bullets in my, my leg. All right, so we're going to get to those stories because right now we're, we're still in the 78 to 84. You said you went to Tracy. I went to Gladiator School, yes. What year was that, 84? 84. What was it like arriving there? Well, it was, you weren't a kid anymore. You were in prison with grown folk, but you were there as a youth authority and corrigible. So I was 23 at the time, and I was put in a cell block with 
with Emmett, Aryan Brotherhood with Vagos and Chainsaw from the Vagos and and you know I mean I could go on and on with with Righteous Killers and uh, they sent me on kamikazes because I was a youth authority and they figured they couldn't do nothing to me so I was the the guy they sent yeah, you know was that before or after the resentencing before before yeah what year was the resentencing 86 okay so the two years then from 84 to 86 I was in Tracy what happened to you in, during those years I was a killer. In the prison system? Yes. And then you got classified as incorrigible. They classified me as incorrigible, sent me back to court, and that's when they resentenced me to 25 to life. Okay, take us through the hearing for that. They returned me back to court and the judge said, I'm not gonna burden the taxpayers. You pled guilty to it, and that's what I'm resentencing you to. We appealed it. I appealed it all the way up into the United States Supreme Court. And in 1993, it was denied. And that's when I hired one of the greatest attorneys in my family. My, my mother and father went to their graves spending hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to get me out. We had Melvin Belli as an attorney, one of the great attorney mind, legal minds. And... Uh, I said, this, this is wrong, and I put myself in the law library, and I found a way to get out. And that was the, the change. That was the change in my life. All right, so we're just going to go over a bit of where you got resentenced then. I'm just going to read a bit from the book. You were scheduled for a parole hearing in 1982. You expected to go home. You've been working out hard. You were 165 pounds. I was supposed to go right back into boxing. My, everybody in the boxing community knew that I was going to go to prison, but I was going to come out and do it. Because the longest they could hold me was till I was 25. Your jogging partner back then was the Onion Field murderer. Yeah, that was my boy, man. Who was he? He's the guy, the Onion Field murderer. Google it. Onion Field murderer. He killed those people out in Bakersfield. A few days before the parole board hearing, you felt the need to carry a knife? Why was that? I always did. So, Joey, we were talking about the Mexican Mafia, La M.A., sweating 18th Street. But you know some of the OGs from La M.A., such as Pegleg? Yeah, Joe Morgan, the founder of the M.A. It was him and Big D. But people didn't know it, and maybe they'll not know it until now, but the record will reflect, and anybody could Google it. He's from Croatia. Is is. I remember sending mail out through my name because they were watching his mail, and it was to Liverpool. He's from Croatia. You go, no way that the head of the Mexican mafia was from Croatia. I was about to say that. And that's why everybody says, well, you were Puerto Rican. How did you associate with the Yemen? How? Well, because I grew up there, but I, I was Puerto Rican and Sicilian. I can just see him going crazy in the comments now saying, this Joey guy saying the head of the MA was Croatian. So I'm fact checking this now on Wikipedia. The youngest of four siblings, Morgan was born on April 10, 1929 in San Pedro, California to Croatian immigrants. Kira and Grgo, a truck driver who was an ethnic Croat from Ljubuski. Shortly after his birth, his father naturalized as a US citizen, anglicizing the family name to Morgan, due to anti-immigrants and anti-Slavic sentiments at the time. In 1929, the same year Morgan was born, the US passed immigration laws limiting immigration from the Balkans. It's believed that more than half of the Croatian population at the time was deported from the nation. Morgan grew up in primarily Mexican and Croatian neighborhood in San Pedro. Later, he was raised by his mother in a Mexican neighborhood in Boyle Heights. In the late 1930s, he joined the Ford Maravilla Street Gang, one of the oldest gangs in L.A. And rose to be the head and the founder of the Mexican Mafia, and he wasn't even Mexican. And I go, well, how the fuck did Joe Morgan? No, he's Mexican. No, he's not. I was with him in Corcoran right before he died. In fact, I, me and Michael Thompson and, and Sirhan, I, 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 forget it, I won't forget it like, like it was yesterday that... Uh, I sent over cigarettes and some food because he was in the hospice unit at Corcoran. 
And that's where he died. He died there in Corcoran while we were there. But he was a good man. I mean, he's, he's a legend. But again, he's not Mexican. <laughs> so as you're approaching then this resentencing, you stayed up the night before the hearing with your legal folder, letters of support, and new marriage certificates. You had no family left. Your brother Luigi was in prison. The Gambinos, Genovese's, Bananos, they were losing power. They're, they're, at that time, yes. I was there with Jimmy McElroy. Um, can, can we stop for a second, please? I'm sorry, yeah, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I just, I want to tell you something. Mm-hmm. So, Joey, another character you're going to talk about is James McElroy, Jimmy McElroy. And I'm going to, just to give this more certification, I'm just going to read his wiki page first so the viewers know that this is legit because all these stories are just so insane. So Jimmy McElroy was an Irish-American mobster and racketeer from Manhattan, New York, who was an enforcer for the Westies, an organization that operated out of Hell's Kitchen. Born in 45 in Hell's Kitchen, Manhattan area, he played hockey with many future Westies aligned criminals at Hell's Kitchen Park and boxed at Boys and Girls Clubs of America with Eddie Comiskey and started burglarizing commercial buildings in the Lower East Side, Manhattan, and cargo from warehouses. He rose through the ranks for counterfeiting, extortion, and murder during the 70s and 80s. A former boxer turned dealer, he was known for being the driver of the infamous Meat Wagon, a large van used by the mob to transport dismembered body parts. That's Jimmy. Did you know about the Meat Wagon? I'm born and raised. Everybody knew about Jimmy and the Meat Wagon. I, 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 he died in my arms. He died in my arms in uh, Mule Creek State Prison. Um, I just got back from uh, being sentenced to life again. The second life sentence I received in 2002, if you recall. And he, I, I was there with him and he was just maybe 100 pounds. And I said, what's wrong with you? And, and he, he died of a cirrhosis. Mm. He died of cirrhosis. Great guy. I mean, I, I, I go back with him in the 70s. I go back with him to uh, Little Italy. That's where I met Chacha in Little Italy through Jimmy. At that time, Jimmy was working for Bolger, for Whitey. But he was doing the hits for, for the Gambinos. And see, that's what happened. The family wouldn't use their own. They would go to the Westies. But yeah, Jimmy Mack was a good guy. He showed me my uppercut. He showed me my uppercut. He'd say, pretend you're going to throw an uppercut and just catch him with the elbow. Jimmy was a good man. I, I miss him very dearly. I hope, he would have, I hope he would have been out when I got out. That's why I contacted you, to see Michael, because I was so happy Michael got out. But, uh, yeah, Jimmy Mack was a, a good guy, but he was a killer. He was, he was the meat wagon man. I mean, everybody on the inside would say, hey, call Jimmy, get the wagon. But, you know, you tell people this, right? And then you read it. You tell people this without the wiki page and people think you're just blowing smoke. Yeah, I know. Huh? Yeah, but this is what it was like. And there's not many left from that generation to tell these stories, is there? No. That's and I was, I was a baby, that's why. See, that's the thing. I was born in 60. I grew up with these guys. When I was 16, 17, they were 25, 30 years old. But because I boxed and because Jimmy boxed, everybody that I associated with the mob were fighters. Think about it. Jimmy the Weasel was a boxer. Jimmy Mack was a boxer. There's just so many that I could just go down the line. And when you have that boxer's mentality, it just... It, it was years of camaraderie talking about fights, talking about life in general, but knowing that they were killers. I mean, this Jimmy the Weezy story is particularly fascinating because of the two Tonys that were whacked. And when did you first meet Jimmy the Weasel? In 73. And how old were you then? 13. What, what was, brought you together? Uh, Frank Sica. Uh, he, at that time, he owned a restaurant on San Fernando Road called Sir Sico's Restaurant. It was Frank and Joe Sica. No, because I grew up with these guys. These guys, Frank was like my, my uncle. And, but you knew that he, don't, he was a killer. Frank Sika and Joe Sika, the Sika brothers, they ruled the fucking L.A., man. They ruled L.A. How'd you spell Sika? S-I-C-A.
When we wake up in the morning, we get out of bed and we start our day with Koro Snacks. Koro is a healthy snacks brand focusing on bringing additive-free natural ingredients to the customers with fair prices in bulk packaging. They have everything from nut butters to free from baking ingredients to cooking essentials and, of course, the snacks. <laughs> it doesn't get healthier than this because all those other snacks have refined sugars, colours, preservatives and additives. Koros snacks have none of that. Oh, I can't wait. So I'm going to go for the Bio Energy Ball today. Ooh, nice. Salty pistachio. Got a little uh, chocolate bar here, I think. Oh, the coconut chocolate bar. Mmm. Oh, that's good. Mm. Want to try it? Ooh. <laughs> so what makes Coro special in comparison to others? Coro avoids using sulfur, refined sugars, preservatives, colours and other additives. For a 5% discount on Coro's products, use the code TRUECRIME with no space in between true and crime. The link to Coro's online shop is in the description box on YouTube. Thanks for supporting our sponsor. They ruled LA. When I tell you ruled LA, they would. They had money. Everybody paid these guys. If you had a car wash, you paid them. If you had a doctor's office, you paid them. It would have come up. Um, yeah. Do you want to say that to the camera? Hold on a sec. Let's get it back on. But don't, did you find them? Yeah, I've got them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We good? Yeah. So in the story of the weasel, then another character is Joe Seeker. I'm just going to read a bit from Wikipedia here was a New Jersey mobster involved in armed robbery, murder for hire, extortion and narcotics distribution. He mentored many West Coast mobsters, including Mike Rizzitello, yeah, Rizzitello. Anthony the Animal Fiato, yeah, Anthony. Christopher Chris Petty was his longtime partner in LA, and San Diego Rackets. So how does Sika fit into the story? My brother worked for Frank Sika and Joe Sika. They owned... Uh, Sir Seco's restaurant on San Fernando Road. And everybody in L.A. knew that everything went through the Sikas. And my brother was, at that time, he had Luigi's Pizza Parlor, and he was an enforcer for the Sikas. I was 13, 14, boxing, and I, I've always been the same way I am now. Go get him. And I remember Frank telling my brother Luigi, that Jimmy is getting out on such and such a date from Chino. And I remember it so well because it was 73. I had just started the Golden Gloves. And so we drove out to Chino and picked up Jimmy when he got out. And we went up north to Hayward where we were at Ray Giarusso's. At that time, Bill Bonanno had just opened up a car dealership in Fresno. So that's how my relationship with Jimmy began and when he knew I was into boxing, he was an ex-fighter. So he would spar and he'd slap me around and they'd pay me to just stand outside and watch the cars and if the feds drove up to come whistle. And But yeah, Jimmy, the weasel was a good guy. I liked the weasel. He did what he did. They were going to whack him. So he got off on them before they whacked him. Which ties into some of the stories we told this channel about... Charlie Bats Battaglia and Two Tonys, the guy I wrote his life story, the Mafia philosopher. Um, how does Bats Battaglia fit into this then? When they killed him in the, the telephone booth, San Diego. The Two Tonys? Yeah. So what had the Two Tonys done to get the green light on them to be murdered? Uh, I can't say. Because the way it was told to us by my friend was that they were, uh, they'd robbed the wrong places. And the order came down from the top. Yeah, I, I, just, I just... And then, but I think it was Bat, wasn't it? Wasn't um, Bat working under the weasel on that whack? I can't say. Okay, gotcha. All right, from what I know then, from, from not what Joey's saying, Bats was working under the weasel, and they went in the car with him, and the weasel made sure Bats put some slugs in him because it was his first whack. But then Bats went on to become a prolific killer in his own right, left stiffs from coast to coast and never got caught from any of it yeah, so um but then the B bananos they lost their power didn't they they got run out of new york that that faction did they came out here they were in fresno yeah we're gonna up, up, yeah and opened yeah. up a car a car dealership and the other brother retired to a freaking uh tucson or arizona yeah 
So Joe Senior was in was one of my neighbours in, in Sinvacus, Tucson? Brother, I remember like it was yesterday. Yeah. The, the year was 74, and we were in Ray Giarusso, had a, a salvage yard in Hayward, California. And it was Jimmy, all his boys, my brother Louis, Ray Giarusso, Bill Bonanno, and Joe Bonanno. Sounds like a scene out of The Godfather. And we're all in the salvage yard talking shit to each other. And they're all saying, shut up, I'll send, I'll send Joey after you. But when you're growing up with those people at the time and you're a kid, you, you know, it, it, was living a, it was living the life. You know, there was nothing to worry about money. Everybody had money. We were in Vegas every weekend. Frank Sika was the shot caller and he was our boy. You know, that, that was the life. But I, always, I will always respect Bill Bonanno. I will always respect the Bonanno family. I don't care what anybody wants to say about them. They made their reputation. They'll go down in history. Yeah, because there's two sides, isn't there? Some people say that the, with the old man writing that book, it brought a lot of heat on the mafia and it changed things. Um, some people say, you know, he was the longest standing head of the mafia commission. Exactly. And he never got whacked. He, he managed to be diplomatic and get away with a lot and, and die in his, uh, from natural causes in his, in his old age, which is quite an incredible thing to achieve for someone who's been in that position. Every year that passes for me, I'm, I never thought I'd see 62. What does that tell you? At, at 15, I never thought I'd see 21. At 21, I ne thought I'd never see a day. I never thought I'd be out of prison. Think about that. I'm sentenced to life. I'm not, I can't go to the pro board till 2043. Imagine that, my friend. So what, how did these characters dress then, the weasel and them? What, was it the old pinky rings? Oh, the... yeah, it came more special. They would have the polyester shirts, they had the pinky rings, and they showed me that when you get your money, you wrap it up with the, with the, the rubber band this way. <laughs> and, and the way to really do it is you go to the lettuce section, and in the lettuce, they have the blue rubber bands, and they don't break, so you can rack up to 5,000 in them. <laughs> so they'd have their money here, they'd have their pinkies, and they'd have their Italian stogies. Yeah, that was, and my mom used to make pasta and would sit there in the house and there'd be a Ford LTD in the front with two cops in the back, FBI taking pictures. And yeah, that was, that was my, my brother Luigi was something else, man. My brother Luigi was, was something else. He was, uh, he came up under Jimmy. He came up under Bats. I remember stories about Bats. I mean, Bats was, as you say, a prolific killer. But if you saw him, you wouldn't think so. Same thing with Jimmy. You didn't think that old. You didn't think Jimmy was a killer. But you know. But it's changed now. There's no more. It's all done. It's all over with. Sadly, it's all over. You know. Yeah, it's it's cartels and yeah. over. Now they kill the kids. They kill everybody. You know, back then you had a you had a line of respect. You didn't kill women or kids. You know. Yeah, yeah. So we we were just leading up to the part then, where you were coming up to your resentencing. Let me get this back up, I'll close it. Just to recap then, so Joey's been sentenced to five years, thinks he's getting out, shows up with his paperwork, he enters the parole board room, there's three board members, an older Latino who smiled at you, an older white man, and a woman with a sour face, and how, how did it progress from there? The, the woman said, I have read your file and I too, I'm from Compton. I know all about 18th Street thugs. Just because you are an athlete, do not think you will get treated any different on your incorrigible butt. Do you remember that day? Yes, I do. It's just, you said it all right there. I mean, that, that's, that was it. She continued, the new law that has taken effect this year is applicable to you. Under 1170D of the penal code. and C, an inmate who is found to be incorrigible will be found unsuitable for the youth authority and returned to court for sentencing. You, Mr. Tory, are incorrigible. Did, yeah, you, know, did you know what was coming at that point? Yes, I knew it was coming. Because I was sitting in Tracy, which was for grown people, and I was a juvenile. And I knew it was coming, but I didn't care. I didn't care. 
I didn't care because in my immature mind, I thought, <laughs> I have 18 months left. All the judge could do is sentence me to 18 months. I ponder that, Sean. Think of that. I'm sentenced to my 25th birthday. At the time, 1982, I'm 22. So the worst the judge could do with, time, with good time and work time is sentence me to 18 months. So I was like, fuck you. Fuck you and the board. I don't care. And I was returned to court. Went in there thinking I was higher and mighty. And uh, rude awakening. When the judge says, no, you pled guilty to murder one. And that's what I'm resentencing you to, 25 to life. And I stood there for the next 40 motherfucking years. Wow. Which is a huge part of this story that we're going to get to about the fight to overturn that. And Joey said, hell no, buddy. I have a plea agreement. And now they want to resentence me. Yeah. And I will not plea again. And what was your lawyer doing at this point? <laughs> Jack shit? No. Nah. Yeah, it just it hurts to even think about it. It was it was a hell of a time. Cause I thought I was gonna continue my career, you know. I, that time I was a Golden Glove champ, NABF champ, and I was in jail. But I had so many people that thought I'd be out. So many people counting on me. I was counting on myself. I would have got out if I would have gone to prison with that that deal they made, plead guilty for YA, and just gone to YA and been a good guy. I would have been out. But you know, you hear these stories and it's such a, a tale, a, a, a facade. Well, if you mind your business and go to prison and you mind your business, you could, no, you can't. Not if you're in a gang. Not if you're a gang member. You know, I, I, to, to this day, I know a lot of kids that go in there for GTA two, three, and four, and they're ordered to kill somebody and they're doing life and they're 18 years old and they think it's funny until they get 30, 40, 50, until you look in that mirror and you see I'm not 18 anymore. You know, it reminds me of, of a kid that, uh, I gotta, you gotta stop. So Joey, there was a song by Tower Power, Rick Stevens, that meant a lot to you. Why, why did it mean so much to you? He's just a good guy. I mean, I grew up with him in prison with Jimmy Mack. Isn't that something, a mobster from Manhattan and the singer of Tower of Power? Tell me that ain't a hell of a crew. Rick Stevens was salt of the earth, man. Uh, he was the founder of Tower of Power, one of the biggest bands in the world. And he did a song called You're Still a Young Man. And every year for my birthday, my 18th, 20th, 25, 30, 35, 40. Every year for 40 fucking years, I sang You're Still a Young Man in front of my mirror. And he would sing it to me on the yard because wow. he was in there with me doing life. Yeah. He got busted in 77. I mean... I can it, confirm this from the New York please. Times. Rick Stevens, funk soul singer, convicted murder, died at 77. And what he'd done was... He was convicted of killing three men in a drug-addicted haze and served 36 years in prison. And he got out in California, he died when he was 77 from liver cancer. Yeah, we, some, we all got that liver cancer thing. I, I wonder if it was in the water. But um, No, Rick was a phenomenal singer. You know, he, he'd serenade me on my birthday because I used to tell him, you know, I asked him, that's the man I asked. I said, every time we go to visiting, there'd be this little black girl. And she, I loved her. She was five years old, and I'd see her every Saturday. Well, we parted after I saved the officer's life, and they sent me out of state. I didn't see him for 20 years. And when I got back to Mule Creek, when they sentenced me to life again in 2002, he was there at Mule Creek with me and with Jimmy Mac. They were both dying. And they wouldn't admit it, but they knew they were dying. And I said, hey, so how's, how's Karen? I said, Joey, she's a mother, has three kids. She's a grandmother now, that little five-year-old girl. So that's why it's just, it's, 
You know, my life is my life has gone so full circle. But I think of I think of Rick Stevens so much. I, I ask everybody go to YouTube and do Rick Stevens and the tribute to him and his story is on there. That's somebody you should have interviewed. But yeah, it was it was something else to see that crew. Jimmy Mack, the Manhattan, the Meat Wagon Killer, Rick <sighs> Stevens, and Joey Torres. Wow, a hell of a combination, huh? Wow. <laughs> Don't forget the onion field killer too. Who? <laughs> the onion field killer, my oh, you had to my, jog, my jogging, jogging bar, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> no, he just killed all these people in Bakersfield. But <laughs> oh my god. Yes. Yeah, all right. So this first section then that we're doing about your life story, uh, we're at the point where the judge is now resentencing you, and I'm just going to read from the court document. So this is all legit. Mr. Tory, I'm not going to allow you to withdraw your plea agreement and burden the taxpayers of this state with a long, drawn-out trial. You pled guilty to 187 murder, and in about five minutes, that's what you will be sentenced to. Numerous fights in youth authority and trying to purchase a gun while in custody. Bad places are for bad people, and you're without a doubt bad people. Incorrigible is right. Your sentence is just the beginning, as the Briggs Initiative has just passed on November of 1982 which protects minors, not adults or gangsters like you. You should not have been sentenced to the YA. I'm not going to correct that wrong. No, I am going to correct that wrong. You should not handle a three to five year deal. And now you are back. He banged his gavel and asked you to stand before he continued. And he said, I hereby sentence you to 25 years to life in the California Department of Corrections. I will give you credit for 822 days that you served in the Youth Authority. Absolutely mind blowing, but there's a bit of a backstory there about you know because they've misinterpreted this thing about the gun, isn't it? You wrote home to a female, was it? It might have been your wife at the time, was it? It's a girlfriend. She girlfriend from LA. Her she needed to get a gun to protect yeah, herself. Put it in the mail. Put a stamp on it. Didn't circumvent the mail system. I could have told her in visiting when she visited me that weekend, but I always seem to forget things I'm supposed to do. So I have to write things down, like I write stuff down so I remember. And I just wrote her and said, you know, buy a weapon. You could go to a pawn shop and get it cheap. They used that. And um, that was my first 25 to life. You have, don't forget, I was sentenced twice to 25 to life. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to get to that bit. And then he says, do you understand that punishment, that penalty after reading a bunch of stuff? You said, yes, sir. And you had the feeling then of your knees buckling. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I was going to start I was going to continue my boxing, but to be to be to you know, I I have to be honest with myself. I have to be honest with life in general. You know, if I would have kept my mouth shut, not banged, not been the where you from guy, you know, I I caused a lot of my own grief. That's why I want to change and try to send the word to others that are doing the same thing I'm doing. You know, you fuck up once, you'll fuck up twice. And I kept fucking up because I was boxing from 18th Street. I feared nothing. I feared no one. But I feared that gavel when it hit and it said 25 to life. My knees, like I got hit with a left hook right on the button. And I couldn't even move. Time seemed to stay. The clock seemed to freeze. It's just like it, life stood still for that moment. And uh, I was remanded now, not to juvenile, and I was sent straight to Chino. And because of my gang affiliation, I was put on lockdown. I did an indeterminate shoot term for three years. We'll get to that. So as your knees are buckling, your lawyer's telling you this is double jeopardy and it's, gonna be, it's, it's, it's not going to stand. You'll get it on appeal. And was that realistic or did you think this guy's just blowing smoke by now well i thought common sense would be how can you have somebody plead guilty for five years and then if i did try this is what i thought sean i thought if i did try to circumvent the mail and request a weapon let's just say i did that only that stipulation only carries six months for attempting you didn't do it you're telling somebody that's that's not even a crime but because of the new Briggs ascent, see, they had just passed the law in 82 because so many juveniles were committing violent crimes in L.A. County. So when that law passed effect, that meant they could bring me back at any time. 
And that's what they chose to do by using that thread to bring me back. Did you eat your breakfast the next day? <laughs> so from then on, um, there was an old timer sweeping the floor in front of your cell, asked if you remembered him from the Main Street gym. Oh, and then, and then a green light got put on the 18th Street gang, but for the MA. I took that guy out in the gym. Yeah. Yeah, they sent Chinate from Clanton to kill me. And um, I took out, I took out that sentence on his ass. He paid for what that judge did. And uh, yeah, that was, that was, I feel, if I could go tell him I'm sorry, I would, because I beat him. I had him grabbing the bed underneath the bed. I turned the bed over to beat him. And after that, you ran into Gypsy? Yeah. Who was Gypsy? The president of the Hells Angels. And how was he associated with your family? I don't want to go into it. Okay, gotcha. So you and him form an alliance then? Yeah. Yeah. I started taking care of business. It, you know, it, the honest way to put it is if, if you wanted somebody taken care of, you gave me a call. That was that guy. You know, and, and I, I'm embarrassed and ashamed of it. But at that time, it was either you did that or you were the victim. You know, I don't know how to articulate it in any other way that comes out that it doesn't sound facetious. It's raw survival. But it's survival. If you either kill or you be killed. And anybody that thinks different does not understand how it is. It's, that's it. There's no other way. You can't run. You can't get in your car. You can't go nowhere. You can't tell nobody. You can't tell the cops. You can't tell your homies because they might want you to kill your homies. So you're a man. You're an island on your own. And the only thing that kept me alive is I knew how to kick ass. If it wouldn't have been for me not knowing how to fight, I would have been dead years ago. Years ago. That's why I tell you the first thing I did when I got out was went to the dojo and told Benny. <laughs> you know. Thanks for saving your life. Yeah. So in the in the immediate days after then, you were watching a fight on the TV, and an older prisoner come along and change the channel. Yeah. And then it didn't end up very well for him, did it? No. But you know, it is what it is. Yeah, we got to talk about all the bad stuff, huh? We've got to go over everything. How about everything? some good stuff? We've got to go over everything uh, in detail. How about detail. the redemption, baby? How about the redemption, champ? We're going to get to that section because it's such you a long... Me, I'm feeling bad. I'm, feeling, I'm mad at me for being that guy. <laughs> I'm like, I did this, you know? But, but it was so... You know, you have to understand, you, you're, you're a juvenile, and you got people like Jimmy the Weasel, McElroy, Bats, Luigi, Frank Sika, Joe Sika, Cha-Cha. You got everybody loving you because you're a fucking killer. You're a kick-ass son of a bitch kid. And they send me with pride and happiness, like, like, like it's a thing to do. And I'm eating it up because I figure if I do this, they'll love me more. So that's, you know, I could be brutally honest with you right now and tell you that's, I don't, I don't think I've ever said this. Or, you know, I, I don't think I've ever even felt this. Feeling of belonging and love. Yeah. So, and it's what everyone's looking for, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So we, we've done about two hours, I think, today. Do you want to hold off until tomorrow for the rest? Yeah. It's almost two o'clock. Yeah, I'm good. That was absolutely fantastic. Joey, thank you. So Gadfly Press is hugely proud to announce the publication of Killing Escobar and Soldier Stories by Peter McAleese. If you've not seen our podcast we've done with Peter, check it out. And the book is now available worldwide on Amazon in all formats. And Peter was hired out of Scotland, mercenary by the Cali Cartel, to assassinate Pablo Escobar, one of the most famous gangsters in the history of the world. The mission is all detailed in the book, as well as Peter's many soldier stories from various countries and continents of the world. So mind-blowing, gripping, as seen on BBC TV. This is the book, the story that Killing Escobar is based on, Peter McAleese's testimony. 
The link will be in the description box below the video, available worldwide on Amazon. Cheers. So I, I went in, I introduced myself, she knew who I was. She said, I'm really scared because these two guys over here are watching me and they're showing their penis to me. And I said, well, did you call your sergeant? And the sergeant came and talked to them and they did nothing. So I said, well, I'm gonna take a shower, I'll be back out. I took the shower and in the middle of the shower, I hear the screams, ran out of the shower. And I looked in and one was holding her down, the other one had ripped her clothes, was, was following her breasts. And I just went in and uh, extended round 10. And uh, I proceeded to beat him with the, with the phone handle. You, you, end, you end up in Corcoran prison. Yeah. And we've done our research on this. In Corcoran at that time it was featured in 60 Minutes because the guards were having gladiator fights, pit, pitting off to the prisoners. Come on. And if the prisoners refused to fight, they just shot them dead. Who do you want fighting if you're a guard? The money's on you. I fought anybody and everybody. You don't want to get shot. You want to win. But who's going to fuck with you? I did it twice. And then Lieutenant Riggs said, no. I want you to be my clerk in the office. But I watched. I watched. In every cell block, they have red buckets full of sand. And they hang them in the tiers on the upper tier. And what they do is, before they kill you, they give you that warning shot that goes into the red one. And when the sand falls, the next one's going into you. Okay. We hit him about a week earlier. I had him hit. Yeah. And unfortunately, he survived. He was behind the gate. I go, motherfucker, you're a piece of shit. How could you touch a girl, let alone cut her arms off? She got a million dollars. And he was rolling a cigarette, a bugler cigarette. And he looked up to me and said, yeah, but the bitch can't count it. Oh my God. Is that, is that insane? And I went through the turnstile. They had turnstiles at CMC. And when I went through the turnstile, he hit me in the back of the head. And the other one stabbed me in the neck. And I fought there on a, a daily. Because people would say, hey, that's the guy that, that's boxer from 18th Street. So they didn't know, they had to get permission to fight me. That's where I brought in all the celebrities and started promoting fights from prison. So, and not just that, we go into the fact that that's when I started representing the athletes. Why, why, why did he bury a bus full of farm workers? He didn't want to pay him. So did they just die? Yeah, they died, they all died. Too many of these guys. No, but they're all in my life. <laughs> they're all my friends. <laughs> We, we've done our oh, you're looking, you're looking at me like, where's the door? <laughs>
and I was in Vacaville training for the fight a month prior to everybody's gambling and betting on me or the other guy <laughs> and um, I'm in the gym training and one of the officers tells me hey there's a new lady a new officer working your tier your module keep an eye out on her she's a young girl first week on the job and I said no problem my neighbor at that time and S unit was Charlie Charles Manson and uh, it was it was celebrity role everybody of, of stature and I came I went to the fight won the fight it was about six seven ish went back my eye was closed I was you know I, I fought a 10 round fight in prison and I, I won but I was beat up so I'm, I, I went in I introduced myself she knew who I was she said I'm really scared because these two guys over here are watching me and they're showing their penis to me and I said well did you call your sergeant and the sergeant came and talked to them and they did nothing so I said well I'm gonna take a shower I'll be back out I took the shower and in the middle of the shower I hear the screams ran out of the shower and Charlie's got his hands up and telling me do something boxer do something and I looked in and one was holding her down, the other one had ripped her clothes, it was, was funneling her breasts. And I just went in and uh, extended round 10. And picked up the phone. Back then in the day there were phones that weighed about 20, 30 pounds. I don't, I don't know if you remember the old dial ones. And uh, I proceeded to beat them with the, with the phone handle and knocked them both out, carried her, put her breasts back in her bra, and in her pocket was her alarm. I hit the alarm. The bells went off. She was about 100 pounds, a little girl. I carried her to the door, put my knee against the door, opened the door, closed it to keep everybody inside. And then I saw them running up the stairs at me. And before I could say anything, they just proceeded to just beat me because they thought I was the one who did it to her. They threw me down the stairs. I rolled down the stairs and my leg got caught. I showed you the, I had double knee replacement. And um, about maybe 10 hours later after they took turns beating me, they beat me so much that, and kicked me so much that it didn't hurt anymore. It was just the thud. You know, it wasn't the, you, you oh, it was just mm, mm. And after a while, I just accepted the punishment I was getting. I had never been beat that vicious. And every time another officer came, a sergeant or a lieutenant, he took a couple shots at me too. And then when she told them what happened, it changed. And my life changed. My life changed. From that day on, I don't know if you have the officer's affidavit. I do have the officer's affidavit because if you've seen part one of what we've done already with Joey, he's brought along all of his paperwork. He's had us Google all the characters he's mentioned and he's backed his story up completely to the hilt and I will read the affidavit. Do you want me to say the woman's name or should we leave that out of it? No, she's, she's still in my corner. I spoke to I, I, I We exchanged Christmas cards. Oh, fantastic. She's oh, told her children about me. Wow, mm -hmm. wow, that's amazing. You know, when I went to the parole board every year, she oh, would write a letter for me. So. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Affidavit of Adela Maria Esparza. Yeah. I began working at California Medical Facility in Vacaville, California as a correctional officer on October 8th, 1982. My duties included the supervision of inmates classified as psychotics in remission. Before working at CMF, I worked at the California Institute for Men in Chino for 18 months, also as a correctional officer. I make this statement on behalf of Joey Torres, who saved my life at CMF. On October 15th, 1982, after one week of orientation, I began my first day of supervising Wing P3 on the psych unit. Shortly after my shift began, an inmate named TM started following me and making comments. Throughout the evening, TM became increasingly menacing and bizarre in his behaviour toward me. I called his behaviour to the attention of my direct supervisor, Sergeant P. After a brief meeting, Sergeant P determined that Mr. TM posed no threat and refused to take any action. Because TM continued in his bizarre behavior, I also advised Officer B. 
she sued and left the department with two point eight million dollars. Wow! Okay. Just because of that officer who, excuse me for interrupting. So, because TM continued his bizarre behavior, I also advised Officer <laughs> B, a supervisor of another wing on the same shift. That's who of TM's disruptive behavior. Officer B indicated that he would occasionally check to see how I was doing. Officer B said that if I got into trouble, I could count on inmate Torres because he's a good inmate. Joey also reassured me that if I got into trouble, he would back me up. Again, I complained to my supervisor of TM's continued and increasingly menacing behavior. I requested TM either be moved or locked up in his cell. He denied this request. At one point, I heard TM say under his breath that he was going to kill me. As I began to direct all inmates back into their cells at lockup time through a pass window, I looked up and the next thing I knew, TM punched me in the face with such force that my teeth were loosened. Bloody hell, my mouth lacerated and my face bloodied. TM came into the room, stood over me and attempted to hit me again. I was only semi-conscious but managed to kick his groin earlier and began screaming. He proceeded to attack me again, although there were a number of inmates surrounding us by that time, only Joey intervened to stop TM's attack. At Chino, the alarm button is located on the hip area. Because I was unfamiliar with the placement of the newer alarm button, I reached for my hip area. Joey yelled out to remind me that the button was located in my chest pocket. I was then able to alert other officers of my need for assistance. It is my belief that TM had every intention of killing me. Had it not been for Joey's intervention, I believe that TM would have killed me or caused serious bodily harm. Joey saved my life and averted a potentially volatile situation in which other inmates could have become disruptive. That Are evening, okay? that evening, I reported the events to Officer EM. She assured me that Joey would get recognition in his file for saving an officer's life. It was not until earlier this year that I became aware that a report of this incident was not placed in his file. That's when they put the plate in my hand. Oh my God. I did nothing to identify him or highlight his actions as I did not want to endanger his safety with the population. Recently, I learned that Joey was severely beaten by TM and as a result of his beating, there was a steel plate in his head. His attempt at saving my life put his own life in jeopardy and he had to be transferred out of the prison to Nevada. If called as a witness, I completely testify to the truth of the statement. Executed 28th of November 1989, San Francisco, California. Wow. So, so, um, all right, so you, you, you got the guys off her and then the guards beat, beat the crap out of you. You said it was for like 10 hours they were beating you. What, what happened? Did they, did you go to the medical unit after that or? No, they put me in the hole. They put you in the hole with my knees like that. Because you were still under suspicion of, of doing being, it to her. Of doing was, it to she her. She was semi-conscious. So she couldn't she couldn't defend yeah. you at that. St when when did she come conscious? I I do not recall because I was in the hole. I just know at about two three in the morning, with my knees swollen, because both my knees, when they kicked me and threw me down the stairs, my knees were lodged into the stair. So my body went forward, but my knees went that way. So I needed a double knee replacement. I'm, you said you saw the scars yesterday. Yeah. But um, I, I think that I need a break right now. Now you have to understand, the year's 1982. I had just got sentenced to 25 to life. Remember, 82 is when they sent me back, found me incorrigible. They sent me to Vacaville in the mental health unit because they said I had organic brain syndrome from boxing. But there was nothing wrong with me. But they said if I stood in that program and did well, that I could get out early. They were trying to say because of my violence that it was a mental problem. They didn't at that time know the breakdown in the 80s about the gang sanctions, etc., etc. So they sent me to CMC and I fought on a weekly. Hey, that's the punk that saved the officer. And I would tell the administration. But she didn't submit that. Did you see when she submitted it? What year? Was it, was it yet later? Was 86. It? I don't know what year. I've gone to a different section. She submitted it in 86 after she found out I was almost killed. Okay. Because they tried to say I was hit because of drugs and debts. 
but I demanded an investigation. I filed a writ of habeas corpus in the court demanding an investigation. But I want you to understand it. It means a lot for me to you to understand it. Because yes, I was that guy. But once this lady, once I saved her life, and I told you this and it sounds so bizarre, but the greatest thing that happened in my life was her being assaulted. Joey, can we, can we go back to your recovering? You're in the hole, you've How been beaten up for 10 hole? hours. Hopeful. What happens after the hole? I, I'll tell you, let's go. Let's go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's make it happen, Captain. <laughs> Take us to what happens at the end of that night then, after you got beat up for 10 hours. They put me in the hole. Um, I stood in the hole uh, until they found out I was the one who saved her. I spoke to the warden, I spoke to the investigators, they apologized, they gave me great... They sent me to outside hospital to get my legs taken care of. I stood in the infirmary for about two months because I needed a double knee replacement. Um, and then they came to me and said, because of what you did, and because we know that the inmates want you, we're going to put you in the hole. I said, no, I refuse to go to the hole. I refuse protective custody. I'm not a rat. I'm not a child molester. I'm a grown-ass man. And if I have to pay the price for saving the life of an officer, then I'll die on the main line. And... Um, Wow, here I go again. I'm sorry. No, you're fine, Joey. Yeah, you're fine. I'm sorry. It's, it's okay to get emotional. Yeah. You know, you've never told your story before. You were living these things. Yeah. So, and I, so I, where did they house you after the hole? Uh, they sent me, um, I spent a year in the hole. And in yeah. a year. Yeah. A year in the hole. And I'm talking the hole. I'm talking where you don't come out. What was the conditions? Was just oh, forget innocent. about it. Forget about it. Forget about it. If they miss feeding you for a day, they apologized. Showers every two weeks. Madness. All you heard was people screaming in there, playing chess from one cell to the other with moves. L4, X6, and the other guy down the... Do you remember that? Yes. And all night, and I was like, wow, I can't, sta I can't take this. And then I said no. I said I filed a writ. I filed an appeal. And I said, you know, I'm in here for something that I did. They sent me to uh, Central Men's Colony, CMC East, in San Luis Obispo, California. And I fought there on a, a daily because people would say, hey, that's the guy that, but that's Boxer from 18th Street. So they didn't know, they had to get permission to fight me. But my homie stood up for me. Um, Lyle Hood, is, a, is, is I want to mention him tonight when we speak with Michael, was there. And he instructed the white boys from the brand that I was off limits. And Rick Stevens from Tower of Power, who was the shot caller for the BGF, the Black, Black Gorilla family, also said to me in private, that could have been my daughter. So I was cool, but I had to fight the riffraff. Is this the Tower of Power, the song? Yeah, the song. So, tell us Jan about the song. You're still what a young this? man. <laughs> oh, it's one of the greatest songs of all time. Oh, you've heard it, you just don't know. I don't know. No. And uh, he was in prison for me. He was a very well-known singer. If you YouTube Rick Stevens, he was the founder of the Tower of Power band. Cut the Cake. Um, I mean, just songs go on and on. But I was secured by the mob. Do you understand? There was a man named uh, Big D, Donald Garcia. He was a shot caller for the Emmy. And Rick was a shot caller for the BGF. Lyle Hood was with the Aryan Brotherhood. So I had no problem. They all said they, they knew, this, you know, you did right. But you're going to have to deal with what you have to deal with. So one day in 1986, coming back from the gym, working out, getting ready for a fight against another prison. I'm still fighting. You, you have to understand I'm 26 at the time. You know, and I was supposed to get out the year before. Instead, I'm resentenced to life again. And then this happens. It was a clusterfuck. It was like God was mad at me. And um, and I went through the turnstile. They had turnstiles at CMC. And when I went through the turnstile, there was a guy, a man behind me and another man here. And one, when you're at the gym and you're doing curls, the curling bar, they said they had it on video. He put it down his pants and 
when I went through the turnstile, he hit me in the back of the head mm. while the other guy, it was a double, make sure I died. And the other one stabbed me in the neck. And um, I was back in the hole. Now I'm in the hole, and now the investigation says I'm in the hole for drugs and gambling. But they don't understand that I'm in the hole because these I saved the life of an officer. Remember, she still has a... She thought the next guy put it in my file. She thought her superiors... Remember, in 1986, there's no internet. It's all handwritten reports. There's no typing of any sort. And that's when I... St I'm in the hole from 86 to 87 again. And that's when my comrades in there said, man, oh gee, you need to, you need to put word out. So that's when I filed my first writ of habeas corpus to the San Luis Obispo court saying, my life was put in danger and I was assaulted based on the fact I saved the life of a correction officer who was being raped. The court granted the appeal, launched an investigation. When that transpired, that's when what you read, her affidavit. Can we just go back to the assault again? So did they leave you for dead? Yes. And how did you regroup from that? Well, I was taken to the hospital because I was in a, a coma. And I needed... Um... It's all right, brother. It's all right, um, brother. I needed a plate in my head. And I didn't know what a plate in the head was at that time. Yeah. And uh, the neck had launched my vocal cords, so I've always had to talk. Uh, I've ne I never talked the way I, w I talk usually ever since the they hit me with a welding rod. And it went through the vocal cord. Mm -hmm. And um, I took it out of my neck and I fought them. What? And then I, all I know is I went out. What? Yeah. That so was crazy. You blacked out. I blacked out, and I woke up a week later in the hospital in San Luis Obispo, and now everybody was my friend because I was assaulted, but they said I was assaulted because of drug deals, and, and I tried to explain to them I wasn't, so I was put back. After I was mended and the plate put in my head, I was back in the hole again. So did you have to go through a series of operations? No, they did one. Just one. They, they, the skull was fractured and they put a, a plate in my head. And I went for speech therapy for the neck while in prison because I, 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 I had a roughness to my voice. How long were you in hospital for? Um, three weeks. That's not long enough. Yeah, but they, they don't care because you're an inmate. And then what was really, to add insult to injury, and I say to this day, the doctor ordered morphine and oxycodone. And when I got to prison, they gave me aspirin. What? And this is the day after this tra traumatic, because they don't want you high. So while in the hole, that's when I filed the appeal. And I, I stipulated in the appeal what transpired. Thank God there was an older man who was the associate director of corrections who remembered me from 76 when I fought at the Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles and knew Benny Yukitas. And he said, this man's not lying. They launched an investigation. They had her do the affidavit. And um, it was phenomenal because they came to me and said, don't sue us. We'll send you to any prison in the United States of America tomorrow. And I chose Gene, Nevada. For what reason? Well, because they had a golf course. <laughs> I went from maximum prison to playing golf. And they had a boxing program. And that's where you see on the video the Joey Torrey story on YouTube. That's where I brought in all the celebrities and started promoting fights from prison. So, and not just that, we go into the fact that that's when I started representing the athletes and working on my AA and my BA. But um, it was... It was the changing of my life that I, you know, it's it's sad to say that the greatest thing that happened in my life was her being assaulted. It sounds so devious. Just going back to California Men's Colony then, you lived across the hall from a guy called Larry Singleton. Yeah, Larry. What? That's my, oh God, you know about Larry. 
Well, he did a quite heinous crime, though, didn't he? Yes, he did, but uh, we got him. You got him? Yeah, we got him. He kidnapped a little girl in Riverside, raped, cut off her arms, and left her by a ditch. But he was going to get paroled. And when you said to him... Oh, no, no, I got it. It wasn't that. Okay. We hit him about a week earlier. I had him hit. Yeah. And unfortunately, he survived. So he was going to the parole board. I'll never forget it. You know, it's one of the things when you, when you die, they say your life flashes in front of you. I think that'll flash in front of me. Because he said to me, I said, he was behind the gate. I go, motherfucker, you're a piece of shit. How could you touch a girl, let alone cut her arms off? She got a million dollars. And he was rolling a cigarette, a bugler cigarette. And he looked up to me and said, yeah, but the bitch can't count it. Oh my God. Is that, is that insane? Sick. Oh. You got to, you, you don't know about Larry. Do you know anything about him? A lot of these killers, famous killers, because California's got a, a disproportionate amount of them. There's so many of them that I've lost track. So Lawrence Bernard, Larry Singleton, Nicknamed the Mad Chopper, died December twenty fifth at uh, twenty eight. Sorry, two thousand and one. I know Florida is a part of. Died. It. He died in two thousand one of cancer. But he was in Florida for more rapes. Oh, yeah. So he got paroled, and he did it again in Florida. Huh. Think about that. How do you get paroled? I, you know, you got guys that are gangsters. Let's be honest. You got guys that are gangsters. They never get out. You got a guy that rapes and chops a girl's arm off a little girl, and he gets out. And goes it again in Florida. The justice system's upside down. That's what we're campaigning for on our channel, is an end to the war on drugs and mass incarceration. And people like that, and people who prey on kids, they should never get out. I believe you should never put hands on a woman or a child. Exactly. And if you do, call me. <laughs> you know, if they do, call me. I have no problem. So, awaiting the move to um, Nevada then, there was Dan White. Yeah, Danny White, he was downstairs from me. He killed uh, Moscone, and they made a movie about him, Milk. Harvey Milk? Harvey Milk, Why yeah. did he murder Harvey Milk? I have no uh, no reason why. I and think he also murdered the San Franciscan Mer Moscone. Yeah, he married the mayor of Moscone. Yeah. What happened was, he was at war with um, White, running for office. He was a politician. He was a politician, and he went in and killed him. It was a big thing in California. And he buried a bus full of farm workers. No, this is that's a different, one, that's, that's one. one. Yeah. Wow. So who is Juan Corona? Because he features in your story. Juan Corona. Why, why did he bury a bus full of farm workers? He didn't want to pay him. So did they just die? Yeah, they died. They all died. Oh my God. You don't know this. You got Because he didn't want to pay him. Why don't you do your homework? <laughs> God, I thought you were this professional. There's yeah. too many of these guys. I know, but they're all, many, they're all in my life. They're all my friends. <laughs> We, we've done our oh, you're looking, you're looking at me like, where's the door? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know about Juan Corona? We have done our research on Saran you Saran. Have to. We've done hours of research on Saran I love, Saran. I love Saran. I love, I love him so much. I mean, I wouldn't be the man I am right now if it wasn't for him and Michael Thompson. What was the, he like? He was... Listen. You hear that? Yeah. That's him. Hey, what about Jeopardy? Didn't talk, never talked, and he didn't talk to anybody, and he talked to who he chose to talk to, who he chose to talk to, and he talked to Michael, and he talked to me, and I have the utmost, like I told you the story, when I was doing my legal work, every morning, you know, we've gone over this, every morning, I would give him he would give me a word on a piece of paper. And then the next morning at breakfast, he would say, okay, give me three things that you do reciprocal. Reciprocated, reciprocal. The fundamental of coming back over again. Okay. Then the next morning, he'd give me another word. And I would use those words as I do today. He taught me, as I always say, I don't mean to sound facetious. That was a Sirhan word that taught me. And Michael Thompson took my words took my appeals and did my, Michael Thompson is a, I would say he's 70% the reason why I'm here today. 
Shout out to Mike. Do you understand that? Yeah. And I don't care what anybody says. You only could kill so many people. And then you have to do something. And my doing something was the saving of the officer. And them transferring me to Nevada was the greatest thing that happened in my life. I'm here today because of, they transferred me to Nevada. If I would have stood in the California prison system, I would have killed Singletary. I would have killed these child molesters. I would have killed these baby rapers. Because no one should touch a woman or a child. Mm -hmm. What did Sir, Sir Han have to say about Kennedy? You know, we spoke very, uh, we, we, I never, you know, in prison when you're a lifer, you never ask somebody about their crime. You know this, Sean. You know, I never say what you're in for. Bad manners. It's, it's just disrespectful, especially if you're a lifer and you're of stature. But he always said it wasn't my gun. It wasn't my gun. And um, I didn't know what he meant till I saw that the Kennedys showed proof that a gun that has six bullets, a revolver, and there's numerous, you know, it doesn't... Doesn't that help? He knew, he knew, but I never asked. So I can't, I can't compound upon what you ask me. I can't really truthfully. All I could tell you is I didn't see him as the man who killed Kennedy. I saw him as the man that was teaching a 19-year-old kid, boxer from 18th Street, when he told me, you're smarter than all of them, you're more articulate and intelligent than all of them, better yourself. So I took, I heeded those words. And then Michael Thompson said, Joey, stop that shit. Focus on getting out. So that's why you asked me, you ask me. I never asked him. But I just know that along my journey in life, 40 years in prison, I owe a lot to Sir Han. I owe a lot to Charles Manson. As crazy as that might sound, he took the music out of me and said, listen to Paul Hardcastle. Listen to Hiroshima. Listen to some Johnny Coltrane. Let your mind go and focus. That was Manson. Sirhan was educate yourself. And then I took everything that I did to Michael Thompson. And because he had this beautiful thing in his room in the cell that printed words and he took what I did and he formulated it and I was able to get out because of that. So I owe a lot to Michael Thompson. And and, and I'll never you know, when people are good to you, even if things even if the the journey turns away that you don't see that person again. I have to give homage to that person because I'm a better person today. The person who made me the baddest man on earth was Benny the Jet Yukitas. I, I tell you and everybody to Google him. YouTube him. He's a legend and nobody knows who he is. But these are people that help me. And in the real world, people think that Sirhan's a killer and Charles is a lunatic and Michael's an Aryan Brotherhood shot caller. But for an 18-year-old kid who's lost and doing life, imagine being 18 years old and you're not going to the Pro Board. The year is 1980 and you're not going to the Pro Board till 2023. They're not even going to talk to you till then. What do you do? I chose to be a beast. And the day that officer screamed, the beast left me. So, you were receiving mail and visits from Terry, another old friend who said he decided to marry for conjugal visits. I married six times in prison just for conjugal visits. I mean, what was that like? A conjugal visit? Mm -hmm. <laughs> she means, uh, like, you like, have to go... To a special is room. Oh, how's it? How's it? Is there a bed? How's it? I think every woman would like to be with a man that hasn't been with a woman for forty years. Oh. <laughs> I married just for uh, drugs. Uh, women were. I married women that, because I um, at that time in 1986, I was a dear rock and roll gangster. I was a Teen Angel magazine, Orly's Lowrider magazine. I was the artist. 
So I did a wanted poster, wanted, someone sincere, boop, 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 and I had a full page. And I would get bags of mail from women all over the country. And so I would, they'd visit me, they'd take care of me, and then I would tell them what I needed them to do. And that was bring me drugs, send me packages, and I'll make you rich. So you had quite a lot of fan mail. Yes. How did you pick who was suitable? Well, you know, if you're a, if, if you're a hustler and a player, you know the ones that are vulnerable. You know, I, I hate to be crude like this, but, you know, if a woman says that she'll do anything for you, I, well, then marry me and bring me an ounce of heroin. So that was what the conjugals transpired into. Mm. They send you out on Friday to a trailer outside of the prison, between the prison gates. You're there till Monday. She brings enough food for three days and bring me the drugs and let me go in and make some money, take care of the mob, give them their 20%, and then uh, live the life that I led. And that's the reality that's happening all over the world. And now prisoners, <coughs> they use the internet, don't they, and uh, write a prisoner kind of thing? And... Well, we lost. We lost our conjugal visits in California because of Tex Watson. Tex was the killer. It wasn't Charlie. Charlie was... 25 miles away in Spawn Ranch in Simi Valley. You don't think he murdered? He didn't murder anybody. No? Oh, come on. People are so gullible, you know? It, it, it's, it's like with me. People are so gullible. They believe what they want to believe. But if you, if you do your homework and you Google it... Charlie was 25 miles away. What happened was Charlie was at the Spawn Ranch with his 10 flock of women doing acid, orgies, and getting high. Tex came and said, I'm going to go kill Folger, I'm going to go kill Bianca. And Charlie told me, he said, go ahead, I don't give a fuck who you kill. I'm over here getting banged, my brain's out and getting high. <laughs> so Tex went over there, did all that helter-skelter shit, while Charlie was across the city. And when he got busted, he blamed it on Charlie. Yeah. But Charlie loved it because he was a recording artist that couldn't make it. He was a guitarist that sucked. He couldn't sell his songs. And when Bugliosi, the DA, signed on and went after Charlie, it was Vietnam War at that time. They needed something to take their mind away from it. To this day, you couldn't get busted for hearsay. If Sean was to tell you to kill that man over there, that's what happened. Sorry, Liam. No, but I'm, I'm giving you a, you know, and I, I wish that everybody knew about it. Charlie was just, Charlie was just the right place at the right time, and he ate it up. Charlie couldn't kill, imagine a five foot tall guy that weighs 100 pounds soaking wet, and hasn't worked out a day in his life, <laughs> and out of his freaking mind. We all have a friend like that. Yeah. And couldn't, and couldn't bust a grape in a grape field. That was Charlie. Charlie didn't have a bad bone in his body. So that's why I would wish people would really understand Charles Manson had nothing to do with those murders. But he was he loved it and he took full responsibility and he played it off like a he should get the Academy Award of all time. They should give award him an Academy Award. Every time. Manson interview. Joey. Showtime. <laughs> That was Charlie, you know, that was Charlie, I mean, you know, when I, when I would do his mail, and I remember so much that all his mail came from England, that's what was so bizarre about it, and he said, they got a motorcycle gang of me in England, and I was like, wow, but yeah, no, Charlie is, and Tex, Tex is the beast, see, Tex, another killer could look another killer, Tex is a killer, Charles is a clown, a clown, he wanted so much attention. He, they could have said you, you know, you killed ninety. Okay, he, <laughs> he, he, he loved it. He loved <laughs> yeah. it. He loved it. He became a celebrity in prison, and he loved it, and he died to it because he couldn't be anything on the street. But Tex f fucked our family visits off, and the lifers wanted to kill him. How did he do that? He had numerous children in prison, numerous with conjugal visits. And they were being raised under the state payroll because his wife didn't work. 
So every kid he had, the state had to pay for. So the Folgers, you drink Folgers coffee, the Folgers family went after him and they went to all the lifers in prison in California and took our family visits away from us. Wow. And, but if you weren't a lifer, you could get a family visit. But they took all the family visits from lifers just because of Tex Watson. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yes. but, but there's a little bit more to that, isn't there? Because Tex Watson, didn't he start like a religious... Oh, he's a Christian, he's a minister. And he, he became a minister, and then he got married, and he started... Yeah. That's how that began, didn't it? This a, As he sold drugs him. on the yard. He was a minister when it served him well. Mm. Praise God and shoot this heroin. So he was manipulative. Oh, he's, he's, he's a master. Every time I'd see him on the cell block, I'd see him on the tier... I said, you piece of shit. Fuck you, bitch. What? I used to tell him, what, bitch? What? Yeah, go fucking down the hall. I, I just hated him. I despised him, you know, because he had that. You ever met somebody you just want to punch in the fucking face? <laughs> and that was Tex. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so it's 1986 now. You get transferred to maximum security in Nevada State Prison located in Carson City. Yes, sir. Snow-covered mountains. What was your arrival like there? Sounds picturesque. No. They, uh, they put me in the dungeon, they call it. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, every inmate that comes in from another state, they have to verify your gang affiliation. They have to verify who you are. But I was there for saving the life of a correctional officer. And that's when I tell you that I never knew how much people could love me. I never knew. I never knew. The guards treated me like a king. They remembered me from the boxing days, not as being boxer from 18th Street, not for being mobbed up. But hey, he saved a correctional officer. Hey, you want to sweep the, you want to use the phone a little bit longer? And I was like, wow. How did you feel with all that newfound praise? I felt Sean needs a sandwich. <laughs> you know it, it, it was it was um i felt it was a long time coming how's that it was a long time fucking coming i got a plate put in my head i got told it never happened i got beat i got stabbed and now a whole nother state the officers know that this tattooed gangster ain't him he did something right. He saved one of ours. And that's when they transferred me to Gene, Nevada, and that's when my redemption began. That's when uh, the beginning of my life started in Gene, Nevada. So when you walked onto that yard, it wasn't like in California, was oh, it? People no. were more relaxed? Oh, God. Nevada prison system is like, you know, you got card cheats and slot cheats. And, um, you know, uh, I was there with... My, uh, Johnny Sacco. Tell us about Sacco. Oh, my God. I had just seen him on 60 Minutes, and he smoked a cigar that, oh, my, like, I've never seen a cigar that big. I didn't even know how you could put it in your mouth. <laughs> hey, Goomba. And uh, Mr. Sacco, I called him. Uh, he had just got busted in Dominican. He had, he owned, he's the biggest offshore sports gambling man That's in him. the world. Yes. He's a legend. He's my, I love him. He's a mentor. He's the one who put me into yeah. gambling. He hooked me up with Dino Da Vinci, and Dino Da Vinci was the, one of the, your, your friend, Michael. And uh, Dino Da Vinci ran Two Bet, Golden Palace. At that time I was putting, I was paying fighters from prison $5,000 to put Golden Palace on their back and stencils. So when they got in the ring, do you remember that? People were wearing... And they stopped it, but Mr. Sacco was in prison with me. His claim to fame was um, the biggest gambler, one of the biggest gamblers in the world. And I was his, you know, I, I, I did what I did. So what was your cell? What did your cell look like at this, at, in Jean? Whole different picture. Were you on your own? Oh, let me tell you. Let me tell you. It was no longer California or Arizona. Bunk bed, nice single bed, TV, real porcelain, 
wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. Every night at 6, the donut truck came in, newspapers, donuts. You want to go do eight holes on the golf course <laughs> in prison. And me and Mr. Sacco would walk around and they'd say, gambling is the key. Gambling. Gambling is the key. If you ever get out, see me in Costa Rica, Dino da Vinci. And uh, I did. In fact, that was 86, 96. You figure 20 years, 30 years later, I'm in Costa Rica with them all. Another character you met quite quickly then was from the Spilotro family? Ernie. I can't talk about it. Okay. okay. I'll just read a little bit because you can't talk about it. So, Ernie's boss had recently been found buried in a hole in the desert. His crew was known as the Hole in the Wall Gang. Oh, yeah, that was the Hole in the Wall. They entered through one building to rob the adjacent one. He was also a barber who gave a nice cut. And that you smoked Garza and went down memory lane with him. Yeah, that was my boy. And then Anna came and visited you on Saturdays? Every Saturday, yeah. And you told Sacco that you wanted to fight again. Well, you have to understand, I'm only 25 years old, 26 years old. And I'm running the yard, I'm doing five miles a day. Uh, if you watch the YouTube, the Joey Torrey story, you could see me put my hands on the bag. You see me train, you see, did you watch the video? Yeah. Yes. That's me at 25, 26. Now they're bringing in world-class fighters from top-ranked boxing to come into the prison to fight me. And I'm dusting them. <laughs> so they're saying, let's get this guy out. So Mr. Sacco says, he pulls some strings for me. And I can't go no further. Okay. So they needed boxers out at the prison for, for an exhibition. Top rank was the same agency who asked you to fight when you were 17. And you made an appointment with the warden, Walter Luster. Luster, Mr. Luster. Who was a boxing fan, and he's in his 60s. And he said he loved the idea of promoting fights from prison. And then you just went on the rampage, didn't you? You called every television station. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't. Before that, I, I contacted Boom Boom Mancini. You know who Boom Boom is. Explain to the UK audience, because they don't know the US sports uh, players. No, the world knows who Ray Boom Boom Mancini is. They did movies about him. Liam, have you heard of him? Yes. Oh, okay. come on. Great, great fight. Yeah, he fought Dooku Kim, killed him in mm. Vegas in the 15th mm. round. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he, he was the one of the. He fought Hector Camacho. He fought. Mm -hmm. He's in the Hall of Fame. I contacted um, through Frank and through Mr. Sequel, and I contacted Boom Boom, Carlos Palomino, uh, Ruben Castillo, Muhammad Ali, uh, Sugar Ray, and they all came to see me. You met Muhammad Ali. No. You met Tyson. It, it, you met no, Donald Strong. No, this gets crazy. No, I got. Crazy, I, no, 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 no. I got. I, I got. <laughs> right. No, I got something better for you. Oh God! My, <laughs> it's insane. No, even more my insane. My mother's dying of cancer. Oh. 1986. I'm talking on the phone with Muhammad. I have a party, a fundraiser in San Diego called Bad Boxers Against Drugs. Ali takes my mother to the hotel room and he's showing her magic tricks because he loved magic. And my mother starts crying and bawling. She dies a week later, but Ali stood in my life. Ali stood in my life. Um, he just stood in my life for all those years. He was a great man. And to this day, I still remember they had the program, Bad Boxers Against, in San Diego. And it was just, the world just, the world took flight with my story. It was, you know, you have to understand, there's no internet at this time. Nobody knows what the internet is. This is the first time my story is ever getting told. But, um, yeah, I, I love Mike Tyson. I love Mike. Mike's, Mike's a great guy, man. If Mike was here, Mike isn't the Mike that people think he is. Mike slap you in the head, give you a hug, and, and, and tickle you. Mike, Mike's a great fucking guy, man. I have nothing. I remember when I got out, I saw him at the convention center and he had just saw me on the cover of Las Vegas Review Journal newspaper. And he goes, I know you. And he's telling all his bodyguards, this guy just did 30 fucking years and come to my house, let's party. And Mike is a great guy. But um, yeah, it's, it's... Were you allowed to your mother's funeral? <sighs> wow, that's... <it's... laughs> I'm a strong
I call the director of California Department of Corrections on a three-way phone call. I'm in Gene, Nevada. They tell me my mother's dying. She needs a bone marrow transplant. She says no. I call the director of corrections, Jim Gomez. I said, hey, listen, I'm Joey Torres, the egg champ. My mother's dying. I'd like to go see her. But I'm three-waying on the phone with Carlos Palomino. He goes, you're an inmate? I go, yes, Charlie 47554. And then Carlos says, Mr. I met you at a marathon. I'm Carlos. Oh, Carlos. Okay, champ. Inmate. Hang up. And I hung up. I keep calling Carlos. It's busy. It's busy. I'm like, what the fuck? I finally get through. He says, hey, they're taking you out tomorrow morning. You're going back to Los Angeles. They're going to free you for a day. It's never happened in the history of corrections. I went to the hospital. The security guards come up and say, Hey, there's an inmate here. I go, oh, no, no, don't worry, I got him. I was the inmate. And I signed my mother to take her off life support. And I went back to the prison, Chino, turned myself in, and they returned me to Nevada. Wow. I was the first convicted murderer, because in the penal code it says no convicted murderer will be released into society. Wow, that's something you just, things just, isn't that something? Sounds good, isn't she? Yeah. But yeah, that was, that's, that's, that's. But I owe that to Carlos, because uh, at the time my agent was Stephen Schiffman from Chewy Nougat. He represented Michael Jackson. He's the guy who did all the little teddy bears for the monkeys that Michael had. Michael Jackson's monkey. Yeah, what they did was they took his monkey <laughs> and then, so yeah, bubbles. Yeah. But in Calif in the U.S., they Chewy Nougat, Michael uh, Stephen Schiffman. He made a collection of teddy bears, had Michael Jackson's permission, and made millions. But he was my agent. He was representing me, trying to trying to get me out, trying to help me get back in the ring, and uh, he paid. I had to pay double time for the officers. Two officers were two behind me, so I had to pay. I think it came out to like maybe sixteen thousand dollars. They'll release you on a temporary TCA, temporary community leave, but you have to pay for the officers that are taking you there. And ninety nine percent of the time, inmates can't afford it. But I was able to, and thank God I gave my mother a kiss, took her off life support, drank a bottle of tequila, and went back to prison to do another 30 years. And my father, they let me out for my father who died later. It was around this time you called Daryl Strawberry. Do you know Daryl Strawberry is? No. Okay. <laughs> right fielder for the New York Mets. Um, Fucked up the greatest baseball career in history doing crack cocaine. He was the living legend of uh, New York City. Dwight Gooden, Daryl Strawberry, uh, MVP. Yeah, I knew Daryl and his brother Ronnie and Eric Davis and Royce Clayton. and These were kids that grew up in the city that became some of the greatest baseball players. And I decided, because I had bad, hey, let me get some of my friends that I grew up with. So I contacted Daryl. What I did was, did you watch the video, the Joey Torrey story on YouTube? Yes. yes. Did you see that girl that said, he changed my life, I saw what a man could do in prison? Well, she's walking with that fat guy. Well, that fat guy is John Nadell, <laughs> the editor of the Associated Press, who contacted me to save his daughter to get off drugs. She was into meth, wasn't she? Meth, like crazy. Well, John Nadell gave me the phone number for Eric Davis and Daryl Strawberry. And that's how my that's that's how my claim to fame began. Because Daryl Strawberry told Dion Sanders, who told Paul Molitor, who so now I had the top athletes in the world coming to the prison to see me and asking me to represent them. I told them can, if I can make you a million dollars if you can make me a million, make it. But do I have to deal with your agent? No, my agent only deals with my contractual agreement with the Major League Baseball. So then I started contacting Mercedes-Benz. You're a player. You're playing in Cincinnati, Eric Davis. Mercedes-Benz will give you and your wife two Mercedes, give you $250,000 a year to promote Mercedes. I'd get my finder's fee, five, 10000 and then I'd move on to do the next deal, baseball car deals memorabilia deals. 
and it got to the point where I needed to find places to put the money because I was making so much money in prison. And that's when I started bad. And that's when I started reaching out to the children and going, at that time, again, let me reiterate, there was no internet. But I would go live from the warden's office, Walter Luster, via whatever they did, Cam or I don't know, I'm illiterate when it comes to technology. And I'd be sitting in front of 150 black kids in Harlem PS29 and they're asking me questions about prison. And that's when my life changed. That's when it changed. Hope you're enjoying this podcast. There's a word from our sponsor, Rocket Money. The other day, I had to cancel free Amazon Prime memberships. I had a personal on the UK, Amazon, US, Amazon company account, US, Amazon, UK, Amazon. Do you understand how hard it is to cancel these bloody things? That's why Rocket Money makes these things so much easier, formerly known as Truebill. The app shows all your subscriptions in one place and cancels what you don't want for you. Rocket Money can even find subscriptions you didn't know you were paying for. Just like with me, with my four Amazon Prime memberships, you may find out you've been at least double charged for a subscription. To cancel a subscription, all you've got to do is press cancel and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Get rid of useless subscriptions with Rocket Money now. Go to rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Seriously, it could save you hundreds per year. That's rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Thank you for supporting our sponsor, Rocket Money. Links in the description box. Cheers. So, Joey, you started to get a line on baseball cards. How did that work? Jim Pasco, who owned classic baseball cards, um, he was a big fan of mine because of Daryl Strawberry. I, I became, because of Daryl Strawberry and Eric Davis and Deion Sanders and Emmett Smith, I became the person you contacted to get a hold of the person you needed to get to. Because you have to understand, when you're a baseball, to receive my associates was in general, my bachelor's was in sports management. I always saw myself as being a sports agent for inner city athletes, if I ever got out. So contacting Eric Davis and Daryl Strawberry, they put me in a position to contact other athletes. And then I realized they needed endorsements because when you get to that level, when you're making a hundred million dollar contract, but they want more. But the agent doesn't do it because the agent's negotiating with the baseball team. It's like Rooney playing for Manchester United and he's getting X amount of dollars. But hey, Joey comes along and says, hey, Mr. Rooney, I could get you to go over here with the baseball card company and make you another hundred million. So what I would do was, well, it's just to put it in a, a, a way that across over here you would understand. I would contact, I'd have permission from Eric Davis. I would call Jim Pasco from Classic Cars, also known as SCRB Scoreboard. They had just gone on the market. They had just started trading. And I would say, hey, Mr. Pasco, I'm Joey Torres. I represent Daryl Strawberry, Emmett Smith. And I'd give him the lineage of the who I represented. But hey, aren't you the guy in prison? I go, you got a problem with that? <laughs> aren't you that gangster? You got a problem with that? <laughs> I'm talking business. I would love to have Eric. I would love to have Daryl. So we would negotiate a deal. And then I would turn it over for permission from the players and receive my finder's fee. I would negotiate deals for Daryl and Eric to go to Japan for a home run derby, airfare, et cetera, et cetera, finder's fee. Is that where you're asking? Yes. You had a relationship with Reebok? Reebok, um, Eric contacted me because he wanted, well, I had came out with an idea, which sadly it didn't sell, but I, it was on the verge of making me seven figures. I pictured myself in a black and white commercial for Reebok running around the prison yard with a gun tower and shotguns and I put my Reebok up, up on this chair and I say, I'm Joey Torres and I wear the lifer shoe by Reebok. 
That's genius. They yeah. didn't go for it. They didn't oh. go for it. <laughs> Sadly, they didn't go for it. But they did go for signing. <laughs> they did go for signing um, Eric and Daryl. And then what happened was um, Eric Eric Davis called me and said, "Hey, I just bought this house, and I need you to get me." They had just came out with that thing called breakaway rims, where if you dunk, it gives. And so I called Reebok, and I had them installed in his house, and he would do publicity for Reebok for the rims. Were there any companies who wouldn't deal with you because you were in prison? No. Hang up the phone. No. no. I never got that. Hmm. I never got that. I never. I never received. Well, you know, I received that. I got a phone call from uh, John Cassetti. He was the uh, he was starting a company called. Um, Rollerblades, and he said, "I have this idea with four rolls. They're called rollerblades. I need a quarter of a million. I didn't have a quarter of a million, but I wish I would have because rollerblades—they're all over the world now. Huge." So when Carlos Palomino visited you, he described it looked like the guards were working for you, <laughs> coming by to check in on them periodically. Asking if you needed anything, it didn't. It didn't appear like prison. <laughs> I had the I had guards that I would I would send five grand to their house, and every day I would wake up that go to the yard and come back there'd be a bottle of vodka under my pillow, or the Rolex I wanted to wear, or my pinky rings. I I paid the guards to, to do what I wanted. Is that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. You, you've told us the very moving story about Muhammad Ali and your mum, but you did get before that you got a visit from your dad. Yes. Uh, the warden called you out. What do you recollect from that visit? Where he told me I couldn't be what you were. Oh, my my father, um, my my family, my my life has been uh, uh, a mini me, you know, a, a prodigy of. You know, an amateur record of 103 and 2 with 76 knockouts. That was my claim to fame. I couldn't be beat. And I was 16. And I, my father pushed me to fight. Because I realized in later years that my father was a coward. So he took pride in me. Just as my brothers took pride in me. My brother Luigi would tell Mr. Sika and Bats Battaglia... Hey, let's send Joey. And my father came to see me, knowing that he's dying of lung cancer. And, you know, I asked him, why, why did you, you know, he goes, I want to tell you. I was jealous of you because you were the fighter I could never be. And, you know, I think of that a lot. Even now I think of it a lot. You know, like, I wish I would have had a pint with him. I wish I would have had a moment with him. I, I, I spent more time with you, Sean, than I did with my own father. Because my father feared me and he, he was jealous of me. And he beat me like a man and he shouldn't have done that. Does that answer your... But you did arrange something for your father, um, who was ill, and in terms of Daryl, Strawberry, took uh, him to, didn't he take him to a Dodgers that, game? No, is it, not just that, it was... George Foreman, I contacted a great guy named Jay Edson from Top Rank Boxing, one of the greatest matchmakers of all time. And he invited my father to Foreman's comeback when Foreman made the comeback. And he put my father ringside. And they took care of my father like a champ. And I showed my father at the end who I really was. So I'll never have no fear because my mother and father passed on knowing that they had a good boy. And Eric Davis, it was at the end of his career, and he got traded from the Detroit Tigers to the Los Angeles Dodgers. And they invited my father to sit on the bench during the game. <laughs> and that just totally blew my father's mind. Mm. I ended up at the end of my mother and father's life giving to them more than they gave to me. Mm. Does that make yeah. you know, yeah. Were your parents together to the end? My parents were married 57 years. They were together. And my father, I think he didn't die of cancer. I think he died of... A broken heart. He didn't know how to make coffee or toast bread because my mother did it for 50 years. But he was a good man. He was just... 
you know, the 40s was a different era. You know, my mother never wore pants. My mother always wore a dress. My mother smoked in the bathroom. She wouldn't smoke in public. It was that kind of era. But I know that they died. You know, my mother told me, she said, now I could die because I know you're okay. Oh. And to take your mind off your mum's death, you've produced a TV show. I did a program. It was called The Reporters with, uh, I think he's from over here somewhere, uh, Rupert Murdoch? <laughs> yes, Rupert Murdoch. Yeah, he did The Reporters, uh, our special of my Joey's life for my mother. Wow. And what about Rapamania? Rapamania was, I got a call from Stephen Schiffman, the man with Chewy Nougat who did the Michael Jackson uh, Bubbles dolls. And he said, listen, I know you're from L.A. and I know that you're respected by everyone. I want to do a concert called Rapamania that is live via satellite from the Hollywood Palladium in New York City with the leading rappers. But we can't get the rappers because you need to. So I contacted Dice and Trey from the Lynch Mob who were featured in the movie Straight Outta Compton. And these kids that I grew up with because I was with their mother back in the 70s. It's, oh my gosh. So I, Rapamania was Dice and Trey from the Lynch Eye, Darren Turntime. Darren Turntime was a 16 year old kid, rapper. He needed to get in the studio. I sent him to Sony. I put him in the studio, $500 every session. He came out with a song called Gorillas in the Mist. It went double platinum. And that's when I did the bats because of Daryl Strawberry. His bat company did 50 lacquer bats that said Ice Cube on it. And if you ever watch the movie Straight Outta Compton and they're on stage, those are the bats that I sent them. But what was your question? No, you, you've answered the question about the the, uh, the shows, but because this got so big then, by 1988... Oh, oh, no, 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 let me stop you. So Rapamania, so what I did was I contacted Cube, I contacted Debbie Allen, I contacted... See, Debbie Allen wanted to produce my movie. She was into producing, but I needed to get into the community, and I contacted all the rappers that I knew. They did it. It's still to this day, you could go to get a CD called Rapamania 1, 2, and 3. Wow. But I fucked up and didn't take the gross, and I was supposed to take the net. I didn't know about that stuff, and I got fucked at the end. Because was that the NWA? Yes, yes. yes. I was, uh, that, that was the thing. Ice Cube and the lynch mob, and Dice and Trey were from the lynch mob, but I had put those kids in the studio from prison to produce it. And they went on. Debbie did the commentary for the movie and for the concert. Did you know the NWA? Yeah. Yeah. So things got so big by 1988. You were featured on the George Michael Sports Machine, Fox Television, The Reporters, A Current Affair, and then sacks of mail started to pour into the prison for you. Remember, there's no internet. You know, I want, I want, I need for you to understand. There's no internet. Imagine with the internet. My story is being told here for the first time. You know, that's why I'm here in London. You your, know? your phone bill was $3,000 a month. <laughs> well, oh, no, I got, I, but, but you got to understand this. So, oh my gosh, you got to understand this. There's a program called YDI, Youth Development Incorporated. In Al Albuquerque. Albuquerque, New Mexico. A great man named Chris Baca. He, he contacts me. They're trying to raise money for children. I said, I have you. What do you need? He says, I need to bring celebrities. I need to do fundraisers. I got you. Don't worry about it. I brought in Emmett Smith, Carlos Palomino, Daryl Strawberry, Jeff Bagwell. I brought in 15 of the leading number one athletes at that time. They were able to do homes for pregnant women. I did that. Wow. What about Edward James Olmos? Great man. Sent me the script for American Me. I told him not to use it. So you were making so much money that you said 200 <laughs> quick, uh, kids to Magic Mountain. Well, you know, a lot of the inner kiddies 
inner city kids, you know, you, you know, when you really think about it, you know, you guys are in a great position. You're working. You're both working. You gotta. You gotta. What do you guys call it? A pound in your pocket. <laughs> well, there's a lot of kids that never get the opportunity to go to Disneyland or Magic Mountain. It wasn't that I was making so much money. You have to understand, I'm doing life in prison. Let's, let's not get this twisted. I'm doing a life in prison, never knowing if I'm getting out, and I'm not going to the pro board for 30 more years. But that's when it goes back to that woman screaming, being assaulted. See, what I did, that taught me. That is just all right. Go ahead. So, did you go over to the state pen in Santa Fe? Yeah, during yeah. So you, you did a transfer, was it? What happened was I was uh, in Nevada, state prison. Now you have to understand, I have bad going on. I'm representing athletes, but I I wanted a conjugal visit. I needed to get laid. <laughs> in a in a very well, I'm just being honest. Okay, let's just be honest. Okay. I'm doing life in prison. California has no conjugal visits. Nevada doesn't have any conjugal visits. So Chris Baca says, come to New Mexico. So I called the Department of Corrections, Mr. Jim Gomez again. I said, you know, I'm Joey Torres. I know who you are, Joey. You, you know, you never thank me for sending you to see your mother. I said, but I have something. I saved her life, saved my life. I'm married now, I have a wife. Be honest with you, I need to get laid. So they approved the transfer to New Mexico State Prison. <laughs> well, you know, it is what it is. You guys are looking at me like I'm out to lunch here. <laughs> and the, the former gas chamber room. Oh, Bay. that was the best one. When you, when you arrived there. Anyway, they transferred me to Santa Fe Prison. If you knew about the riots at Santa Fe Prison, it, it was it's legendary. Many people died in the riots at Santa Fe State Prison. And when you arrive there, mm -hmm. the sergeant is sitting in the chair that they used to put the inmates in when they executed them. That's a hell of a way to arrive to a prison. Ooh. Frightening. And it was the depths of hell. It really was. I was very taken back because I had just came from Nevada where I was playing golf. But in time, I made them see it my way. Because New Mexico doesn't have a football team. But they love the Dallas Cowboys. And who's my friend? 1993, just won the Super Bowl, Emmett Smith. And instead of saying, where are you going? He's supposed to say Disneyland. He says, I'm going to see Joey. <laughs> and I present you with the pictures. Please, I hope you post them. Yeah, we got them. It's the week after the Super Bowl, and he's visiting me in prison in Santa Fe State Penitentiary. I know it sounds bizarre, my friend, but this is the life. It's all documented. I know, but it's just, it even blows my mind that I did all this, you know. So the sports players continue to come visit you in Albuquerque, <laughs> but you also now start a prison radio show called Sports <laughs> Talk with Joey T. Yes. <laughs> it's getting wilder, wilder. Well, you remember, there's no internet. <laughs> yeah. I had a good friend, his name is Sparky Anderson. He was the coach for the Cincinnati Reds. He's a Hall of Famer. Sparky Anderson was the only white man that grew up in Compton, California. He's, he found some of the greatest ball players of all time. He was the coach of the Big Red team with Johnny Bench and Pete Rose. And he loved the hell out of Joey. He loved me. He's my friend. I loved him. I saw him before he died and he had dementia. He didn't even know who I was and it broke my heart. But I said, he said, you should do a radio show. You know too many people, you know? I'll be your first guest. So I contacted the Albuquerque radio station who had just interviewed me for Emma Smith and Paul Molitor. And at that time I had brought in Sugar Ray Leonard and et cetera, et cetera. So they gave me an hour between six and seven every evening and I would bring on my celebrity friends and I'd do it from the prison phone with my celebrity friends, three-way, all over the world. Oh, wow. <laughs> but, but you have to remember, yeah. there was no internet. There's no internet. No podcasts. 
So you'd have to, you'd phone off the prison phone. Well, I paid, let me bring this back to you. I, um, there was Chris Bacher from YDI. My whole business at that time, being in New Mexico, I was assisted and guided by Chris Baca. Chris Baca was the director of Youth Development Incorporated, one of the biggest nonprofit programs that helps children in the United States of America to this day, YDI, Youth Development Incorporated. And we became good friends. And I said, everything I do, I'm gonna do for you and the kids. I don't give a fuck about me. I have enough money to last me three life sentences. And how much money can you spend when you're in prison? You only could draw the X amount. You only could have three other inmates to get the max amount for you. You know, it's it is, you know, you're sitting on 50K. What are you going to do with it? You're in prison. So I hired attorneys to try to get me out, but they just ripped me off. But that's a later story. So I did the podcast, or the radio show, and I would be in the warden's office. I paid a woman. There was Ron Chavez, he was the associate director of Chris Baca. And I paid his wife $500 a week. And I would call her and she would three-way me around the world. <laughs> yes, that was my, <laughs> if it wasn't for her, nothing would have been done. So I paid her, her sons wanted jerseys for men, but I got her son's jerseys. They needed extra money to pay the rent, I paid the rent. They wanted to go on vacation, I paid their vacation. But I paid her, from 7 in the morning to 7 in the evening, I would call her, I'd say, dial this number. The Omni Hotel, I need to speak with Superman. And the lady would laugh and connect me to Dion Sanders, connect me to Barry Sanders. And I would say, hey, I need you to do my radio show. No problem. Does that answer? Was it a success? Yeah, but, you know, it was what it was. I, you know, I was... When you're doing life in prison, you're trying to, you, when you're in life in prison, you're trying to fill the void. I read, I read so much that, you know, I read The Art of War eight times. I, I, I read, I read, my thing was reading biographies, Lee Iacocca. I would love to read. I, I became wanting to enhance my mind. You know, it's following the stock market. You know, when Jim Posco says, we just signed Shaq, I loaded up on scoreboard. I told all my friends to, and I made money off of that. So it's expanding your mind. You're not a boxer from 18th Street no more. Oh yeah, you're still him. You can still whack a guy. But now you're the person that's making money. Now you're the mover and shaker, and you're in prison. And that was more mind-boggling than anything. When I'm sitting in the visiting room with the great Archie Moore, the, the greatest light heavyweight of boxing, is in the visiting room me playing pool with the cops. That's mind-boggling. You know, mind-boggling. What's, what's, the, what's the story with the rap group Lynch Mob and the stolen hand grenades? I can't. The warden saw that you were... Lynch Mob. Oh, yeah, the stolen what hand was... grenades. You said you couldn't answer that one. It was the L.A. riots. It's, 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 I could answer it. Okay, go for it. I'm in prison in New Mexico. I'm doing the radio show. I'm bringing in Emmett Smith. Ali wants me to go with Shig at the, but I don't want to deal with the Nation of Islam. I just don't. And I get a phone call from associates from the lynch mob saying, we, during the LA riots, they, came up on hand grenades and weapons. They were stealing all the gun shops in LA during the LA riots. You remember the LA riots? Yeah, and the Korean snipers and yeah. all that. Yeah. And um, I can't say no more. Okay. All right, so a warden, the new warden sees you, what you're doing and he wants a piece of the action and he calls you into his office. I can't say no more. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, you, you, you laid the law down with him, let's just say. Mm -hmm. And he didn't get his piece of the action. You seriously have to read my book, bro. If you don't read my book, I'm going to beat you up. Bro. I've already read it once. <laughs> no, you read that bullshit. You didn't read mine. You then decided to return to California. What was that about? Well, I had a good friend. Rest in peace. The great 
the mongoose, Archie Moore. He fought Kitty Turan over here on, across the pond. Remember that fight? Mm, yeah. Archie Moore was the greatest light heavyweight that ever put on the gloves. And in his punchy... Uh, in his punchiness, he said, Hey, kid, you're not going to do nothing here. You got to go back home. And I didn't understand it. And it was true. The law books that are, I was reading were from New Mexico. They weren't applicable to my case. I needed to be back in California. So I'll never forget it. It was the night of O.J. Simpson, that famous Bronco chase. I'm packed up, ready to come back to Folsom Prison. The guard comes in my cell. It says, everything's clear. I go, everything's in the box, sir. How about the TV? I said, I got to pick the TV. Well, let's go. They're here. California's here for you. I pick up the TV, and there's four joints, but the paper's yellow because the four joints have been under that TV for God knows how many years. <laughs> and he holds the four joints out. <laughs> hey, what is this? And I said, watch <laughs> And swallowed him. And now I went back to California with battery on a peace officer. Did that answer your question? Yes. <laughs>
were having gladiator fights, pit, pitting off the prisoners. Come on. And if the prisoners refused to fight, they just shot them dead. And multiple prisoners just got shot dead. And they had a spectator's role with guards and the secretaries and all this other stuff. And this was like proper, like, fight to the death gladiator stuff that the guards had orchestrated. It's, Mike Thompson. Um, Mike it's Thompson shown. has confirmed all this as well. He said this was the worst place he ever went. And Sean. Corcoran. Corcoran, yeah. Sean. You're a two time world champion. Who do you want fighting if you're a guard? The money's on you. I fought anybody and everybody. You don't want to get shot. You want to win. But who's going to fuck with you? I did it twice. And then Lieutenant Riggs said, no. I want you to be my clerk in the office. But I watched. I watched. <sighs> Imagine, if you can, that I now I'm back. Okay? Now I'm back. There's no more donuts. There's no more cigars. cigars. There's no more radio show. There's no more, hey, officer, take this money and bring me in a bottle. And Now it's the depths of hell. And again, when you could tell somebody something, Sean, and they could go to CBS and Google it and see the booty bandit, who if the cops didn't like you, they would send this 6'5", 300-pound black man into your cell to fuck you in your rectum till you cried. That was the booty bandit. That's if you didn't fight. So Lieutenant Riggs, a good man, Lieutenant Riggs told me, I'll never forget it, he said, in 1976, I was in Los Angeles and I saw you fight Shik Fugiyama at the Olympic Auditorium. I don't want you fighting. I want you to be my clerk. And I became the clerk in the captain's office. But they were so dirty, changing the paperwork. They would shoot somebody and say that they shot a warning shot. See, in California, in every cell block, they have red buckets full of sand and they hang them in the tiers on the upper tier. And what they do is before they kill you, they give you that warning shot that goes into the red one. And when the sand falls, the next one's going into you. But in California at Corcoran, in the depths of hell, and he, you know, Michael was there with me. Me and Michael would look at each other going, are we next? Are we next? Because they wanted to kill us because we were high profile. We were in the celebrity row. I remember the cops used to yell, OJ, get off the tier, and they'd start laughing because they were waiting for OJ Simpson to come. <sighs> so when they would fight, it was a daily process. I'd see the beautiful woman coming off. I didn't care what they were doing. I saw a woman in a skirt. I'm in depths of hell. That, that's. You know that when you see a woman on the yard, Sean, like, hello, she could be uglier than Aunt Jemima. And you're, <laughs> you're <bye. laughs> I'm thinking of you for a whole week, girl. But um, they'd be up there. And what I found, I always held this in me. I always wanted to tell somebody. Was that I would be done with my shift working, doing the reports that were so bogus. I would do incident reports. I was that clerk that did the incident reports because I do about 60, 80 words a minute. So I was the clerk. <laughs> uh, projectile, shot him, uh, spit, uh, attacked the other inmate. And I would walk with the Sir, Lieutenant Riggs alongside the ambulance going about three miles an hour across the yard. And halfway across the yard, you would hear the bullet. And I would think to myself, why would they call the ambulance and why are we walking there before the even guy is shot? Because they anticipated they were going to kill somebody. That's another thing that will go to my grave with me. Mm. That's another thing that will go to my grave. The day they opened up the yard on Charles Manson to get attacked, that will go on my mind. But what happened that day? Yeah. They opened the yard, they brought out all the gangsters and... 
They opened up the recreation yard for them to attack Charlie. Michael Thompson, Shitty Smitty, Lyle Hood, Shorty Shrekker Ghost. I knew them all. And he shut the gate and saved Charlie's life. But that was Corcoran. Corcoran was, you know, when they when they killed Tate, that was another thing that was mind-boggling. But Corcoran was, uh, there was no rules in Corcoran. Corcoran, there was no rules. When my father died, my father, I contacted Jim Gomez again. Jim Gomez told the warden, White, to let me go. And he said, no, he won't leave this facility. It took the special gang unit to come into the facility. Imagine, this is the Department of Corrections in California. This is a warden that is in charge of Corcoran CSP telling his boss, the director, Sacramento, no. The warden called me in the office. He says, hey, Torres, you understand English? Read this. No convicted murder will be allowed in the community. Jim Gomez said the special security, and I went, that's Michael Thompson did that. Michael did the appeal for me to go see, to bury my father. Michael Thompson did that. Wow, that's powerful. Yes. How did it feel to be reunited, to see Charles Manson and Big C? Oh, my God. It was great. It was, you know, it was a, a gangster re reunion. You know, Shorty, I saw Michael. I hadn't seen Michael in years. I, You know, it was, it was nice. It was nice. Jimmy was there, Jimmy McElroy, the West, the, the meat wagon. Oh, the wait. Tell Jen about the meat wagon. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> my good friend, Jimmy McElroy. He was friends with my brother, Luigi. They grew up in Brooklyn together, Manhattan. And Jimmy and my brother, they were just the best of best. Jimmy McElroy, you know what, these people think I'm, do they know who Jimmy is? It's all online. Jimmy McElroy was, he, he ran a thing that's legendary. If you ever wanted to whack anybody, Jimmy was the guy. Because he had a thing called the meat wagon. And sometimes there'd be 10, 20 bodies in it. And he drove it around New York killing people. But he worked for the Gambinos. Because at that time, all the Irish Westies, they worked for the mob. And Jimmy was my brother's good friend. And Jimmy was my good friend. I was He died in my arms at Mule Creek. He died in my arms, in his cell, in my arms. How did he die? Cirrhosis. But a great human being. But he was Jimmy McElroy. He was the enforcer. You know, he's the one who testified. He ended up at the end testifying on Gotti. <laughs> so after the 60 Minutes program then that showed the guards murdering the prisoners in the staged fights, how did the prison change after that? Um, it changed because the FBI came in. And the FBI got rid of everybody. I'm going to let you know now, so you can see it with the Michael Thompson thing, that um, there was an officer named Officer Tomei, who I fought with in my cell, and who handcuffed me to the cell, right above Michael's cell. But when the FBI came in, after the 60 Minutes piece, everybody disappeared. It was a whole new prison because we fought for it. You know, I, I like, if I may, mm -hmm. if I may, you know, I, say, I talk about Michael Thompson, about this killer, about this Aryan. No. One of the most, I, I can tell you this right now that besides Ben Thompson, who I spoke to you about, M Michael Thompson took me to a level where beat them at their own game. And I beat them at their own game, litigation-wise. And that's when I started litigating. And when the prison changed, it was a new era. When Arnold Schwarzenegger became the governor at that time, all that bullshit stopped. People stopped dying. You know, just because you're incarcerated for a crime, 
it's it, you know it's hard enough doing a life sentence it's hard enough doing six years but to have somebody feeding you green bologna to have somebody you know i remember in vacaville we were saying why do we have shit on the shingle but there's no shit there's no meat well then they indict the lieutenant who was taking all the meat and selling it outside of the prison or my baseball card collection of Roberto Clemente and Jim Brown, how the Lieutenant Van Sant took my stuff and then had the audacity to sell it online and get busted for it. But that's what Corcoran was. That's what prison was. Prison, there's no rules. So you got moved to Soledad. Loved it. Loved it. Loved it. Was it in Corcoran where you, you got to kiss your dad goodbye? Yes, that's when I was telling you... Uh, Mr. Gomez ordered the warden of Corcoran, but at that time, that warden, Mr. White, he he was not listening to his bosses in Sacramento. Corcoran was the only state facility. Now, there's many prisons in California that listen to, they have to listen to Sacramento. That's the director of corrections. But this warden said, fuck you, I'm not. Joey Torres isn't going to bury his father. And Jim Gomez said, fuck you, and sent five cars on the yard to come right to the unit and take me. And as soon as I left the facility, they parked, took all the chains off me and said, we don't know who you know or who the fuck you are, but damn. <laughs> Not to be messed with. And that's what the investigation did. When 60 Minutes, I'll never forget the old man from 60 Minutes came in. If anybody gets a chance, look at the 60 Minutes of Corcoran Prison and you will understand what transpired. Mm. We're trying to find that. Yes. You ran into a little boxer. I won't talk about it. <laughs> Next. <laughs> but he got you a job as a library clerk, which helped. You know, it wasn't that he got me a job. It was the beginning of the... It's, it, it was... You know, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say that. Are we able to talk about hepatitis C? Yeah. But I shouldn't say that because... He was able to put me in the law library where I found the miraculous writ. So I, I can't say that. Gotta give him some credit. I have to, but you have to understand, I was under indictment for three closed murders with him. And I don't want to talk about it because I just don't. Of course, you know? we understand. So this is where you learned you had hep C and that was from tattooing, was it? What happened was, it started in Nevada. I was feeling lethargic and I was like, I'm running, I'm, but why am I feeling like this? You know, I don't feel myself. I can't do five rounds on the back. I only can do two and I'm winded, and I'm saying. And I'm walking away going, man, what's up with me? And then when I returned, they had this program where you give your blood. And in return, they give you credits to go to the canteen. They came in and told me, you can't give no blood. You have hep C. And I'm like, I don't do drugs. How do I have hep C? And it was from the tattoos. Everybody thinks it's the needle, but it's not the needle, it's the ink. If I tattoo you and I have the ink here, I throw it back in the bottle. So after a year or two, you got how many people's blood in that bottle? So people need to be aware, bring your own ink. Yeah, I had an FC advanced to the point where I had jaundice and I was, yeah. And how did they treat you? Well, I was, I was attempting, I asked them for uh, a treatment and the treatment that I was asking for was approved, but they weren't giving it to inmates. And I was like, how is that not possible? How is that not possible? So being that the fact that, you know who helped me with that writ is Michael. Mm. Michael helped me with that writ. Michael did the writ for me. And um, I had, it was denied in the Department of Corrections, so I filed an 11, I filed a, an appeal, a writ of habeas, and a San Bernardino court ordered the Department of Corrections to give me the treatment that I needed. And that was an experience I never experienced when they gave me that shot every afternoon. So things got deadly again on the yard. You were called out by some bikers. You went out with some 18th Street guys that had your back. And then what happened? Can't talk about it. All right, well, according to this, you felt a pain in the neck and then a fist, a red hot pain in your neck, a fist came in as you tried to fight back, but you collapsed. Someone was found murdered in their cell. I can't talk about it. 
So the knife went into your side, and while you had these injuries, you continued studying your case. Yeah. You get stabbed, you plug it up. When they stab me in the neck, I got my chew in the back hole and I rolled it up and put it in my hole. And carried on. And it stopped the bleeding? Because I didn't want to go to the infirmary and do a report because you go to the hole and you never get out. Okay. And you were busy in the law books. Oh my God, I was busy in the law books. I'm fighting for my life. You know, you have to understand, this was, at this time I was 40 years old. And um, I survived hep C. But I'm not the man, I, I'm not the kid anymore. I'm not that 18 year old kid. And now I know it's a matter of time. I gotta get out. Gotta get out. How do I get out? Can't escape. How am I gonna get out? And that's when Boxer gets me the job in the law library. And that's where I'm selling porno pictures to pay for the... I know it sounds crazy, but... Every time a girl would send me porno pictures, I'd send them out to the printer, get a hundred copies, <laughs> and then I'd sell them to the inmates for a book of stamps. <laughs> And I used that stamps to file my appeals. How else am I gonna pay a hundred, two hundred dollars in stamps? I'm an inmate. So I would go to the law library every day and Boxer would be there. I would do inmates divorces, inmates not to be deported. And I became spending my time using my mind and applying my sign to litigation in the legal field. Wow. So little Boxer was looking at you in disbelief at the knife wound and um, hope there wasn't any internal bleeding. Then Clinton introduced a bill, Bill Clinton. Yeah, that you can't, yes, you can't appeal your case. But you can't. You can't. So that worked against you. It did. Uh, you know, everybody thought Clinton in the States was the greatest thing since peanut butter, but what happened is they did the non-appeal, which was if you pled guilty to a case, well, in years, if you went to prison, you could appeal it. No, you can't appeal it. If you plead guilty to a crime, it's not appealable. And it was insane. I'm like, they can't do this. Yeah, no, that was insane. Because he, he locked up a record amount of people, Clinton, for uh, low-level drug offenses. Yeah. Record amount of women as well he locked up. Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. um, so a, a, an appeal specialist came in then. What happened was, I was up for the parole board, my friend. What happened was, I was up for the parole board for a year, for one year. Um, I could tell you exactly it was one, is when Tiger Wood won uh, the peach, uh, Pebble, Pebble Beach. It was the year was 2000 and, uh, 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 I wanna say 2000 and, and maybe 2001. I'm in the law library with Boxer and every day I'm carrying books three of the appellate division decisions on appeals. May I continue? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember like it was yesterday. Here I am just making it over the interferon. I'm just drained. I don't want to go on. No mommy, no poppy, no packages, no visits. And I, I have to, uh, I got to dig deep. I got to find a way to get out because they're not gonna let him go out. They're not paroling anybody like me, not with my lineage. But I remember that I was sentenced to five years, never got found guilty. And I knew it in my bones. So now I said, hey, you're not boxer from 18th Street. Your journey, your education, you know, people, People think education isn't anything sometimes, but for an inmate to receive his associates and his bachelors, you know, I come from a family that didn't even graduate high school. You know, and in the memory of my mom, I, I went to school. I, I took my time to do that. I took my time to use the Emmett Smith autograph money to go to Brown University to do the course. <laughs> and I applied myself. And when I would come into the cell block with the three books and the three books 
in my prison jacket with my beanie rolled up and my cigar in my mouth. They'd be playing pinochle going, hey, what are you doing now, champ? I go, I'm going home. I don't know about you. And it was Shitty Smitty. And it was Shorty Shrek and Ghost. And it was Michael Thompson. Four months later, at three o'clock in the morning, I screamed out of my cell, and everybody yelled, shut the fuck up. You know, you don't wake nobody up at three in the morning in prison, you know? <laughs> I found this writ, 38 page, federal reporter. I challenge anybody that's watching this to go to it. From 1943, a writ of error quorum nobis. Air, quorum, C O R E M, nobis, N O B I S. It's Greek. It's a United States law. It's a world decision called the writ of error quorum nobis that says that any time during your sentence, if an error was made that wasn't the fault of you or the court, you could file back to your remaining court for a remedy. And I simply spoke it. I went crazy, brother. I knew I was going home. I knew I was going home, bro. <laughs> and I didn't even file it yet. <laughs> wow. And I, and I filed it. I sat back. But see, the thing that... are you? Do you know who Melvin Belli is? No. Had a yacht, San Francisco. Yeah. He died. 3.8 billion. What? He only... Rep he DuPont. When women got breast implants and they popped, 1.8 billion he got for them. My attorney. He files to Pete Wilson for a governor's pardon, but he fucks up and says, Governor Pete Wilson should be put on in a boat without oars. I'm denied. I'm fucked. I'm in Soledad prison, in the law library, selling porno pictures to eat and sleep, and postage. And I run across rid of Hey, fuck this. I'm doing this for you right now. <laughs> I'm doing this for you right now. Fuck this. I find writ of error quorum nobis. I file it. But it says that no time can it be denied. You could file it as many times as you want. So I hire someone to go to the courtroom in Norwalk and sit in the courtrooms. Because when you file it, it goes to Division A, Division B, Division C. It makes it to Division D with an attorney, with a judge named Falcone, who isn't a criminal judge. He's a probate judge. Now, every time an inmate files an appeal, it's usually this big. Mine was six pages. I am him, I did this, you fucked me, now let me go. The year was, uh, I don't know what the year was when 9-11 was, but it was the second 2010. day. 2010, no. 2001. 2001, it was the second day after 9-11. I'm like, why didn't I get any legal mail? because the prison wasn't receiving mail because people were mailing white substances. Because oh, anthrax they, girl, they yeah. thought it was, so all the prisoners were getting envelopes full of white baby powder. But I got a call to the office, the warden's office. Your appeal's been granted. <sighs> but we can't give it to you because all mail's being circumvented to the FBI. The courts called us to tell you you're leaving. And this is while the building is smoking in New York. Wow. And I hear the chains coming up the stairs. Turn around, give your ID. I'm driven back to LA. Three o'clock in the morning, judge grants my release, henceforth. They're asking for a stay of execution, which means you got to remain in custody until it's decided upon. And that's when I called Daryl Strawberry, who was in the Bahamas, 
I called the great Paul Molitor. He just got inducted in the Baseball Hall of Fame, 3,600 hits. Oh, we miss Paul Molitor's story. You can have it. Where he was doing the cocaine and his wife called me and he was playing the Yankees and I told him, put your ass in the bathroom. What do you mean, put your, put your ass in the bathroom, Paul? And he went in the bathroom. I go, I've been in that, cell, that bathroom for 30 years, motherfucker. Your wife tells me you're banging everything, doing cocaine. What the fuck is wrong with you? You're playing the Yankees tonight. You're going to the Hall of Fame. <laughs> Move forward. He posted my appeal bond on his credit card. So five transportation guards stopped in front of the cell. Yeah, with the chip, and it was eerie like a Tales from the Crypt. <laughs> Imagine three o'clock in the morning that you're sitting in your bed and all yours, like these long chains, the wrist chains and the ankle chains coming up the choo choo. She's coming up the stairs. Taurus, C4s everywhere, turn around, hands on the wall. I'm like, I had just smoked a joint and I was so paranoid. <laughs> I was so fucking, I hadn't slept since it was granted. Do you understand that? I'm waiting for him to come to me. Go ahead, I'm sorry. And you've still got the infected stab wound? Yeah, I'm still stabbed. Oh, so what's happening with that? Bro, they got me there and they got me here. You ate, you were eating a Big, Big Mac, Mac while they gave you some treatment for it. They took me back, a big prison bus, and I was the only person on the bus. And they thought they'd go for the drive through They took me down to L.A., went to the, gave me my first Happy Meal in 30 years. Did you get a toy? No, they didn't do it. They didn't have it <laughs> at the true. time. I'll read this quote then from the court case. So Joey had tears in his eyes. The stoic judge began reading. Despite vehement opposition from the district attorney's office, petitioner's petition for writ of quorum nobis is granted. Yeah. And then, the judgment of conviction is hereby vacated, vacated, as is petitioner's guilty plea. Petitioner is remanded to custody without bond and shall appear on December 27, 2001. I'd just like to say... How many years have you served at this point of the story, Joey? 37. 37? Yeah. But you get... You do the... You, you come back, don't you? What it was, was it was from 78 till 9-11, whatever mm -hmm. that is. I don't know how many years. After, after 20, 30 years... You, you know, let me tell you something. You know, you might know what six years is, or yeah. four years. But after 30 years, you kind of lose track. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. I lose track. All I know is this, my friend. That's all I know. Yeah. That I did it. Motherfucker, I did it. Melvin, ba you, say, you said something earlier, my dear. Mm hmm And I, I would like you to know and the world to know. You said to me, Attorney Diamond. <laughs> Him and his associate were Harvard graduates appointed to getting paid by the state to come see a lifer that's going to the parole board. And they came and saw me and they said, we're here to represent you. And I said, it's okay. I'm not going to the parole board. I just filed a writ of error quorum nobis. And he looked at him and he looked at him, and they both looked at me and said, what's that? Think of that. These are attorneys, Harvard graduates, and they didn't know what a writ of error quorum nobis was. But I challenge anybody that hears this, or I challenge you, Google it. It's a writ from 1943, a most obscure writ. It also states, you get one shot as putting a piece of string through a needle head. And if you don't do it on the first time, you can't do it again. So when that judge made what you just said, sir, I was in the wind. I was in Costa Rica. And when I got back, I got to tell you something to make you laugh. You've heard of San Jose, California? The district attorney was so adamant because every month I had to show up. 
for a health hearing that I haven't ran away. Because you have to understand, I'm still serving life. I'm just out on appeal. Even though it's vacated, they're appealing to the United States Supreme Court. And I knew I was going back to prison. Even when I was released, you have to understand this. I don't know if you can. Even though I was released and my sentence was vacated, I knew the judge knew and the attorneys knew I was going back to prison. Maybe not this year or next year, but I was going back. Because it also says you can't get two bites of the apple. And because of the Clinton bill, not appealable. But it hadn't been granted in the United States Supreme Court. So I knew that my time was limited. So I disappeared to Costa Rica. I would come back every month and the DA would be more adamant and said, Your Honor, he's in San Jose, Costa Rica, not San Jose, California. And the judge would say, but there's no stipulation on his release. His sentence is vacated. And I spent the next two years traveling between Costa Rica and Las Vegas until the our great friends from the FBI came to see me. But that's another story. Yeah, this is part two. Part one will be coming out soon. We've got part two out before part one because part one's still being edited. And part three, if you think just this release bit is like towards the end of this story, think again, it gets, it goes to a whole nother level of, I can't, I can't even describe what's, what's coming next, but stay tuned and you will see it. Huge thanks to Jen, huge thanks Thank to you. Joey. And um, yeah, man, absolutely brilliant. Give us a hug, brother. Give us a hug, man. Rudy the Brute was a booty bandit in, in Corcoran. Yeah, he was a big black guy. And that uh, what staff used to do is when they wanted to punish someone, is that they would take that person, they put him in the cell with Rudy the Brute and he would sodomize them. And um, that's how they controlled the population, by using individuals like Rudy the Brute um, to sodomize individuals that they wanted to bring under control. And they did that um, quite frequently, unfortunately. There is nothing worse, in my opinion, than being on the tier and listening to a man being raped by another man. I was in 4A, and I'll never forget, sometimes when I hear the construction on the street, and mm -hmm. I hear, shh, 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 shh. Mm -hmm. it just makes me go back to knowing at night when they're sharpening knives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's an eerie sound to hear when you're mm -hmm. trying to sleep at night, because you don't mm -hmm. know if it's coming for you. Computer, recording in progress. All right. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be epic. Fucking mic. That's it. Fucking mic. All right, I'm gonna close this door. But most of love. Likewise, brother. Right, fellas, I'm just... Oh, Joey! I'm just going to get straight into it so we can capture this moment. So, viewers <laughs> watching this then, if you thought the John Abbott meets Michael Thompson podcast was interesting, welcome to Michael Thompson and Joey Boxer Torres. They haven't spoken since 1995, and they were neighbors with Charles Manson, Saran Saran, 
the rest of the characters, they were at that prison where the guards were doing the fights to the death and murdering the inmates and the stories. I mean, Joey just, what I was going to do a Zoom with him and he said, F that, I'm just jumping on a flight to London and he's, he's here in, in, in my house right now. <laughs> this is just, my my mind is blown. I've spent two days with Joey, my mind is just blown. But huge, huge thank you for coming on, both of you. I'll just open it up to you guys to say hello because it's been so long. My brother. Yeah, yeah brother. Man. You look great. Man. Man. You look, man, I can't even put in words, brother. It's just like, yeah. you know, and, and what's so bizarre, Michael, is that the only reason why I'm here is because mm. of you. Mm. What happened was when I saw the piece on you, mm -hmm. I said, who's Sean Atwood? And I emailed him and said, Mm. That's my friend. And mm -hmm. if he's free, send him my phone number. I want to tell him I love him and thank him because I'm free because of him. And well, I love you too, brother. I man. Mean, it's great brother. to see you. <laughs> <laughs> just, to, just to let the viewers know then that Joey did serve 40 years. He was originally sentenced to five on a murder beef as a, as a young person. But then mm. he was resentenced to 25 to life. And he taught himself in the prison and went in up with Michael and Saran Saran. Michael schooled him and mentored him in the legal system and uh, encouraged him to do writs and appeals and on and off. You know, I'll, I'll let you expand on that perhaps a bit, Michael. <laughs> well, it did. Look, it's a two way street. Whenever you live in an environment like Joy and I lived in, um, you know, you have the opportunity to be friends. And um, when you get beyond the friendship, then you become brothers. And Joey and I are brothers. And, um, you know, I know it's been many, many years since um, we've talked to each other or seen each other. But, um, you know, when you love someone, that doesn't go away. And uh, so the blessing is, is what you've actually facilitated this morning for us, Sean. And um, um, it's a little overwhelming. You know, one to my Shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> you took, listen to me, listen to me. The mm. year was 1995. Yeah. I wasn't going to the parole board till 2035. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember the circumstances. And you told me, don't be a boxer, be smart. Don't fight mm. them. Fight them at their own game. Yeah. And from that little printer that you had in your cell. Uh -huh. Remember that? Yes, I do. It was a little cannon. You, come on, how many do, times were I at your door with my writs and my paperwork and you corrected my spelling and you told me, go on this venue. Mm -hmm. Don't do this. Do this. I mean, how many times, brother? But the you thing know? is, is that you had the wherewithal. You know, it's, it's not a matter of teaching um, you know, feeding someone fish, you know, that old saying, but teaching them how to fish. And the thing is that you have the aptitude for it, you know, and you're the one that brought yourself up out of um, prison. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, look, I'm grateful that you acknowledge me in that way. You know, again, I love you too. I do always have. But the issue here is, is that you had the perseverance and the fortitude to bring yourself up uh, out of that. And but you went... But you instilled it in me. You instilled it in me. You you Thank let you. me you you told me to take myself out of the prison setting mm -hmm. and 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 go to it legally. Mm -hmm. And you did that because I had no direction at that time. I was in the depths of hell with Officer Tomei riding me and locking me mm -hmm. up and hitting my house. Mm -hmm. Remember when yeah, come on, I do. you, yeah, you were I in do. that bottom cell and you saw what he mm -hmm. did to me. Mm-hmm. But you told me. So, you know, I could hear all you want to say about me. I know who I am. I'm a champ. Mm -hmm. But you are you are also. And when you take yeah, a young kid, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I was a young kid. When you take a young man and mm -hmm. you say you could be better mm -hmm. and you show him how to be better, you mm -hmm. showed me how to fish. Yeah. And you did just that. And that's why I'm acknowledging that. You know, it, it, um, you know the trials and tribulations, we can talk for days about what it was like to be behind the iron gates. But the fact of the matter is, is that unless you're there, you really can't get the sense of sense of it. You know, the, again, going back to those trials and tribulations, you know, the, the moment you mentioned that officer's name, I had a perfect picture of him in my head. 
And um, I know exactly what you're talking about. And, you know, that was just one of many episodes that uh, we both had to deal with. You know, people think that um, when you're in a unit like that, that everything is gravy, everything is easy. It's not. Our lives were actually much more difficult as a result of the activities that we were involved in. And simply stated, that was nothing more than attempting to help others understand Thank where you. we had come from and, um, you know, the value of that as it relates to educating others. What gets in the way of that is an enormous machine. Um, and it, there's politics associated with that, but, you know, that's the Department of Corrections in and of itself. You know, it's a business. Yes. And, yes. Um, you know, that's oftentimes what we're, we're dealing with. Just, just imagine, brother, what you've come through. You know, by way of, of you know, initially being incarcerated as a youngster, you see, them representing that you were going to come through five years, and then you'd be good. They reneged on that. They took you back to court. They sent you up for twenty-five to life, and there you are. You're left with it because they have you already. You see, they have you, and so now you have nothing left to you but to contend with it as best you can. Now, as you well know, many people. Um, just let it go. They just let it go. They won't fight. They, Thank just, they, you. They, yep. they succumb. But you never yep. did that. You, see, you always fought. And you continue to fight. I mean, it isn't, it isn't to say that the trials and tribulations haven't continued for both of us. They have. You see, but that comes with the territory. When you take a position, when you take a stand for something, as opposed to opposing something, we never opposed anything, but we took a stand for Yes, our sir. liberty, our liberty, freedom is a state of mind. We both know that. But it was our liberty that we were seeking, primarily because we had been unjustly convicted. See, and that's the issue. And, and, and that's really the hurdle, too, is attempting to surmount that hurdle. Because once they have you, it, the, the hurdles are astronomical. astronomical. Look, at, look at us, brother. Look at us. <laughs> I'm, I'm leaving on Saturday to the south of France, and I'm going to ah. get... And I'm going to be in Catania in Sicily uh, until, until Christmas, tanning on the beach. How many, how many like mother, that. how many motherfuckers can say that? You know what I mean? After after Not doing me. forty, and if yeah. it wasn't, and brother, you know, it's hard for people to even comprehend. Mm -hmm. You know, reciprocated by the fact that we were in the dungeon, but we stood above it, brother. And that's why I mm -hmm. got to give you your kudos, be kudos, because you know I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be mm. honest with it. I'm not fucking you. You're not putting no money in my pocket. I haven't seen you in decades. <laughs> right. But you know what? I'm a realist. I think Emmett yeah. Smith. I think Daryl Strawberry. I think so mm -hmm. many celebrities that were able to help mm -hmm. me to buy my typewriter. For you to tell mm -hmm. me, to give me the template to say, no, Joey, appeal this. Don't appeal that. This is what they're mm -hmm. going to look at. You mm -hmm. gave me those little idiosyncrasies that was able for me to continue the fight. Mm -hmm. And what's what I find so bizarre even today mm -hmm. is that I wasn't contacting this man, Sean, but for only a reason, because I saw the piece they did on you. And I go, mm -hmm. oh, my God, that's Michael. Mm -hmm. He's free. Mm -hmm. I was like, Sean, tell him if he needs any money, if he needs a place to stay, if there's anything mm -hmm. I could do for him. Thank you. Because you meant that much to me, mm -hmm. you know, and we went through hell, brother. That unit. Yes. We weren't other prisoners. We were on Celebrity Row. Let's be honest. Yeah, that's true. Watch this. Who was right above you? Sirhan. Who was to the right of you? Charlie Manson. And who was in the other cell? Juan Corona. And me. And you, to the other side of that, yes. So what I'm saying is we got hammered. Anytime they wanted to come get us, they, mm -hmm. they came and got us. Yeah. And I was, I was telling Sean, that's that was my meaning. My meaning, Michael, my brother. I can't even tell you what it feels like. You, you don't even look different than you looked in '95, brother. You look <laughs> the you. same. You look the uh. same, bro. <laughs> you look the same, my brother. God's been good to you. Mm. But um, we're he here, bro. Been. Yeah, we're we here. You know, it's like with me with my boxes against drugs and trying to. Mm. If if I could leave any legacy. It would be to stand in front of a group of children and say, you think, you know, let me tell mm. you what you don't know. Let me ask you, where's that at right now? Because you've had that for years. I still have it, brother. And uh, oh. if, if you get a chance, go to the Joey Tory story on YouTube. Okay. 
and you could see it. It's a conglomeration of different TV shows I've done. And I'd really like you to see that. Yeah. And, well, you know, yes. My it's, problem, it's, brother, right now is I don't have access to the internet. My studio engineer right now is my wife, Ariel. And um, the court doesn't allow me to have access to the internet. You know, it's that same old, same old. Um, they're, they're trying to put me down. And they're trying to put me back in. And you understand that, I know. So I, I don't need to elaborate on that. Um, they don't like the fact that I was released. Um, you know, I'm as the, far as they I'm, were concerned. I'm the same way, Michael. I don't yeah, mean to interrupt. But, but after I left you, my brother, mm -hmm. after I left you, um, I, they sent me to Soledad. And uh, I don't, you don't know about this because I haven't spoke to you. And right, I, don't know, right. I don't know how long ago 95 is. I'm not good at counting. Yeah. But 95 seems a long time away. Mm -hmm. But when I left the Soledad after I saw you, I took what you told me and you mentored to me. And I hit the law library mm -hmm. and I found a writ from 1943. Wow. Called a writ of error quorum nobis. Mm hmm which says at any time, if there's an error that isn't applicable to the court or the plaintiff, you could file mm -hmm. to your sentencing court for modification. Mm -hmm. And in 2002, mm -hmm. I challenged the parole board. The court mm -hmm. ordered the parole board to show cause why I shouldn't be released. Mm -hmm. And I was blessed and I was released, mm -hmm. but it took, it took me fighting the court. Yes. It took it took me fighting the court to have Arnold Schwarzenegger to say, why isn't this man released? Mm -hmm. But I used the template that you gave me. You know, you, you told me, don't attack them, don't, but tell the, ask them why. Mm -hmm. And when I did that, I was freed. But I don't think you know that even after you say they're trying to send you back. Mm -hmm. But even after that, brother, in 2004, the United States Supreme Court overruled it and mm. ordered me back to prison with a new life sentence. Mm. I did another 10 years. That had to be devastating. My goodness. It, 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 it was, brother, because I was living in Costa Rica. I thought it was over. Mm -hmm. and, it, and in 2004, the United States Supreme Court said you cannot have two bites of the apple. You mm. pled guilty to murder one. And they resentenced me. Here I am at Mule Creek, mm. 2004. But guess what? Guess the insult to injury, Michael. Mm. They resentenced me to 25 to life as a new commitment with a V number. Uh, so under the new uh, determinate uh, sentencing structure, as opposed to the old one that when you initially came to prison, applied. Exactly. And so your, your attempt was to get more time out of you. And that's what they did. They got another 10. And in, 2000, uh, in 2015, after using, like I say, brother, you know, I, I can't even articulate it. It's just like I didn't know how to speak or how to mm -hmm. formulate to do an appeal. But mm -hmm. when we fought all those appeals at Corcoran mm -hmm. in the midst of hell, remember that mm -hmm. people were mm -hmm. dying. People yes. were dying. Yes. That's why in they the call it gladiator school. And, and in the midst of hell. Mm hmm now it's 2004. I was free for two years. They rescinded my bail. I mm. was on bond, $100,000 cash pending appeal. Mm. They vacated my sentence. Mm -hmm. And when the Supreme Court said no, they resentenced me to 25 to life. And I fought from 2004 to 2015. Mm. And in 2015, the Ninth Circuit said, Enough is enough. Release yeah. this. Release this man. Yeah. They it's one put of the me things I do out. like about the Ninth Circuit. You know, they receive a lot of criticism in so far as being so-called liberal. But the fact of the matter is, is that they're they're one of the few circuit courts that adhere to constitutional law. Exactly. And, you know, that's the blessing of going to the Ninth Circuit, and the blessing also in that is, is that you had access to the Ninth Circuit as opposed to, say, the 6th or the 1st, you know, up in Washington, D.C. I don't know that you would have received uh, the love that you did had you been before any other circuit. No, it, 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 was, a, it was a Judge Camby from Phoenix, and the Phoenix that said, 
enough is enough. This man, yeah. you know, he sentenced, he was, he plea bargained for five years and now it's 40 years later and you want to give right. him an, brother, I wasn't supposed to go to the pro board till 2043. Wow. I was, yeah. remind yourself, I already did a life mm-hmm. sentence. Right. I was with you doing the life. Mm-hmm. Now I get out mm-hmm. for two years. When they resentence me back, it's a mm-hmm. new 25 with a Victor mm-hmm. number. The hell with wow. my B, with the hell with my B number. Right. I was, I was proud of my B number. <laughs> no, brother, come on. When you no, have a B no, number. No, I understand. I understand. Believe me. So you here know, I am with. B? Yeah. Here I am with a V number. And I'm trying to tell the prison, my, my, I'm trying to tell my captors, I'm not a new commitment. I was out on bail. Mm-hmm. They're saying no. And the reason, henceforth, the reason why I tell you this mm. is because you, motherfucker, you, <laughs> motherfucker, I mean that with love, you gave me the template in the depths of hell to say, Joey, stop, slow down, take a breath. This isn't a boxing match. Mm. Fight them at their own game. Use what's wrong. Use the errors that they made. And I told Sean, and I'll tell you and I'll tell the world, I'm free because you schooled me to show me the way to be free. And I'm here in London, and I wish you were here with me, and I hope you are soon. That would be nice. You know, the the analogy I want to make to you right now is you want to remember, um, as someone who has been in the ring, you know, that you, you know, you have a corner man and you have a cut man and you have all that. You have people that support what you're doing in the ring. But when you step into that ring, you're fighting your fight. You see, in the moment you stop fighting your fight and you fight your opponent's fight, you're setting yourself up to lose. You're done. You're done. I, right. I hear you, brother. Yeah. I so hear the, you. The analogy applies here. What you did was that you utilized your resources. You had a corner man, you had a cut man, but you stepped into the ring and you fought your fight as opposed to their fight. And that's the difference. We're free, brother. We're yeah, free. We and, and you're going to stay free because God knows that you're right. And mm-hmm. you know what, what you're doing today and what we're trying to attempt to do. Brother, you know, you, as I tell people, I, I spoke. They hired me when I got out. And the mm-hmm. Department of Corrections was having me speak to new releases. Oh, yeah. They were paying me with uh, Home Depot gift cards. Yeah. And... And I, I told the inmates, I said, you guys are free. It's your first day free. But trust, everyone in this room, all the parole agents, I said, they all want you back because yeah. you're, the, you're their job security. Yes. And, yeah. and don't believe. Believe in yourself. Yes. Don't believe in the drugs. Don't believe. Mm-hmm. Break, the, break the cycle. You mm-hmm. have to break the cycle because everybody's not made a killer. That's right. It, it, it's the survival mode that you, it, life puts you in. Mm-hmm. Brother, if we weren't where we, if we weren't Michael, who we are, mm-hmm. we would have been a statistic. Well, I agree with that. Yeah, you know, I don't know what happened to all our comad- our compadres, but I know one thing: they weren't doing what you and me were doing in that prison, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. law library research. Right. Mm-hmm. So I am so happy to see you, my brother. Excuse mm. me for crying. Oh but- no. I, you know, I appreciate it actually. You know, it touches man, me. bro. It touches I'm just me. telling you, man. You're a man among men, and and uh, you have my utmost respect. Thank and you. I'm so happy to see you. And if there's anything I could do for you or your family, if you, if I could send a letter from Bad from our foundation with Emmett Smith and Daryl Strawberry, and mm-hmm. get you a letter. To, if there's anything I could do, man, Emmett's you know, been with you for years. I remember back in '95. Yes. Yeah, yep. it was a strong support. He used to come and see you at the prison. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, but it, I, it, it, the photographs. I went down to Pensacola to play golf with him in a tournament. And yeah. I was I was thinking about how far I had come. Mm. And, and you come to what my wife knows you and has never met you. Mm. You know, I would tell her stories, you know. Uh, I, brother, think about it. Think about mm. it. All we went through mm-hmm. and we stopped. And we beat them at their own game. Thing is, is what we do with that now. You see, we've been given an opportunity here. And so when you talk about continuing to work with at-risk youth like you do, see, that's enormous. And that's really the value of where we're at today. You know, we've given purpose to our life in service to others. And that's really important to remember, you know, as we move through the rest of our life. It, um, you know, I'm in my 70s now. 
but I got a good 30 years, got a good 30 years ahead of me. I know that. And uh, I plan to put that to good use. And I know you do too. I, so, I just want to, I just want to make it different, Michael. Michael, my thing is right now, yeah. you know, I, I, I didn't want, I, I'm going to, I'll let you know. Uh, I'm, I'm fighting, I'm stage three cirrhosis and mm -hmm. uh, it's kicking my ass, but mm -hmm. I'm fighting it. Like I fought everything else. Well, why don't but, you let me help you fight that? But I'm I'm gonna do it. But if, if I want to do anything in my life right now at my age, I'm 62 now, and I mm -hmm. spent 40. I I spent 40 years, but I always remember, and you have to remember too. I remember those young kids coming in 18, 19 that have mm -hmm. life without, but mm -hmm. they didn't even realize they had life without. Right. It, because they were so caught up in the M.A. and the brand and the mm -hmm. suit and the gangster mm -hmm. and that machoism. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they didn't realize it. But once their parents die, once there's no more packages or visits, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then they're like, what did this all mean? Mm -hmm. So my goal in life, if I could leave a legacy, isn't mm -hmm. to be boxer, isn't to be the former ABF Walter Wade champion of the world, the convicted murderer. Not that. Mm -hmm. When you go to the YouTube, the Joey Torrey story, Michael, mm -hmm. you will see on George Michael's Sports Machine and on, um, on numerous TV shows, children, mm -hmm. children that were interviewed mm -hmm. that had spent time with me. And they said, mm -hmm. if it wasn't for Joey, I'd be dead. That's see, what we have to do. Yeah. See, that's what touches me. See, and that's your calling. And that's what I'm reminding us both of right now is that we have a calling. Your stage three cirrhosis, I can help you with that. You see, and will. But you don't let that get in the way. You take whatever precautions that you need to take to ensure that that doesn't advance. And you can do that because you have the strength to do that. But it's what you do with the children at these at-risk at youth that makes the difference. Because That's the key. In that, That's the well, key. In, you know, in that is love. You see, and there's nothing more healing than love. Nothing. You see, and it's that you love these children. You know, when you make reference to the fact of these 18 and 19 year olds coming to the joint with life without the possibility of parole as a result of their association with gangs, you see, all they were looking for to begin with was love. Love. You see, and that's why that's why I told Sean. I told Sean. Oh, yeah. I said, yeah. I told Sean, I didn't want to sound facetious. I didn't want to sound disrespectful to anyone mm -hmm. that has a story. Mm -hmm. But I have come to the conclusion that my journey at the end of my journey. That I became the founder of the 18th street gang only because I wanted to be accepted like I did in the ring when I fought mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I would do anything it cost. I would kill. I would do what any, I was told to do because I wanted love. And mm -hmm. I think that, I think that we lost a generation and mm -hmm. it's people like you and me that have to get back in the fight. And now we mm -hmm. have to fight for the little ones because at the end of the day, when they cross the hands on our chest and they drop the lid, I mm -hmm. want to be remembered as somebody that made a difference. Mm -hmm. And again, I, you know, brother, again, and I don't want to sound like a little weak ass bitch, you but, don't. but when I was with you in all that madness, mm. in all that madness, we stopped, we looked at each other, we loved each other, we guided mm -hmm. each other and we fought on while all the others stood in their cell, accepting what they got. See, the other you side know, of that, yeah, the other side of that, brother, is that there's always going to be that faction that doesn't want to see us succeed. You know, they just simply don't. You know, you've given our background, you know, um, convicted murderers, this and that. And first and foremost, they just like the idea of celebrity to begin with. You see, so what they want to do is they want to shut that down. They don't want that to stand as an example, unfortunately. You see, but I, 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 I always say the best way, the best way for mm -hmm. success, the best way for revenge. In my case, I think mm. the best way for my revenge is success. Success the is to, the key to success is seeing yourself there. You see, and you're able to do that. We both are and not let the haters, if you will, get in the way of that. You see, because there's, there's, there's a, a group, a body of individuals, people who are suffering see, as we have suffered. And so we bring something to that that will resonate with them. They need to understand that they are not expendable. They never were expendable. And that they can be loved without um, 
repercussions. Without taking the journey that we took. That's right. That's right. You know, I, I'd love Man, to see you get involved. I don't give, know. <laughs> give me a hug. Give me a hug, bro. Give me a hug. I hear God, you. Hey, brother, I brother. Hear hey, you. hey, I got to say it again. I can't even put in words, brother. I'm enjoying Europe. I'm enjoying just mm. being free. I mean, mm. you know, traveling the world. You know, I, I did Costa Rica. I did Cuba. Mm-hmm. I drove across the U.S. I've been Since I've been out, all I've been doing is traveling and spreading the mm. word. All right. And I'm so happy to run into Mr. Atwood, Sean, not because of what he's doing, mm-hmm. but, I, but it, it's so prolific that I contacted this man mm-hmm. just for him to send you my phone number to say, I'm proud of you. I love you. And I'm here for you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons I, I did the interviews that I've done with Sean is because I believe in what he's doing. See, he works with at, at risk youth. See, he goes into schools. You know, he does some fantastic work, some great work. And these are the kind of individuals that I want to align myself with because they stand for something, you see. And it's, it's, it's incredibly important. I know people want to hear, you know, the war stories and everything else. And I don't have a problem sharing that, particularly if it gives them insight um, into not only my humanity, but um, the ramifications of having been behind the Iron Gates. And coming out the other side of that, still intact, still whole, still a human being, and striving to be the best human beings we can possibly be. And that's what it's about. And men like Sean do just that. That's why I'm here, brother. Brother, I'm here. He wanted to listen to this. He wanted to. He goes, well, well, mate or chap, whatever the hell he said. (laughs) He said, "Um, I'm going to do you on Zoom. I said... Mm. I said, what did I say? Tell him what I said. My, What did I tell you? My story ain't going to be done on no fucking Zoom. I'm flying my ass over to London. <laughs> and then the like, next day he was here. I said, let's do it. Let's do it right. Let's do it right. You know, I always say the best for me, for the haters is success. Mm-hmm. I have right. haters. I have haters. I mean, I, oh, yeah. I have people that are like, you know, you should, you should have died in prison. Well, you don't know the mm-hmm. story. You don't mm-hmm. know the story until it's your family member. Mm-hmm. You know, I just saw uh, on Tuesday in the LA Times, I just saw where they said that uh, someone in the state of California either knows somebody or a family member that's in prison. Mm-hmm. That's the cycle they have to break. That's right. You know, that that's the cycle. And I think for me personally, being my age, I remember mm-hmm. in the 70s and 80s, we lost a generation of children based on single mm-hmm. parents. Right. You know, we lost a generation of kids to single parents that were women that were raising kids that had mm-hmm. no father figure. Mm-hmm. And as you count 20 years later, they're mm-hmm. next to us in the prison cell. That's right. And they're doing life, but they're homie from this neighborhood. They're homie from that neighborhood. And that's the only thing that they have loving them or they think they do. Mm-hmm. Until you love yourself, you can't love nobody else. I agree. You know, one of the things that used to hurt me the most is when, I was behind the air gates and some youngster would come up and introduce himself to me and he'd say, well, you know, um, my father knew you or my uncle knew you. And I would think, oh, man, you see that pattern repeating itself. Exactly. We have to break that. We have to break that. And when I go to the liquor store, I have people saying, hey, where are you from? And I'm like, wow, I've been hearing this for 60. I've been hearing this for 50 years. Where are you from? Mm -hmm. Where are you from? And now... I say, I'm boxer from 18th Street. I was. And they go, Mm -hmm. but he's in prison doing life. I go, no, I'm free. Mm -hmm. And you could be. It ain't Mm -hmm. about the neighborhood, brother. That's right. And it it isn't, brother. It isn't. Mm -hmm. It ain't about the MA. It ain't about the AB. It's about you. That's right. It's about you. You know, that that, that format was set up by the Department of Corrections in the 50s. And they still go by it. Yes. They just they want us to kill each other so they could just get that overtime and they could keep the fight going. Because what happens if everybody found the way? There would be no prisons mm-hmm. and they have no mm-hmm. job. Yeah. Am it's I right? Job security. Oh, yeah, it's called job security. I mean, you know, uh, my wife, Ariel, works in the system still to this day, um, deals with um, individuals who are charged with uh, the death penalty. So she interviews their families and she interviews the individual and she goes into court as an expert witness. And over and over and over again, we see this as we move through these cases. She has, she has eight cases right now. And we see that, that pattern that you're talking about, you know, asserting itself. 
on these youngsters. And so when you start talking to the family, again, you see the pattern. You know, and that's really what we're talking about here are patterns. And so that when we talk about breaking the pattern, that's what we're talking about. We do that through education. You see, we do that through example. You know, we do that by going into the um, schools and talking to the kids, by going into the, the uh, inner city communities. Talking Brother, to the you, kids. Sh Michael, when, when you see my video, I wish you uh -huh. would have seen it before. But it, when you see my video, Nancy mm -hmm. Reagan, Nancy Reagan, the year was 19, but the year, let me, let me give you this. It's the year is 1986. Mm. I'm sent out of state to Gene, Nevada for saving the officer's life. Mm -hmm. I remember that. And I saw her on TV say, say no to drugs. And when I was interviewed, I said, like, she knows, like she's done it. <laughs> what child is going to listen to her? Right. Put me in front of some kids. Let mm -hmm. me tell them how they wash my clothes, how they run mm -hmm. my errands. Mm -hmm. Let them know the real, because mm -hmm. nobody's going to listen to their parents or their teacher. They're going to mm -hmm. listen to a Joey and a Michael and a Sean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the key. And if mm -hmm. we could get more people to believe in what we're doing, how come there's no crusaders like us? How come mm -hmm. we're not on the front lines? Mm -hmm. I, people, I always point, Well, brother, I think at this point, that's the whole purpose of what we're doing is to educate people, to give them some insight into the kind of life that we have led and what we're attempting to do now and why. And so that's really an educative process. And that's what this is about, really. Those I think, viewers, Michael, I think hmm. Sean's over here. Sean's sitting over here going, hey, uh, you know, th this, is, uh, this is my show. Can I talk? <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got a question for Michael, actually. Yeah, Sean. Could you tell us about shitty schmitty? Yeah, that's. I, um, I told him, bro. I told him. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was. Uh, you know what? You know what yeah. I told him? No, Michael. You know what I told him? Yeah. Hmm. I'll never forget the the all day poker games, hmm. and it was me, Shitty Smitty, Shorty mm -hmm. Shrek, and Ghost mm -hmm. playing poker, and I'll never forget it. You know, they say you remember things when you die. Yeah. I think what I'll remember is when we were playing poker and I was drinking my coffee. And I looked down in the coffee and he had put his eyeball in the coffee pot, <laughs> in the coffee cup. Because yeah. you remember, he had a glass eye. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget that, man. No, that was, yeah. uh, hey, well, he, he was, was a prankster. A, he was a prankster. Man. Man. Now, Clifford, Clifford passed over uh, three, four years ago. Uh, he died of, um, I think, liver cancer. It's the same thing, cirrhosis. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cirrhosis. And um, Shorty died of a, a heart attack. And um, he was. But tell him, tell him, tell him about Shitty Smitty, the legacy. Well, but tell him, no, listen. I told him a story. Shorty okay. was five foot tall, right. a hundred, a hundred pounds soaking wet. Mm -hmm. Sean, he, I pulled out four aces out of my hand at the poker game, and this little son of a bitch wanted to fight me. He, <laughs> I had never met a man with a temper like him. Oh yeah. But I, I think. I think for the people, as I told Sean, we could talk about rainbows and unicorns, but mm -hmm. Shitty Smitty and Shorty put in a lot of work. Well, they did. They both did. Shorty, you know, he was so small, but he had so much courage. You know, when we were old, when we were in Old Folsom together, all three of us were there in Old Folsom, and we were in uh, gang fights. And uh, I was so concerned about Shorty that. Um, when we would go out to do battle, I would send them up to the other side of the yard to be point man. And inevitably, he couldn't help himself. When the battle started, he'd come running down the yard and he would dive, literally dive, <laughs> oddly dive. <laughs> sure. um, you know, in, into the situation, you know, just because he wanted to be a part of it. Um, enormously courageous. I always, right. thought, he, I, always he thought he, I always thought that they were, both were brand. They, yes, they both were. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And it, that's why I'm saying it. It, uh, you know, Clifford um, was from Bakersfield. I knew his family quite well. Yeah. Um, yep. You know, Clifford was a good man, but he got caught up. And, you know, with the one thing that Clifford couldn't let go of was the drugs. But and, he had a heart of gold. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Oh, man. Yes. I, I, but he was, yeah. he was a killer. Well, he was. I mean, he, you know, he, he uh, killed uh, Steve Clark there in Chino because. Uh, Steve had um, called him a punk in front of his daughter. And with men like that, that's not something that you do. 
But, um, you know, on the other side of that, I believe uh, Steve's motive was to um, facilitate violence to remain in prison. He didn't want to, he was, he was scheduled to be paroled and he didn't want to be paroled. He wanted to stay in there with us. And um, unfortunately, it cost him his life. And how and about Shorty? Shorty, um, you know, Shorty had an amazing story. Amazing story. One of the greatest and, artists I ever met in my life. Oh, bar none. Bar One none. of the greatest artists. He mm -hmm. could he could draw anything and make it look live, as well, if it well, was alive. Shorty first came to prison in 1958. And he was one of the members of the original Bluebird gang. And the Bluebirds eventually became the Aryan Brotherhood. And um, you had the Bluebirds and you had the Diamond Tooth. But the Bluebirds, they had little Bluebirds tattooed on their chest. So he was one of the original members. And he came in in 1958. And um, in the 60s, he came down with a, one of the rarest forms of leukemia. And so they told him he had 90 days to live. And they sent him out to an outside hospital to die. And um, his brother, um, I believe his name was Brian, um, would come in to visit him and would smuggle him in heroin. And so he was slamming heroin um, in his hospital bed as he was getting ready to die. And then one day, the doctor came in and said, I don't know how this happened. It's miraculous. But, um, you know, you beat this leukemia. Unfortunately, before then, Shorty thought he was going to die. So he went out and I think took care of seven individuals that he felt had something coming. I remember. So he picked, that. Yeah, he picked up more murders. So the, the irony, I suppose, in that story is that he beat leukemia when he was supposed to die, but because he picked up more murders, he went back to prison and was serving another life sentence. And he died in prison, you know, serving that life sentence. But, um, you know, one of the original members of the Aryan Brotherhood, a, a former member of the um, uh, Bluebird gang, and, um, you know, Clifford Smith, um, same thing. Um, you know, he was a good man, a loving man. Um, you know, he came to prison originally on a robbery. And, um, you know, had the potential to parole, but, um, you know, he got caught up and, um, you know, ended up um, doing some things that I think that he otherwise would not have done. Um, you would never, you, you would, you would never have thought it, Michael, because if you spent five minutes with, with mm -hmm. him, he, 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 he would hug you and love you and joke with you. He was such a a great man is such a great mm -hmm. human being you would yeah. nobody would ever think that if you met him you wouldn't think that he was that guy right you know i i was telling sean also about my my bunkie i mean i i fought numerous days with my bunkie i mean we used to toss it up and i i know you remember lyle hood oh yeah you know yeah. Lyle, lyle was out of san diego and uh he had picked up a murder in a bar um yes. he was connected with the hell's angels and um so, yeah, I mean, <laughs> um, I like Lyle, um, you know, a very intelligent man, very creative man. What happened? Um, what happened to well, him? I never heard. Um, last I heard, he was out and living oh, in San wow. Diego. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. He was only serving a, a, a second degree murder. And um, but, you know, he got caught up in the brand, became a, a, an AB member. I always and, thought he was Brand. That's why I just yeah, I didn't want to say it, but I always thought yeah, that no, he was. No, brand. he was. He was. You know, there are a lot of people that um, that were Brand that people don't know. I mean, back in the day, that was not something that you wanted people to know. I mean, yes. at one point, we wouldn't even allow people to put the rock on him for that reason. Um, but uh, yeah, Lyle was Brand. He was serving a second degree murder. He'd gotten into a bar fight, ended up stabbing a man to death and, and went to prison. And like I say, that was uh, Hell's Angel related. And, um, but. Um, good guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good, good, yeah. good. Me. Three good mm -hmm. men gone. Three yeah. good, two good men gone. I, I good wish guy. I could, I wish I, if I had a wish, it'd be I'd give Shorty and, 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 and Shitty a, a hug because they uh, <laughs> they were a part of my, no, they were a part of my life. And to know them mm -hmm. was to love them. Yes. You know, you, you don't judge a man by his case. You judge a man by his character. That's right. You know, when I could talk to you some, okay, come on now, people, help me out. 95 is how long ago? 27. Oh, 27 and years. I, and I could talk years? to you. And I could talk to you today, Michael, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for the first time. 
Mm -hmm. Yes. Look at me, brother. No, I am. I am. And it's good to see you. Remember when I fought them and they let me out to visit my mom when she died? Yeah. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Yes. They said they wouldn't. Yes. That that warden wouldn't allow it. And Jim I remember. Gomez. Do you remember mm -hmm. that, brother? Yes, I do. I absolutely do. You know, those are the trials and tribulations that people don't think about. You know, when we talk about our humanity and what it is to be human and, you know, that which touches us, you know, the passing of a loved one, you know, just the opportunity to properly grieve. You see, those things aren't normally available. Well, so your support I, systems. I try to tell people because mm. I was telling Sean also, I had a good friend named uh, Rick Stevens. He was the founder of uh, Tower of Power. Mm -hmm. And Rick Stevens was he, he committed a murder in the seventies and he was in there. He's the one who created the song. Uh, You're still a young man. Mm -hmm. And he would sing that to me on my birthday every year. Mm, yeah. And he finally got out and he died of cirrhosis in mm. 2017. Mm -hmm. He went on tour with the group and knowing he was dying. And when you, when you look back, I look back and I look back at moments in time. That's all I have are moments. You know, mm. winning the championship, getting sentenced to the five years, getting sentenced to 25, beating it, getting sentenced to 25 again, beating that. Mm -hmm. And to finally be free, I can't even put in words, brother. You know, when I got out and I picked up a, I went to the first night out, I picked up a knife at a restaurant mm -hmm. and I realized how heavy it was because I had been using plastic for the last 40 years. Right. When I kept putting a dime in the phone and it kept coming out, because now the calls were 50 cents. Right. When I went to prison and gas was 50 cents a gallon, now mm -hmm. it's $6. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that I had to, you know, I had to align myself with to realize that, you know, the best one, I, I always tell this to my kids, some people are going to meet in life and they're just going to be passing. Mm -hmm. But I always have a saying, Mike, and I live by it. Real recognizes real. Mm-hmm. And Michael, you look very familiar, and I miss you, bro. And I love you so much, man. And I, I hope you, you I hope you get that yoke off your neck so you could visit me in the south of France or in my villa in in Catania in Sicily. Mm -hmm. And you could and we could just look at each other and and have a cold one and, and just say we made it, my brother. Mm -hmm. You know, because you're well, there. My thinking is is that we we will do that. You know, it's um I'm not in a hurry for anything. You know, it's, it's the one thing that I've developed over the years is patience. And it's not just patience wrought from necessity. It's understanding through discernment when patience is called for. And, you know, it doesn't matter how many people oppose me insofar as attempting to put me back in prison. Um, that I don't let that get in the way of what I'm doing. You see, that's just another thing that I have to contend with and will contend with. But I don't let that stop what I'm doing. And um, and I and, and I understand that, Michael, but I'm saying I hope there comes a day as it has for me. You know, mm -hmm. when I was released, I had a life parole. They mm -hmm. were on me. Brother, there was 500, not 50, not a million. There were only 500 inmates in the state of California mm -hmm. that in the last 20 years since Pete Wilson had been released. Right. And when I finally was released... Mm -hmm. I realized, I realized all the brother, I always say this to my kids, you know, and maybe I'm sure you could understand it, but mm -hmm. you only could kill so many people. Mm -hmm. And then there comes a time where you can only give love back. And That's I'm right. at the, I'm at the love stage. That's wonderful, the, isn't it? Hope you're enjoying this podcast. There's a word from our sponsor, Rocket Money. The other day, I had to cancel free Amazon Prime memberships. I had a personal on the UK, Amazon, US, Amazon, company account, US, Amazon, UK, Amazon. Do you understand how hard it is to cancel these bloody things? That's why Rocket Money makes these things so much easier, formerly known as Truebill. The app shows all your subscriptions in one place and cancels what you don't want for you. Rocket Money can even find subscriptions you didn't know you were paying for. Just like with me, with my four Amazon Prime memberships, you may find out you've been at least double charged for a subscription. To cancel a subscription, all you've got to do is press cancel and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Get rid of useless subscriptions with Rocket Money now. 
go to rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Seriously, it could save you hundreds per year. That's rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Thank you for supporting our sponsor, Rocket Money. Links in the description box. Cheers. I'm the, I, my, my brother, I get, listen to this. I got a flat tire in Costa Rica and everybody was driving by honking. And I had just been out a week. And I was flipping them off because I had that mentality. But yeah. then some lady told me they're, fl- they're honking because they want to help you. Do mm. you need help? And then I realized I'm not in prison anymore. It's mm-hmm. a different world. Yes. But, but, I, but listen, I got that from you, that patience. Mm. Mm-hmm. You used to have those talks in front of your cell. Joey, mm. slow down. Mm-hmm. Told May's trying to get you. Mm-hmm. He's going to get you. Don't let him get mm-hmm. you. Do you mm-hmm. remember that? Yes, I do. Yeah, interestingly enough, I do. I mean, it, it, you know, and it's, you know, the memory's there and it's not fragmented. You know, I have a perfect picture. The first moment that you mentioned that officer's name, Man. I had a perfect picture of him, you know, and the politics associated with the unit itself, oh. you know, insofar as what was going on. And, uh, you know, like I said, it was gladiator school. You had a lot of killing going on. And I was uh, in four, we were in 4A, 4 right, but I was right. in 3A, 3 left. When I came back Mm -hmm. and uh, there was a lieutenant that put me out to fight a Northern guy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm not going to fight, but you're Mm -hmm. a boxer. You fight, you get a lunch, you shower, you could be the tear tender. I get you out of your cell. And then I ended up working for the Lieutenant Riggs as a clerk. Mm -hmm. And I was telling Sean, it was really bizarre. And again, something that I'll never forget Mm -hmm. that when I would get off at two o'clock, Michael, I would walk across the yard with the lieutenant and the captain with an ambulance and it was going two miles an hour. And by Mm -hmm. the time we got halfway across the yard, the Mm -hmm. gun would go off. And I was like, how did they know somebody was going to get shot? Mm -hmm. Why is the ambulance and where are we walking to the unit and nobody's Mm -hmm. even been shot yet? Right. That's when you know you're in trouble. No, yes. You see, and that was the problem at Corcoran, was that? Whew. That's why they oh called it God. gladiator school. My God. You know? When when they opened the gate to try to get Charlie on the yard, mm-hmm. remember that? Yes, I do. The wreck yard, they opened the gate and mm-hmm. they tried to get the... And, and I told Sean this morning when we did the... I mean, haters could hate, but I'll tell mm-hmm. you something. Mm-hmm. Charles, Charlie Manson, he was a good guy. There was well, nothing wrong. No, no, no. I, I, this is my opinion. Yeah, you you're know, entitled he, to it. He was 20 miles away. He mm-hmm. wasn't with Tex. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he said, I, I was with these 10 girls doing acid in the Spawn Ranch. And mm-hmm. Tex said, I'm going to go kill somebody. And I said, go ahead. Mm-hmm. I mean, now he couldn't even be charged with it. That's hearsay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I love Charlie because he hit me to jazz. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a clown he was the perfect clown for the perfect situation Mm -hmm. all the times he'd do interviews he'd come to my cell he'd look at me and look around and go showtime (laughs) it it was a joke it was a joke to charlie yes it It was was. it was a joke and i told Mm -hmm. he was everybody thought he was this he was another man that was five feet tall 100 pounds Mm -hmm. soaking wet Mm -hmm. and my and my my nine-year-old grandson would have whooped his ass yes but if you talk to charlie he was just out there Mm-hmm. He, he was, I, 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 I media, still have the, the media made Charlie. You Thank see, you. That's the thing, you know, that's, uh, uh, you know, because the truth was, is that, uh, you know, Charlie was a two bit hustler. He really was. I'm not trying to take anything away from him. No, he I was, did, you know, my issue with Charlie was that he was a pedophile and, uh, I didn't know, know that. Caught, well, I know you didn't. Uh, because I didn't spread it around. You don't do things like that. But I actually caught him in the visiting room. Um, you know, and I won't go into the story, but the fact of the matter wow. is... I, I never knew him. that. I know. I never knew that. How see? embarrassing. I never well, knew that, brother. Here's the thing. See, had I made that not, that information public, you know, to the individuals that lived in the unit, he wouldn't have survived in there. So, you know, my issue was, was to remove him from the situation, wow. and which I did, and um, to have a um, heart-to-heart talk with Charlie. About I wish, I never, you know, I'm so stupefied because 
I, I, I've been with Charlie since I was 18 in Vacaville. Mm -hmm. And he's always been so fearful of me, but so nice to me. Mm -hmm. And I never would have, what you're telling me right now is I'm mm -hmm. going to stop saying what a good guy he was because mm -hmm. he was, I didn't know that, but there's yeah. nothing worse than a man that touches a woman or a child. That's right. So, so I am really mind boggled right now. If I had hair, it would be blowing back. Well, that's why I'm, you know? I'm actually mentioning it. I mean, yeah. I, like I told you, you're entitled to your opinion based on your experience with the man. <sighs> My experience with him was different. I mean, I yeah. actually tried to help Charlie. Um, I did. You know, I, I did a number of things. That's a story in and of itself. Remember when I remember when we remember when I stole his file and sold it online? <laughs> that I don't remember, but it doesn't surprise me. <laughs> remember when I, I, I was answering his mail from from England? He had more people from England than he did from mm. anywhere in the world. Yeah, I, I do remember that. He got bags of mail. Yeah, and um, you know, the, the my concern there was that these youngsters would be writing him, and they they were idolizing him. Yes, and they were. That, yes, that's they what were. I didn't want to happen. Um, because I knew who he was at the core. And um, I wish know, I would have known, brother. I wish I would have alienated myself if I knew that. I wish I would well, have known. I get that. But he's you know, out of my he, he's out of my conversational repertoire from this day forward. <laughs> well, you know, I just did a piece here recently because people asked me about Charlie. And uh, so I went on and I did uh, an interview relative to him because I don't want to perpetuate the myth of, of Charlie Manson because it is a myth. But I just thought he wasn't everything that they see. What I'm saying is, and, and I, I, I I feel this in my bones that at the time mm -hmm. it was the Vietnam War. It was a, a, a Baragosi, uh, the district attorney, mm -hmm. who was making books about it. That Charlie was the perfect person for the perfect crime at the time mm -hmm. that the world wanted to take its mind off of Vietnam, so they focused mm -hmm. on Charlie mm -hmm. because. Uh, my attorney, Melvin Belli, at the time said if he was arrested at this time for this mm -hmm. crime, he would have never gone to jail because that's hearsay in the no. third third way. Well, but, I remember um, Melvin. You know, he was good a good attorney, and 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 um, I have utmost respect for his opinion legally. Uh, but the issue as it relates to Charlie, one, like I said, the media made him. But let's not lose sight of the fact that these were individuals that cut the child out of a pregnant woman. Um, I mean, there's just there's no getting around that. And but he no was but he was he was 40 miles away. Well, it doesn't matter where he was at. He was in control. You're talking to somebody that used to be a leader of an organization, you know, that was wasn't present when a lot of things went on. But I was very much aware of them and actually condoned them. Well, and, he's out of my repertoire, brother. We could change the subject. I didn't know. And I feel embarrassed <laughs> to even say that. But no, I go no. by I go as 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 or go. Okay. As I did then, I'll do now, and All I'll right. follow. And I'll follow your lead. Well, there's All another right. character I need to ask Mike about, and that is okay. the Booty Bandit of Corcoran Prison. Oh, yeah, that's man. Rudy the Brute. <laughs> Rudy, Rudy the Brute. <laughs> yeah, Rudy the Brute was a booty bandit in, in Corcoran. Yeah, he was a big black guy, and that uh, what staff used to do is when they wanted to punish someone is that they would take that person, they put him in the cell with Rudy the Brute, and he would sodomize them. And um, that's how they controlled the population, by using individuals like Rudy the Brute um, to sodomize individuals that they wanted to bring under control. And they did that um, quite frequently, unfortunately. There is nothing worse, in my opinion, than being on the tier and listening to a man being raped by another man brutally raped you know that would apply to a woman too of course um but you know my experience is 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 hearing that and so um yeah that was it, around the time they killed tate they shot that kid in the head mm -hmm. yeah that, what, that, what, what 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 this with this booty bandit guy what was the gang's response to that then because well, if this, so if this guy's a sex that, he's a sex offender then is he yeah you want to remember that uh this is a security housing unit, the entire facility. So everybody is on lockdown and they, they're let out to the yard together. But unless they orchestrate that, it's supposed to be segregated. You know, I was at Corcoran where I was let out on a tier and individuals were let out with me. You know, and Joey knows about that, you know, how yes, that sir. used to happen. Yes, and sir. so you, know, you go out there and you know, you're under the gun. You know, I've had situations where 
Um, they would open my cell door and orchestrate a fight in front of my cell door just so they could shoot into my cell uh, under the pretense that they were quelling the disturbance in front of my cell. I so, you know, the, the circumstances with Rudy the Brute is just one of many, you know, that existed at the time uh, in Corcoran. You know, that's why the Department of Justice investigated the brutality against prisoners at Corcoran. And you had some, by my estimation, extremely um, sick administrators, you know, who were eventually terminated from their employment. They were brought before the Senate Select Committee. Warden uh, Smith. That's right. That's right. They called him Mushroom George. Yep. yep. That's because they, they, they fed him shit and kept him in the dark. And... Um, so, but it was the other individuals that actually ran the joint, you know, that were facilitating all of this. That's where you had the green wall, you know, that was um, the guards that came together and, and they were a gang and, yep. uh, you know, and, they called them the sharks. And Tomei you know. put that on me every day for years. You remember that? Yeah. Yes, that boy, I that I, I was a boxer too. And there's a new sheriff in town. I was like, why are mm -hmm. you after me? Why mm -hmm. can't I use the phone? Why can't mm -hmm. I, why are you mm -hmm. hitting my house and handcuffing me to the mm -hmm. chair? Mm -hmm. Why are you doing this to me? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I still, I, I wish I could get that answered, but it was just, it was to, to have somebody that's a one officer that's working your cell block and you're the object of his desire. Mm -hmm. that, that was, uh, I, I had many sleepless nights knowing that he was coming to work and I didn't mm -hmm. know what was coming next. I think the lesson in that, because what you're really talking about, brother, is competition. You see, these were individuals that who couldn't compete with you otherwise. Now were in a position of authority, and they felt that they could compete with you and wanted to compete with you. You see, but what we're doing is we're using the experience of that now to solicit others to cooperate as opposed to compete. And it's a very, very difficult thing to do, particularly in a male prison, because the competition is off the hook. You know, and it, and it exists at a multitude of levels, you know, the administration, the guards, the, the inmates, you know, and in there, there are layers there are, and, and patterns associated with that. But it really is all about competition. And the key to my way of thinking is to facilitate cooperation. And in that cooperation, we, we evolve. And that's what I, we're I, after. I always say that for 40 years, I was in a living hell. Mm -hmm. Yes. Were, 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 were both of you guys forced to participate in these gladiator fights? No, I mean, other than being let out on the tier, yeah, I mean, there were setups, um, you know, where that occurred. Um, you know, like Joey mentioned, Preston Tate. And, you know, Preston Tate was shot in the head by an officer. It was a setup. And that was one of those where um, two hours before he was actually shot in the head, I was brought the central files of all three inmates that were going to be involved and was told to write the report on it. It hadn't even happened yet. You see? Yeah, so the, you, were the, you were the captain's clerk. I remember that's that. That's right. That's right. And I, I was, was and I was, yeah, and I was Rick's clerk. I took that's after right. over after, oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or they would say, um, for, do you remember they would tell us to say, use the canister and would type it and it wasn't a canister. Mm -hmm. We gave mm -hmm. a warning shot and they did it. Do you remember all the oh, yes. Ill illegal yes. reports we filed? Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. I that's, why I actually, that. that's why I actually took that report and I went to Lieutenant Rig with it. Now, I was the captain's clerk, but I respected Lieutenant Rigg because he Hell was of a, a former man. sheriff. He was. Hell of a and man. Hopefully, hopefully still he is alive. I don't know if he is or not. But a hell of a but man, though. He went through hell. But he judged a man by his character, whether you were right. in blue That's or right. green. That's right. See, so he was, he was rare in that. You know, I can remember being brought back from court. I was going out to court in Oregon, and I was brought back from court, and their fear was is that I was going to testify against the guards in that Preston Tate situation as it turned out the department of justice didn't use any inmates um but the fact is that that, that uh, the green wall the sharks thought that i was so when i was brought back to court one day they still had me in leg irons and, and waist chains and um they took axe handles to me i mean they were beating the tar out of me and lieutenant rig heard the commotion and actually came in and stopped them yes, um, yes. you know that was just one of many beatings that i endured as a result of the situation that we're talking about. Well, I was um, in three, I was in three, I was in building three left. 
Okay, I, that's B more on four yard or B or, or three on, yard. I was at I was in I was um when you come out of the office, the first building on the left. Okay. Yeah, that's just all the way, that's just directly across from the program office. Right, that's where I was. And mm -hmm. and I fought twice. I fought twice mm -hmm. uh, for I fought twice for extra lunches mm -hmm. because they knew I was the boxer and it was a, a officer Vasquez. Mm -hmm. And he was like, man, I'm going to make some money off of you. And mm -hmm. I fought twice. Yeah. And then that's when the Department of Correction put me in 4A, 4 right. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll never I'll never forget that. But, uh, you know, uh, Corcoran was um, a den of hell. I mean, yes. it, it, and it was amazing when I was – what unit was I in right across from the office? The first one that, on the left. Yeah, that, that way actually would have been um... – um, three left three no no that would have been four a um one four a and then the other was four b right i was in four a and i'll never forget sometimes when i hear the construction on the street and mm -hmm. i hear shh, 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 mm -hmm. it just makes me go back to knowing at night when they're sharpening knives mm -hmm. yeah that that's an eerie sound to hear when you're mm -hmm. trying to sleep at night, because you don't mm -hmm. know if it's coming for you. That's I mean, right. to to live your life, to hear that, mm -hmm. and not knowing if it's, man, what did I do? Is that me? Mm -hmm. That that's that's I, I, that's a uh, I still think about it. I, well, like I, appropriately so, it's a form of trauma and PTSD as it relates to where you're at now. You know, and it's one of the things that I I I want to address and I'm going to address in future episodes is the, is the post-traumatic stress disorder that lifers suffer as a result of the very thing that you're talking about right now. Well, I was blessed with it, Michael. Michael, I was blessed. Don't mean to interrupt, but I was blessed right. with it. I was blessed with it because when I got out in 2015, yeah. my counselor had put that exactly in my file. Mm -hmm. That's and great. I receive, I survive on $900 a month Mm -hmm. SSI for post-traumatic stress disorder based on mm -hmm. the 40 years I served. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, yeah. there are some people that, you know, you run into the very few counselors that go beyond mm -hmm. the call. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I really do. Oh, Michael, I can't even tell you, man, how you touched my soul, brother. I can't, <laughs> man. You know that? I love you too, bro. I do. We got we to yeah. make a difference, brother. W once you get off the chains that bind you, we got to go out and fight this, man. Well, you know, I don't think we need to go out anywhere. We can do that by virtue of the technology that we're using right now. You know, it's always better when we can do these things in person, you know, because we know the impact that it has when you're there in person, as opposed to just seeing somebody up on the screen, you know, to, to walk amongst the kids in particular. You know, I used to put 25 kids in front of me and uh, they'd bring them into the prison and I'd, I'd they had chairs set up and there'd be 25 youngsters sitting there from ages 11 to 16. And all the counselors and the teachers and the parents would be in the back. And, um, you know, back then people were into that scared straight thing. And I, I don't agree with it. No, I don't either. So, you know, they wanted me to scare them. But what I did was see, they, they were told that they were there because they did something wrong. And so I would go to the front and I'd say, you know, I want each and every one of you youngsters to understand that, you see all those people in the back? They tell me that you're here because each and every one of you has leadership potential. And immediately these kids would set up in their chair. What? Me? Leadership yeah, potential? Yes. I said, that's right. And that's why you're here today. You see, so that we can talk about how to best help you manifest that leadership potential. You see, and that's the difference in how we talk and why we talk. You know, that positive affirmation as opposed to beating them down. Because that's yes. what our youth, unfortunately, are used to. You see, if they get into a little bit of trouble, say they're disrespecting their parents or their teachers, which a lot of kids do. You see, then it's a matter of bringing them in and giving them something positive. That's to hold on to. You yes, bet. to hold on to. I always tell them the great As words. Opposed, of the, yeah. You, know, you don't always, beat them down. You don't yeah, beat them I, down. You don't. You don't. I, I, I had ran into that myself, Michael. I, I I spoke to a group of kids from Harlem. Um, mm -hmm. I, I spoke to uh, 40 kids from Harlem from 103rd and Lexington. And mm -hmm. I was like, wow, we, you know, but I'm from the hood. So I know they're going to relate to me. 
Right. And I told them what I tell everybody in the great words of my mentor, the great light heavyweight champion of the world, Archie Moore, who mm-hmm. had a program called ABC, Any Boy mm-hmm. Can. Mm-hmm. And he told me when I was 14, the difference between a champ and a chump is you. That's right. You're the difference. That's right. We have to give people the hope to make it. You can't hit them. Scared straight ain't going to scare nothing. They, no. they are not scared. But no. if you put them in your arms and you cradle them and you show mm-hmm. them the way and you show mm-hmm. them your wisdom and what you've seen, mm-hmm. my 40 years need to account for something. That's why I do what I do. And I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm so in awe that I never thought that I would see you ever again. And I always speak about you. Mm-hmm. My wife knows sure. you. My mm-hmm. wife knows of you. Mm-hmm. You know, she was in the visiting room all the time with us. And she's, mm-hmm. she's still, I said, do you remember Michael Todd, the Indian with the long, I told you he's the 40, the Rams and he was going to be a great athlete. And I always <laughs> tell you, I, oh, brother, am I right? Am I right or wrong? Yes, yes you're I, right. I, I always tell your story. And mm. I was very hurt. And maybe Sean could compound on this. Every time I spoke to Sean, I would say, you take it from here, Sean. Oh, how much he wanted to speak to you, yeah. Cause, and um, how hurt yeah. I was because what? Because because you hadn't heard back yet, but I think we've I'm, all. I think it's all was, been handled. It's all been handled. It doesn't. It doesn't matter if it's been handled. But my mm-hmm. heart was hurt for a week because every mm-hmm. day I was expecting Michael to call me. And, you see, I and, didn't know that. But see? I told Sean, gave him my phone number, well, brother. I'm sure. I, I'm sure. I'm sure Sean followed up. What you want to remember is that I don't have access to the internet. Oh, I didn't know that. So you didn't get, I didn't the, know you didn't that. get the you no. didn't get the email. You didn't get the I'm email. so but but it hurt me. That's I the point mm-hmm. I'm trying to make is mm-hmm. all that we've been through and knowing mm-hmm. that you were free, but mm-hmm. I didn't know the conditions you were under. That's why I'm right. saying uh, remember, I, remember Joey, I said this this is something to do with his restrictions. That's why he's yeah. not responded. Mm-hmm. But I yeah. just want to tell you, Michael, and I'll leave it at this for myself. You guys could we could continue talking. I am the founder of Bad Boxers Against Drugs. Mm-hmm. I'm no longer a boxer. I go by the name Joey. Yeah. And um, I love making a difference, bro. Maybe I'll send you a DVD or smoke signals. But when you see it, <laughs> you'll, see, you'll see those children. And those children now, this was done in 86. And those children now are married with children and drug free. Mm-hmm. And and I can't tell you, you know, that's why I say now when I'm sick, when I was diagnosed, I said to myself, what I want to leave is that when they have the celebration of my life, I want those kids there. Yeah. Because I don't want to be remembered by boxer from AT Street. Right. I want to be remembered for their kids and their kids' kids. So you're so, going to allow me to help you get through this, right? Brother, I, I don't want to compound on right. it right now i i know that i don't want to compound it maybe mm-hmm. you could send the information to sean but so we say this first... we say mataki e obani kataka li me li ke moon we and what that means is all that i do i do so that i can live with my relations and so that we can live as a people that's all we got the end of the day, that's all you got, brother. That's the end right. of the day, it, it's the love you give. I, mm-hmm. I tell people, you know, people are like, hey, I expected you to be this this bad. I go, brother, you only mm-hmm. could kill so many people. When people expect a fist from me now, I give them a hug. Mm-hmm. When I walk down the street in my neighborhood, and I love when people acknowledge me and say, good morning, OG. How you doing, OG? That means a lot to me. A lot to me means to speak to the kids to go to the schools. I just went to the one on Skid Row for the homeless children that are in the program because mm-hmm. their parents are living on the street. And I yeah. told them, I told them the same thing, the same thing that you told me, mm-hmm. believe in yourself. You told That's me right. one day, mm-hmm. I'll never forget it. It was the Oklahoma bombing. Why I'll never mm-hmm. forget that. Mm-hmm. It was the Oklahoma bombing. I just, yeah. mm-hmm. and, and you said, believe in you, Joey. You're not that guy. You told me mm-hmm. that, Michael. You said mm-hmm. you're not that guy. And I was mm-hmm. kind of offended because I, I thought I was a bad motherfucker. And you told me you're not that guy. You know who told me that too? It was Sirhan. Mm-hmm. He, was, he would say, man, you're not like these guys. You're intelligent, articulate, better yourself. Mm-hmm. And you took it and I ran with it. So I'll say it one more time. I'm in London and you got a big part to do with it. 
Mm. I'll give you that. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. I do. You know, it, it's, um, you know, you talk about Skid Row, you know, there's a, a guy named Phil that uh, has uh, Skid Row runners and they go all over the world now. And, uh, you know, they run, um, you know, there's a lot of people out there doing a lot of good work and that's the thing to remember. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm curious, Mike, um, uh, how, how long were you and Joey around each other in the system for, and what was it that separated you guys? Well, they, I think they moved Joey, um, um, out of state, as I recall, um, to Nevada. Uh, they may have moved him first to Soledad, but then they moved him out of state, and, and that was the issue. Um, you know, there was a lot of um, um, movement. You know, it, it was a very, very, um, only unit of its kind in the state of California. And so there weren't that many of us in there. And um, very high profile. And um, so in order to be moved out of there, it took a lot. You know, and in Joey's case, you know, he had intervened in the in an attack on a guard and um, actually saved that guard and um, at um, great expense to himself uh, physically and, and even emotionally. You know, one of the problems that we face as former lifers is that emotional um, arrestment. You know, see, a lot of what we might have experienced in growing up on the streets, uh, we didn't have in prison because we had to survive. And so what that does is it, it arrests your emotions. It's called arrested development. And, um, you know, I'm in the process right now of um, acquiring, really, emotional intelligence as it relates to those experiences that I didn't have. And, um, you know, it, it's really one of my passions. I deal with epigenetics, and that's the epigenetics is just simply the environment's impact upon, um, you know, cellular regeneration, what's going on with the body, so far as that fourfold uh, manifestation of, of biopsychosocial spiritual. I mean, there are a number of things, but these are my passions as it relates to what I do and why I do it. And that comes from understanding where Joey and I come from. You know, uh, living in the environment in which we lived, um, which, um, by any estimation, was horrendous. Um, you know, the violence, the bloodshed, um, the deprivation. Um, you know, a lot has changed in the state of California, but there remains a lot of change that needs to occur. Um, and that has to do with judicial reform. It's one of the reasons I'm back in, in court already is because there are th that those individuals, those organizations in the state of California that don't believe that individuals like Joey and myself should ever be released. And so they do everything they can to keep us in prison, to keep us incarcerated. It's more than just being a business. You see, it comes down to that competitive char characteristic. And so these are things in the future that I am going to address. And I'm going to address them with the idea of not challenge or taking an issue against them, but I'm standing for something else. And that's the evolution of our own humanity as human beings. And what it is and what it means when you take a human being and you put them in a cage, the impact that that has. It isn't to say that there isn't a need for crime and pun uh, punishment as it relates to the crime. There is. When we wake up in the morning, we get out of bed, and we start our day with Koro Snacks. Koro is a healthy snacks brand focusing on bringing additive-free natural ingredients to their customers with fair prices in bulk packaging. They have everything from nut butters to free from baking ingredients to cooking essentials and, of course, the snacks. And the energy balls are delicious. Oh, they're my favourite, the salted pistachio. Ooh. Um, wait to have this this morning. Let's see what this one tastes Cheers. like. Cheers. Mmm. <laughs> mmm. So what makes Coro special in comparison to others? Their bulk packaging allow them to offer their customers high quality products at a fair price. For a 5% discount on Coro's products, use the code TRUECRIME with no space in between true and crime. The link to Coro's online shop is in the description box on YouTube. Thanks for supporting our sponsor. You see, but when is enough? When is when is enough enough? Ah, you when, do you, 
when do you, when do you, when do you take a child? That's right. You know, when do you take a child and say, you're 17 years old, you're going to die mm-hmm. in here. Mm-hmm. That's right. You know, I, I always tell people that I always tell people I, I, I lived for 40 years in an environment as a child mm-hmm. where life and death were a breath apart mm-hmm. every right. day. People mm-hmm. don't understand that if they could grasp that for a moment mm-hmm. where life and death is a breath apart. Am That's I right. dying? Am I dying today? Right. Is, is Tookie's homies going to kill me? Is the, you know, is somebody going to mm-hmm. kill me just mm-hmm. because I got a visit and they don't, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, so I'm, I'm not as stable as you are right now. Um, I've, I've enjoyed these uh, six years to the fullest, traveling, mm-hmm. seeing the world, making mm-hmm. a difference, speaking with kids. But I'm haunted. Mm-hmm. I'm haunted mm-hmm. by the men that I hurt. I'm haunted mm-hmm. at the destruction I caused. And mm-hmm. at the end of the day, I am only trying to better myself. That's, that's mm-hmm. all I could do at the end of the day and give something mm-hmm. back. Let my story mm-hmm. be a story that someone could can grow from. I'm mm-hmm. not at your level, Michael. I've always respected you for your intelligence and your intellect. And you made mm-hmm. it able for Thank me to, to converse somewhat intelligently. Mm-hmm. But you did that. Mm-hmm. You did that. Mm-hmm. You gave me things to read. You, I mean, I, I, I look back and, and I think about it. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's where you've come from that makes you know where you're going. And mm-hmm. I truly I believe, I truly mm-hmm. believe that I, I, I use my past mm-hmm. to make me who I am today. And that's why mm-hmm. I, I tell you this. We got to give back. And if there's any way that I could, if, if anybody hears my words, if there's any way that if you have a child that needs something, if you want me to call them, I'll do it. If you want me to have lunch with them, I'll do it. I just want to make mm-hmm. a difference. If it's mm-hmm. one by one, it's one by one. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to do it. And uh, mm-hmm. if there's anything I could do to assist you with the fight that you're in, uh, mm-hmm. if there's anything, brother, I mean, anything, trust me when I tell you, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm right in the next city. And I know you can't meet with me. You can't see me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if there's any paperwork, if you need any letters of support, uh, mm-hmm. even from, you know, I could get, you know, whoever to get a letter for you to, 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 mm-hmm. to brother, you, you, you should be. All the shackles should be on, and you should mm. be on YouTube watching my video. God damn it! <laughs> <laughs> we'll we got a million. There. Yeah, we'll we got to do it. We'll get there. And it's this guy that's going to do it. Yeah, we're doing it. And I just want to tell the viewers as well that you know Joey's here, and we've been filming a series of podcasts with him. His life story. It's going to be four or five parts. That's great. It, it goes, you know, from the banana crime family enforcement action to the murder beef, the sentences of the five years, the, the resentencing to life, the conflicts in the prison with La M.A., 18th Street, all the gang stuff. Mm-hmm. He saves a female prison guard who's about to be raped and murdered, mm-hmm. which completely changes his entire life trajectory, gets moved over to the Nevada, uh, prison which is the podcast we filmed today and then tomorrow we're going to do about his his release before he goes back for his last stretch and then yeah, we'll last stretch and what happened after that but mm-hmm. I, I've, I've never it's it's so unique the way he sets up this charity with all these famous mm-hmm. sports players visiting him in prison mm-hmm. and just like you've experienced michael i imagine the viewers when they watch and hear his story a lot of them are going to be saying you know, this guy's making this stuff up, blah, blah, blah. Because you've got all these people out there that cannot comprehend what mm-hmm. you guys went through. Joey, what do you say to the guys online, these trolls that are saying Michael is making his story up? No, <laughs> I, I I can't, you know, I, I can only say I lived it with this man. I haven't spoke to this man since 95, but we know where the bodies are buried. Mm. Uh, I can't, I can't, I can't compound and, anymore if, if you know like i said if there's people that have that do have the youtube sorry michael i don't mean to sound facetious yeah, that's okay but you know ask your wife to go to the joey tory story mm-hmm. on youtube and you'll see emmett smith you'll see daryl strawberry at dodger stadium saying 
there's nothing I won't do for him. We love you, Joey. Get home soon. Or you see Edward James Olmos saying he's doing more in prison than some men are out here. Mm -hmm. That's my legacy. I don't care if there's haters. You're going to have haters everywhere. Yes. You know, but, but the best thing for haters is to set success. And my success yes. is I'm in London. I'm going to the south of motherfucking France. <laughs> I'm going to go to my villa in Catania, Sicily on okay. Saturday. And I'm going to spend till Christmas taking the sun and enjoying the grapes of freedom. Because mm. what I went through, no man should go through and no child should go through. And if you're going to hate, well, the haters hate, you know, mm -hmm. there's always, there's always haters. When I fought, when I was the champ, everybody hated me. They wanted to see me lose because I was so good. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm very abreast of haters. When I was in 18th street gang, when I founded the game in 1973 at the pinball arcade on Broadway and fifth, I had haters because I look white and they're saying, wait, wait a minute. How is this white boy, the president of 18th street? And as I tell those Mexican gangbangers from the M. How was Joe Morgan a Croatian <laughs> from Croatia? I think in the UK they don't know who Joe Morgan is. Joe, if uh, you want Google, to... they got the Google. <laughs> let let me, you know you know you know what I'm talking about. Didn't he die right yeah. next to us in the unit there? In this the, is the, this yeah, is the found, yeah. a founder of the M. A. The Mexican. Well, he's, Mexican, one of, Mexican um, he's he's one of the original members of the M. A. And he eventually dominated the enemy by way of leadership he died of uh, liver cancer at corcoran another cirrhosis where we, where we were at brother i think um, it's in the water michael how come everybody we know died of cirrhosis brother tell me uh, it, it's got to be uncommon i never did drugs but mm -hmm. tell me how come everyone we speak of rick stevens uh shitty smitty every i could go down the line of w maybe 80 out of 100 and yeah. all of all of them have died of cirrhosis. It usually begins with hepatitis. I had Hep C. And, yeah, I know, and it's that's where it begins. Now, now that's curable now, you know, you know. But uh, back in their day, it wasn't, and yeah. so it, it went through a process. And but like I said, it started with Hep C, and then evolved. And it has a lot to do with lifestyle. Uh, it has a lot to do with stress. You know, and the stressors that uh, individuals encounter behind the iron gates. But that's you know, why I was just, telling, I, I was telling Sean though, mm -hmm. you know, we're talking about the haters, Michael. And I'm saying, how could an organization, a Mexican organization run well, by a, run by a well, Croatian? I know, <laughs> you know, and Joe was a very good friend of mine and we did a lot of business together. But the thing is, is that, you know, like when I tell people that I was raised native, you know, I run into the same thing. They say, oh, that white boy, he's not native. He's not an Indian. You know, I've never been interested in being Indian, but anybody that knows me knows that I was raised native and I am native. Brother, you've been native as long as I remember. <laughs> yeah, well, see, that, that's that's what I'm talking about. Um, sorry about that. Let me turn this. But haters are going to hate. Haters are going to hate you, Sean, because you're, you know, you're who you are and you're doing what you do. I mm -hmm. just say the hell with haters. All you got to do is just understand one thing. I did 40 years. You didn't. If you don't like that, fuck you. I'm trying to help. I don't care. I don't care about you. I'm trying yeah. to help your kid or your kid's kid because yeah. that's what matters to me. You don't matter to me. You hating me has no bearing on me. I'm going to be prosperous. Right. This money in my pocket is the money I earn. This trip right. I'm doing is a trip I did. Mm -hmm. And if you can't do it, then you hate. But mm -hmm. my goal is to just turn lives around. If I could just mm -hmm. turn one life around a week, I'd be a king. So that's that's where m my story is. I think yeah. a beautiful thing about what you've said today, Joey, is it, it affirms Michael's philosophy of helping people. I mean, basically, you validated that his philosophy of helping people goes back decades. Mm -hmm. And you, you've credited him with being here to this day. And you're a release because he took time out to help to you. teach me to teach me how to be a man. Michael told me how to be a man. Michael no, said, don't you, do man. that. Do this. And you know it, brother. You know it. You used to school thank me you. like a little child and I would get upset. <laughs> but, but then I'd go to my cell and I'd, I'd huff and puff and I'd say, you know what, man, Michael was right. I'm better than this. You know, and it's hard to break the cycle. I think the key to people changing their life and their lifestyle is breaking that cycle. Mm -hmm. not everybody is a tough guy yes That's, you know not everybody not everybody's a tough guy you know I, i'll tell you michael i'll tell you mm -hmm. sean 
when I first got out, I was driving on the 710 freeway to go to Long Beach. I was going to do something I've never done in my life, and that was fishing. Mm. So I bought mm. a fishing rod, and I said, I'm going to go fishing. And I was driving, and a guy cut me off, and he flipped me off. So I flipped him off, and I hit the brakes in the middle of traffic and got out the car and went at him. And when I looked back, I saw all these cars honking, and I felt so ashamed and so mm. embarrassed. Mm -hmm. And what I learned from that, is now when they flip me off, I wave at them. I wave at them and I tell them I'm sorry. And I wave at them <laughs> because I'm thinking in my head, and you don't even know who the fuck I am. Mm. You don't even know. You don't even know what you're getting yourself into. But I wave at them and I, I apologize. When somebody bumps into me, I go, oh, excuse me. And when somebody bumps into me, I, I don't turn around and I react. I, I go, oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me, ma'am. Or when somebody sees me all tattooed back and they, they, I see the look. Another time I'm in Vegas. I'm, at, I'm going to the fight and I'm in the elevator and I see these three women in the elevator talking. And when I get in the elevator, all three of them grab their purse and clutched it to their chest. <laughs> and I said, good morning, ladies. And you could see them go, ah. Mm. That's the two examples I could give you what I've experienced as being free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where my heart's at. Mm. Fuck a hater. You don't like me, kick rocks. Yeah. I don't care anymore. As long as you spell my name right, I'm happy. <laughs> I know? get it. I do. Yeah. Do you I, feel I, me, I, don't, I do. Look, I don't give them any credence. There's no, no value in it. They just want to compete or they have an agenda. They want to pull people to their site. I mean, I get it. it. It's oftentimes it just has an economic base. They think that by creating contention that they generate subscribers. And that's really what it's all about. So yeah. I get it. Others have ulterior motives. I get it. You know, they're the front man. They're still in the mix. You know, they want to put down this idea that you know, this person has credibility. Um, look, there are a number of reasons, but they're really not worth even the time that we're giving to them today. No, worth no, no, no. But, but, but brother, I just want to say, we know, yeah. you know, and I know, yeah. and the records will reflect where we were mm -hmm. and who we are. Well, see, at the end, of, say. At the the end facts, of the day, yeah. yeah. The facts speak, speak for themselves. Everything that I or you have ever done is documented. Thank you. You see, and all they have to do is I tell them, do your homework. It's that simple. Yeah, but they don't want to do that. They don't want to do that. So just let it go. And we'll move on. We'll do what we're doing for the reasons that we're doing it. We stand they should jump. Something. They should jump on board, bro. They should jump on board. Well, if if they were intelligent, they jump they on might. board. Yeah. Yes, it's it's the supporters who deserve our attention, Michael. Right. And I'm I'm just That's curious because right. you've been so viewed recently on YouTube. I'm just wondering what kind of positive feedback you've had from people from these videos. Well, I don't get to view too much of it, again, because of that uh, restriction, you know, but I do have individuals who call me and tell me what other people are saying. And uh, I'm grateful. You know, Sean, I wake up every morning grateful. Yes. You know, that That's the thing that, you know, I, I swing out of bed and I put my feet on the floor and I take a deep breath and I am grateful. You see, I say my prayers, you see. And yeah. it, 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 it's really what it comes down to. So, you know, the feedback has been enormous by way of support. Um, not just support, but people who want to understand, people who want to learn, um, people that are looking for um, different avenues, different modalities uh, that, that might assist them, that might help them, uh, that uh, are encouraged by... Uh, as a result, rather, of uh, the conversations that we're having. And that's really what it's about. Um, you know, I understand that a lot of people get caught up in the sensationalism and everything else, and that has value. I'm not trying to diminish it, you see, but it's only a part of our life. You know, that's I, sensationalism. I gave, I gave up on it, Michael, when I yeah. read an article in the LA Times that said, we sent a reporter to interview him. Mm -hmm. But we had to hire an interpreter because he didn't speak English. Hmm. <laughs> then another article said we interviewed his mother and father. Mm -hmm. And they said that he was a killer. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, in fact, I called the reporter. Michael, you remember when I went to bury my parents? Mm 
Mm-hmm. You were there I when do, do. Gomez yep. sent the car on the yard because the warden let, yep. wouldn't let me go. Remember that? That's right. Yes, I do. So I called the warden, uh, the reporter, and I said, yes, I'd like to know, have you spoke to Mr. and Mrs. Torres? He goes, yes. I go, could you let me know where they are? Because I buried them 30 years ago. Mm. Click. So that's what, that's mm-hmm. when you're trying to do something positive as we are, mm-hmm. you're going to mm-hmm. run into that. But at right. this time, at this time, brother, I am so free in my God. My, I'm so free in my soul. I can't mm-hmm. even tell you how beautiful it is to travel the world, brother. Mm-hmm. To have the money, the funds to travel the world. Mm-hmm. To be able to do these things that I'm doing today, to talk to you, to mm-hmm. meet Sean. Mm-hmm. And it all started because I wanted Sean to tell Michael to call me. I love mm-hmm. him. That's mm-hmm. how I met Sean. Not to say tell my story. This is the first time that mm-hmm. my story's ever been told. Mm-hmm. And that's great, you see, because you have an excellent medium for that. You see, it's well-balanced and um, is going to afford you the opportunity to do just that. But the thing to remember in that is that you and I don't stand against anyone or anything. We stand for something very, very important. And that's the evolution of our own humanity as human beings and assisting to the extent that we can those who are seeking assistance, they come of their own volition, you know, in that capacity. And uh, you have a great story. It's going to help people. It's going to inspire people. It's going to encourage people. And I'm, I'm delighted that you're telling it. I, I, brother, you too. I, I've, I've missed you. Brother, you don't know how many times that I've spoke about you. And, you know, mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll keep doing it, brother, because Thank you. I always say when good people get together, good things happen. Your past mm-hmm. doesn't make you who you are. It's no. just, you know, you always have to remember where you came from. That's right. I, I'm always going to be who I was. And I, nobody could ever take mm-hmm. the fact from me or that mm-hmm. can't say I won that championship. I was the Walter mm-hmm. Wade champion of the world. That's right. Nobody could take that from me. I don't care who mm-hmm. wants to even try to say it. Yeah. You know, nobody could take those fights from me. Mm-hmm. Just like nobody could take your education. I was respect. I, I respect you better because of how I saw you educate yourself and better yourself mm-hmm. in the depths of hell. Mm-hmm. Mother. Hey, I, I don't mean, listen, I just got to put it where it is. Motherfucker. We were in the depths of hell. Can't mm-hmm. nobody, t- can't nobody even begin to comprehend the mm-hmm. depths of hell that we were in when mm-hmm. life and death was surrounding us mm-hmm. and we were fighting the cops at the same time. Mm-hmm. But we were litigating. We were mm-hmm. beating them at their own tool. That's right. So that's why I tell you, get mm-hmm. take care of what you have to take care of. You have mm-hmm. a place to come visit me at wherever I'm at in the world. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, and, and as soon as it gets done, we have to sit back by the fireplace and just look at each other and mm. reminisce because uh, like we, made, we, we made it, brother. We made yeah. it. Just keep, keep fighting. Don't let them get you down. Oh, um, no. I got, hey, how do you think I felt after I left you? And they gave me life again. I was like, yeah. what the hell? <laughs> but but I, I used a lot of that patience because you remember I, I was I was a quick draw mm-hmm. and I was a hot one. And uh, yeah, you, you were definitely a gunslinger. <laughs> and and you you put in that, Matt, hey, slow down, slow down. Mm-hmm. You're going to crash, Joey. And I, I took that. And um, mm-hmm. I'm so happy to see you. And it's just by fate. I mean, what are the chances? Mm-hmm. I don't go on you. I don't go on YouTube. I don't even. I've never been on a computer to this day. This is the first time mm-hmm. I'm in front of a, one of these things. I don't text anybody to mm-hmm. this day. If you want to talk to me, you call me. I have mm-hmm. no time in my life. I've been gone for 40 years, and this takes a lot of time. <laughs> Why are you going to do this to say how you doing? Just pick up the freaking phone and say how you doing. Yeah. But. Um, Oh, brother, it's been a pleasure, man. Now, you know what? Now my circle is complete. Mm. I hear you. I do. Again, I'll tell you, I love you. It's a joy to see you. And we are going to stay in touch. Yes, we have to. All right. Do you think, Mike, if your restrictions get lifted, you could come out to London? Yes. Oh, that'd be fantastic. I plan plan on it, actually. You know, I... um, I like London. I like England. Um, I like the people. Um, you know, it. Uh, so I'm actually looking forward to that. I'm going to make a trip over to Ireland and Scotland. And um, then uh, at some point, uh, I'm going to take my wife uh, to her homeland, uh, Japan, and, um, and then over to the islands, um, Hawaii. And um, 
I'm working with um, a good friend right now, Kevin Gutfield. In uh, he's in um, Saint John Island, um, and um, which I is that the American or is that a British colony? I, I don't remember. Um, at any rate, he's there, so we're doing uh, some work. Uh, he's 30 years um, as a um, um, therapist. And uh, I met him when this last time they incarcerated me, uh, we met. And then when I was released, we, um, we hooked up and uh, we've been talking and uh, we're going to be doing some good work. Hey, brother, since I've been out, Michael, I bought a van because I like that van life living. Yeah. And I drove from Los Angeles to Miami. Ah. I left it and I went on a two week cruise to the Bahamas. Oh, yeah. Got the car, went to see my daughter in North Carolina, yeah. drove, drove all the way to Grand Canyon. I went to Cuba. I went to the Dominican. I went uh, two years ago to Kenya, Africa on a safari. Yeah. That's and now wonderful. and now I'm in London with yeah. uh, Sean and bro, I'm so proud I'm not, of us. Well, I'm not allowed to leave the state of California. I can't go outside a 50 mile radius without I'm on house arrest. Um, and, uh, so I have to do a schedule, weekly schedule of where I'm going to be beforehand. And, um, it, um, a lot of restrictions, but the fact of the matter is, is free. That, uh, that's right. I'm not sitting in a cage. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm yeah. here for you, brother. I'm here for you. I, I have, you know, anything that I could do for you or the kids, you contact me and I'll drop oh, everything. I'll, I'll drop everything I'm doing because at this point, like I said, with my, with not, knowing what the future holds health wise, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about, um, I'm just thinking about the legacy I want to leave. I don't want to mm -hmm. leave the legacy of being a boxer from 18th street. Mm -hmm. I don't want to leave the legacy of being a killer. I want to leave a legacy of, Hey, that's the guy that made a difference. And if, well, if see, I could you, do, if I could do that, mm -hmm. life is good. So you've manifested that already just by virtue of what we're doing this morning. And, um, that's, that's the beauty. That's the blessing. And um, so we both need to be grateful to Sean for yes. facilitating this. Very so. And, yeah. And um, we'll continue doing what we're doing. So, you know, as I bring my podcast up, which I'm doing, and I'm finishing up a book right now, um, I'm going to have you on my podcast. And uh, so that you can talk to the kids. Whenever you meet me, I'm at your beck and call. Thank you, bro. I appreciate it. I do. So, Sean, have you asked uh, all the questions that you would like to ask in there? Yeah, I mean, it, it's just been fantastic to see you guys have your first conversation in 27 mm. years. Yeah. I mean, listening to Joey tell me his story in the last couple of days, he, you know, he touched on it, the magnitude of the intensity mm. and the life and death. But I've heard in detail these stories in the last couple of days, so I'm getting a, a greater insight of what mm -hmm. both you guys went through. And mm -hmm. now I know I know how bonded you must be to have to have gone through that. And both you guys mm -hmm. are the only ones who really understand the right. full extent of it. And then mm -hmm. to speak after 27 years like this, mm -hmm. I'm just so honored to you know to see the emotion pouring out of Jory, Joey. And mm -hmm. yeah, I think he needed to release that man. Mm -hmm. I think I, I, I think I, I think I this did. is this is this is really helping him. Mm. And and that and that's what it's about helping people. Yes, I want. I just right. want. I just want to thank both of you guys for being so generous with your time. I think this is the fourth uh, podcast we've done, Michael, and we, we've got four mm -hmm. or five coming out with Joey. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't. I can't wait to give you a big hug. Like I gave Joey a big hug at the airport. Oh, I can't, that was I can't beautiful. wait to give you a big hug, Mike. Looking forward London. to it. I am. Yeah. And, I'll be uh, there. Yeah. I'll be there, brother. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll be there, brother. <laughs> so, well, you know, Sean, I just want to just tell you. What people need to understand is when you're in prison and you're a lifer, when you're a lifer, it, it, think of that, a lifer, and you have family that just visits you maybe once a month or on a visit for two, three hours. Mm -hmm. But I'm with Michael 24 hours a day, every day, eating dinner, working out. When you spend time with a man that's a lifer, mm -hmm. a lifer, think of that word lifer for the rest of their life. I became closer with some men than I did with my own family because you spend right. your whole life with that person. Right. And that's why there's that bond that I have with Michael. Not because, mm -hmm. not because I was a killer, 
not because mm. I was a gang leader, but because mm. I was a man, a man mm. who had feelings, a man mm. who took another man's advice. Hey, you're mm. not a fuck up. Come on, mm. Joey, you're not stupid. I'll never forget those times, Michael. Mm. So I thank you well. Um, I have a I have a dinner date. Um, and uh, I, I just want to tell you, you know how to get a hold of me. Anything I could do for you and your family, I'm here for you, my brother. And I hope Thanks, you George. I hope to see you very soon. Thank you, Joy. I love you. You take care of yourself. Sean, I have one last thing I'd like to say, uh, and that's to your viewers. Um, if they have any questions, please ask. Um, if there's anything that they think we can illuminate by way of the discussions that we've already had, um, please um, specify what that is, and we'll do our best uh, to address it at some point in time in the future. But more importantly, um, thank you for watching. You see, that's that's the real issue here. Thank you for giving us your time to view our conversation and to gain and garner some insight into us as human beings. Yes. Yeah, much, much love and respect, guys. And to the viewers again, I'll, I'll just repeat what you said there. Just thank you for all the love and support that just comes in all day long for all of our guests and how you've seen today how that is part of the life journey and it's transformational for mm. them to have that positive love and reinforcement so mm -hmm. thanks for keeping that coming in if you do want to reach out to mike i'll put the link down for his website and i will also try and sort something out for joey if people want to reach out to joey and then look out for the series of podcasts 40 years in prison that are going to be coming out about joey soon so again much love and respect guys it, 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 you know it's been great uh, to see the chemistry and, and the love between you's and um, yep, take care. Can't wait to speak again. Cheers. Right. Well, here we are with podcast three with Joey. If you've not seen the others in the series, 40 years in California prison, he spent time with Michael Thompson, started out founding 18th Street Gang out of California. This is massive worldwide. Now anyone can go on Google and read the wiki page on it. Then enforcement for the mafia, including the Bonanno crime family, murder of his manager in the boxing, and he got sentenced to five years, but he was resentenced to 25 to life. But we're at the part of the story now where the judgment of conviction is hereby vacated, as is petitioner's guilty plea. Petitioner is remanded to custody without bond and shall appear on December 27th, 2001. So he's managed to find a writ after doing 30 years, beating up dozens of sex offenders, getting going through all the ups and downs you've heard in the previous of the series, he's getting out after 30 something years. How did that feel, Joey? That was um, the tears still flow. It was just the greatest. It was the greatest, you know, to, to, but it was have, having to come up with the money to appeal the bond. That was the main thing, because a lot of people aren't able to be released. You know, you have to, they make you post a bond, even though your sentence is vacated and you're innocent. But just in case, give us $100,000. But your bond was a million, right? A mil. And the great Paul Molitor, the Hall of Fame baseball player, who we had been working with children and working with bad, and um, the YouTube, the Joey Torrey story, he was a main focus of that. He was on there right after the winning the world championship world series of baseball he flew into albuquerque new mexico spent the day with me and we've been uh, he he said i need you i got you and he posted on his credit card and that night i was released from the county jail that was just insane so let's talk about your release date what did you come out to well the first thing was i was amazed how when I sat down to eat, the knife and the fork were so heavy. You know, I had never, I had been eating food with plastic for 40 years. So here I was eating with a, a, a real spoon and a real knife. And it was just different. It was a different era. Well, you have to understand, gas was 50 cents, now it was $6. But it was just to be free, to smell freedom. Freedom smells different than prison smells. But yes, it was, it was, it still is to this day. Do you remember driving up Highway 101? Oh, that was, that's, that's my thing. That was my best. 
And you were living in hotels. I, w I was living, I, the first hotel was beautiful. It was the Holiday Inn on, in, in Beverly Hills. And then I hit the, I was a hotel. I mean, I was just living, I was enjoying just this beautiful thing called freedom. So you spent the next night at your sister's in Santa Clarita. Yes. Chris Morales paid for your hotel for a couple of weeks and informed you that the DA was appealing your release. Yes. They How had did that just, feel? Well, they had just, if you recall at that time, they, they had just arrested Phil Spector. Oh. So the same DA that I had, Phil Spector had. And they, she made it a point to come after me. And uh, she, they came after me to the point where I was in San Jose, Costa Rica, and she went crazy with the judge, saying, he's in San Jose, Costa Rica, and he said he's in San Jose, California. So when did you find out the information that she was after you? Um, right when the stay of execution. What happens, what happens ma'am, is that when you're given a vacate of a sentence, it's like having an appeal bond. Oh, we're vacating your sentence, but the district attorney has that day, they have 72 hours to appeal it. So the district attorney's office said, okay, you want to release him, your honor? We're going to appeal it. So they came after me in full force. And they came after me, not because of that, they came after me because I beat them at their same game. Here was a guy in prison that found an obscure writ from 1943 and applied it. And that just didn't sit well with them. And they came after me. They tried to put restrictions on my, my travel, and the judge said no, his sentence is vacated. They gave me a passport. I traveled the world while I was waiting for them to appeal it. And then two years later, the United States Supreme Court, unfortunately, said that I could not get two bites of the apple. That was the decision. And they remanded me back to prison for another 25 years to life. How did it feel to see Carlos Palomino working with the kids at the gym? Oh, that's it's just, you know, that was, we had spoke about that for 20 years, 20 years. And then you moved to Vegas? I moved to Las Vegas um, to for my comeback. I moved to Las Vegas for my comeback. I was offered a, a great package to step back in the ring. I was told, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry about training, all your fights will be fixed. <laughs> so, uh, what, were you offered a large sum of money to do this? I, I received a quarter of a million dollars for five fights. And who was your first opponent? Um, uh, uh, Mr. Perry. We stood in the hotel for the whole night uh, choreographing how he would go down. <laughs> <laughs> and how was that? <laughs> well, you know, it, was, it, it wasn't just that. You know, we have to go back. We have to go back to being released. You know, here I am out. I'm free. Um, Mr. The great Paul Molitor, um, he's just, he was just such a great man. I, he, he said, go pick a car that you want. I'll buy it. Here's twenty thousand dollars. Go get yourself set up. That's a friend. But it was staying at the Catamaran Hotel in San Diego, where he put me up at, and I decided to go swim. I hadn't swam in forty years. You have to understand this. I hadn't seen a pool. I mean, forget about it. Um, and I was sitting by the pool, and I I, I saw these two gentlemen and. I knew immediately that Hawaiian shirt, trunks, but black dress shoes and socks. And they sat down in the recliners and I swam, came back, and they go, hey, you're Boxer Joe. And I was like, they don't know who the hell I am. That's bullshit. They go, hey, we know who you are. We know you signed a deal with top rank boxing. And we know that you're out on appeal and that the DA wants to send you back to prison. So we have a deal for you. Senator McCain, Senator John McCain, is doing a boxing bill. The boxing bill is currently, it's still pending. And we want you to work, if you work with us and you've proved that fights are fixed, we'll make your appeal go away. 
And I said, no, you know, I don't. Then you go back to jail. I go, well, what do you want? They go, we'll give you $10,000 a month, unlimited, whatever you desire, but we don't know what you're talking about. I, I said, you have to elaborate on that. Well, you'll be working with someone. I said, well, give me your card. I'll get back to you. And that's when I went to Vegas, met with Big Frankie. Explain a bit about Big Frankie, his history. Uh, Frankie Manzioni is um, his claim to fame is he's one of the biggest undercover agents that the FBI ever had. He brought down the Gambino crime family about a year earlier where they brought in over 30, 40 members handcuffed. They even brought in the, the guy with the, the robe. The chin. The chin. And Frankie was a part of that. And I met him at the Suncoast Hotel. And he fit the bill. And he was a goomba. And uh, we ended up for the next two years tearing up Vegas. And he became the number 20-something influential person in Las Vegas boxing. Because you said you were getting paid 10, uh, 10 week or grand, but dollars a month. 10,000, sorry, I'm going to have to cut that. 10,000 pounds. $10,000 a month. A month. What were you spending it on? Um, hookers, cocaine, and uh, rent cars. Yes. I mean, you know, I just did 30 years in prison. You have to understand. And a lot of inmates come out of prison, and they have to depend on their family. My fa I have no family. I had no mother, no father, no, no, I was, everybody passed away. And I was fighting the system because here I fought to get out of prison. And now I was sitting in a position where if I help them show that the fights are fixed, my fight's fixed, they'll make my appeal go away, which means I will not have to go back and serve as life sentence. And you know, some people could sit there and speculate, well, I would never do that. Well, let me tell you, if you had just sat in your bathroom for 30 years and some guy with a Hawaiian trunk said, show us fights are fixed and you won't go back, but if you don't, you're gonna go back and do life, don't sit there and judge me. So were you teasing the FBI, like leaving little breadcrumbs? I never told on anyone. Let me reiterate that. To this day as I sit here, no one has ever been arrested or charged with anything. I played the FBI like a violin. What was Operation Matchbook? That was orchestrated by Senator John McCain and the FBI. And it was federally funded by the director of the FBI with Senator McCain and Senator Reed's blessing. And they were looking to implicate De La Hoya and Foreman. For fixed fights, yes sir. And Top Rank, explain about Top Rank. Top Rank is a major boxing out of Las Vegas. They are the, the biggest there is. And they took me in. Uh, they, were, they were very well to me. And, but I saw what they were doing. Kids were dying in the ring. I mean, you know, let, let's stop and think. I mean, we could go to Jim Ro or to the kid Rome, uh, a, a great fighter, a, a journeyman. They knew he shouldn't have been in the ring. They asked me to take the fight. I didn't take the fight, and the kid died in the ring. It's documented. What they do is this. Uh, you know, the world needs to know this, and I think a lot of fighters won't tell it because they're getting paid. This is what boxing top rank does. They will take the kids from Mexico. 90% of their fighters are from Mexico. They'll take a kid that has a record of two fights and 24 losses. But when he comes to the States to fight, now all of a sudden he's 24 wins and two losses. But he, we know he's not that. So what you do is, Sean, if I'm a promoter and you're my fighter, and I'm paying your rent, and I'm, you're driving a car that Top Rank's paying for, now I promote a fight. You can't lose because I'm invested in you. So I'm gonna have you fight Jen. We know you're gonna kick her ass, <laughs> but that's, it's maybe. Sometimes it's a fixed fight, not by the record, but it's a fixed fight. I, 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 can you understand that? Yeah, yeah. So what I would do, and I used to do this when I went on the road with Top Rank. I went and promoted their fights. I was in Austin, Texas for a fight. And 
they would, I was the opponent guy. I would bring the opponents to the corner. ESPN would have their cameras on who they wanted to win in this corner. And I would bring the opponents, some poor kid that had duct tape on his trunks and somebody else's name on his trunks, taxi drivers. They're in there for $500. And after a while, it got to the point where I would tell the people in the audience, what round do you want them to go down in? <laughs> what? What round? Two. You buy me a beer? Okay. Hey, paisa, dos. <laughs> Just find a nice place to lay down. Now the top ranks fighter now is 1-0. So if you do that at enough venues, you get a kid to be 20-0. That guy can't spell boxing, but he's 20-0. But now you sell him as a marketable item. And he goes out to the slaughter and loses for a title shot, but he made his money. Does that ex does yes. Do you think it's still like that all over the world today? Of course. Oh, you have Eddie Hearn here from Dazen, right here in, in your city. He's from here. Eddie, da he, Eddie Hearn. He's the only one. Trust me when I tell you this. Eddie Hearn. Do you know who Eddie Hearn is? I have no idea. Who does he manage? Joshua. Oh, was he, was he giving the, the PR thing with Joshua on the desk? Yeah, Eddie yeah, Hearn. Yeah, yeah. Salt of the earth. United States hates him because he's the only one that's real. Oh. He won't do that. His fighters fight. Whether you're good or bad, he'll put in his best fighter against some bum. And if his bum loses, his fighter loses, he don't care because he's legit. Where your Don Kings, your Bob Arams, it's, 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 it's a farce. Showtime. Showtime, yeah. That's what it is because you have to understand it's money. It's pay-per-view. It's money. Big money. You know, my fight. I'm in a hotel room with my with the, my opponent, with the FBI agent, Frankie, and Sean Gibbons from Top Rank Boxing. We're moving the furniture, and Joey, you throw a white, he'll throw a left, you bob underneath, and then he'll go down. The FBI has this on tape. Sure enough, that night happens, it happens. That's what boxing is, because see, what people need to understand is when you have a fighter and you're in financially invested in that fighter, you're paying his kids to go to school, you're paying his car, his rent, you want him to win because you want that title shot. So when you ask me if it still is, I would say boxing is 40% because you're trying to get to the, the promised land, that pay-per-view $20 million fight. So you fix all those fights to get there so the record has no blemishes. Do you, do you understand that? Totally. 100%. So because you were so out of control, they brought in Har partner. Harry Schlumpf. How did you introduce him to top rank? What was his cover story? He was my cousin. He was my cousin. And they ate it up. And how credible was that? Well, you know, the, the record reflects. <laughs> <laughs> Very... <laughs> So things were going smoothly in the beginning, were they, with this operation? It, it was, you know, like I said, it, it went on for two years. We ran Vegas. There wasn't a casino we couldn't go in. There wasn't a, a club we couldn't get in. Frankie was, you know, it was, we, he, he, they, the FBI had set up a company called YGG, you're going to jail. And every, did, nobody knew what it stood for. But me and Frankie knew what it meant. And... Um, it was, we did fights, that, that, that's what we did. That's what we did. Who was Eric Butterbean Ash? Oh, he's, an, he's, he's a perfect example of, of what fixed fights are. The king of the six rounders, yeah. <laughs> so you're giving ringside tickets for fights at the MGM? Yeah, that was, that was the thing. What happened there? No, it's just every fight, every fight you have tickets allotted to you. And I would go give them to the homeless people just to laugh and watch homeless people go into the fight and sit on the front row. And you were sat next to Morgan Freeman, Mario Lopez, Mike Tyson come and said hello to you. No, I've known Mike since um, the, the magic show in Vegas. Mario Lopez, I don't, I, I, I don't, we, you know, I just don't, uh, we had some words. I was talking to Oscar and he just came into the conversation and I was I'm like, dude, you don't know how to say excuse me? And he's like, you know who I am? I go, I don't give a fuck who you are. I'm talking to the Oscar and you just want to bulge. And I, I come from a place where you say, excuse me, pardon me. 
He goes, well, hey, I go, man, but that was my, so we don't, you know. Because during this time, it sounds pretty exciting. What would you say was the highlight of it? Costa Rica, traveling the world. You know, that, that was it. I would, I would be in Costa Rica and the FBI would contact me about a fixed fight. And I'd fly back to Vegas and I'd go up to Oscar's training camp and I'd say, Oscar, um, you're fighting Yori Boy Campos. What do you think? He goes, you know, I'm going to take him the distance. So I'd go to Vegas and bet. And then I had uh, um, a good friend named Dino Da Vinci uh, from the Gambino crime family. And Dino ran the big operation in Costa Rica, 2bet.net, all the offshore gambling casinos. And what I would do is I would take the fixed fights from top rank and run it to Costa Rica so Mr. Da Vinci could put it up worldwide on his betting. And we would hope that the odds would go the way we were because we knew the fight was fixed. So I would fly back and forth from Vegas to Costa Rica. And the FBI would tell me to stay away. We'll call you when you need you. Here's your 10,000. You know, and it, that went on for two years. But you had a court appearance coming up, didn't you, towards the end of that? Yes, I, I, I went to, I thought that the FBI had me covered and everything would be all right. They keep their word. And when I went to the courtroom, and I was amazed to say that there was nobody there, and unfortunately, they withdrew my plea and resentenced me to 25 years to life, but again, but again. What was going through your mind when they yeah. did that? A mass murder. You know, I wanted to kill Frankie and Trump, and, you know, and, and what was bizarre was when they, it, it, see, but you have to go back on this for a moment, because I was out on bail. And I returned for the Oscar De La Hoya fight at the MGM. And while I was in my hotel room, the phone rang. And I was like, nobody knows I'm here except Sean Gibbons. And when I picked up the phone, they kicked in the door. And it was the FBI, the DEA, and the sheriffs. And they said, your bail has been revoked and the only person that knew that I was in that hotel room was Sean Gibbons, the promoter for Top Rank, who I see to this day. I just saw him on the phone right now. He's promoting this kid to fight. I see him all the time on TV. And I'm like, wow, thank God I'm retired. Because, yeah, but uh, it was something to go back. It was something to hear that. And I was like, where's the FBI? And Big Frankie told me, man, they're taking me to the airport. They gave up on this. And that was that. Before we go into the prison stuff, then, do you want to just take us through the, the comeback fight? I'll, I'll say what the announcement was. After 22 years in prison, Joey Torres refused to accept his judicial fate, studied law, found a way out, always thinking of that one fight he always wanted. And tonight is the night! <laughs> it was called The Unfinished Business. They promoted it, radio shows, Universal, Disneyland. I went on tour with it and uh it was it was it is what it was you know it was a guy that did all these years never had a pro career was an amateur world champion and it was phenomenal but what kind, well, how big yeah. was the audience what kind oh, of famous people were there it, it sold out well i had my corner was daryl strawberry my corner man was paul molitor celebrities everybody was there the lynch mob dies trey all the fellas came to see it and, um, but I was, I was high, I was drunk, and I didn't give a fuck. Going into the fight, you was high and drunk. Oh, I was high, drunk, and fucked up. And he clocked you, didn't he, right away? The, the... Dropped me with one punch. So, are you thinking this isn't going according to the script at that point? I got up and whooped his ass. Okay. Got up and whooped his ass. How many rounds? Uh, it went one. Just, just one round? One round. <laughs> one round. <laughs> and what was the reaction of the audience? They all said it was bullshit. It was fixed. <laughs> yelling, fixed fight, fixed fight. They sent the video oh, of Senator right. John McCain, and that's what launched the investigation, double it. And they go, we're already investigating it. <laughs> so everybody knew. You know, there's, you know what? I'll tell you something. If anybody that watches a fight, I don't care what fight it is, I'm able to tell you who's going to win the fight by just looking at their cornermen. The relationship between the cornermen and the promoter. Think of that. If our friend here is promoting a fight and he has a, he has a 
understanding that you're bringing in your fighters. That promoter wants your fighters to win so he can use you for the next show. That's what boxing is. And what was Strawberry saying to you in your corner? Oh, he had no knowledge of it. Paul did it. Nobody knew the fight was fixed except me because I didn't want to tell him. But it goes back to when Bones Adams fought Polly Ayala for the featherweight championship of the world. I made more money from betting on boxing, the under and over, than who's going to win. That's what boxing's about. But then you have your, your legitimate people in the game, your Mayweathers. You, 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 know, you have some fighters in the game that are, are true champions. Please, do not get it, don't get it twisted. There's some phenomenal fighters. But you know, every fighter wants to have an easy fight because you're trying to get to the promised land of that big fight. I'll give you a great example. That kid here, he's from England. I can't think of his name. He won the gold medal. He just retired. Really nice kid. I think he's, uh, I think he's uh, Iranian or I forget his name, man. Any clue? Amir Khan. Oh, Amir Khan. Salt of the earth. Great guy, but couldn't spell boxing. And everybody he fought since then has knocked him out, you know, but a great guy. But see, even out here, um, Frankie Warren, the big promoter, they take him to that level. So it's not saying fixed, but it's saying, get me an opponent that's less than my fighter. That's why I gave you that decoxy of you and Jen. Get me that fighter. Do you understand what I'm saying? A man knows who he could beat. You look at another man, you go, I can whip his ass. Well, that's what promoters do, and they take it to that level, they bet on it, they get you 20 and 0, 30 and 0, and then they sell you out for the title shot. That's what boxing is, is about. Gotcha. So you end up in LA County Jail, and a kid reading a paper looks up at you, someone moves to your right, what happens next? I don't want to talk about it. Okay, we can okay. Go past that one. All right, so then you get taken to Norwalk Superior Court. And... Bailiff Rick appeared. You, you get sentenced to life in prison, but you don't get credit for your time served, do you? That's, that's the... What they did was, it was a double uh, fuck you in the ass. It was not only are you going back to prison, but now you're a new commitment. I go, wait a minute, what are you doing? I just did 30 years. I'm out to court on bail. No, we resentenced you to a new 25 to life. They gave me a victor number, a new prison number, and I wasn't eligible to go to the pro board till 2043. So I returned back to prison. And for the next 10 years, I put myself in the law library and I fought for my freedom because it was wrong. I should have been given credit for 30 years. I would have been eligible for parole on my return since no new crime was committed. But because the system puts their foot on your neck and expects the weak to just fall away, I refused. And that's when I told you, Michael Thompson, the fellas, everybody, Rick Stevens, they all said, go get him, champ. And I, I found a way to go back. I challenged my release. Um, there was a, the warden, who I told you I had known for years. Um, he had the counselor called the Department of Justice and the Attorney General in California. And sure enough, they corrected it. And they took my V number, gave me back my original prison number that I went to prison for, gave me credit for the 30 years, and ordered the court to find show cause why I shouldn't be released. And when they couldn't find show cause why it couldn't be released, I was ordered free. But I had to serve another 10 years. And early in that stretch, they put a sex offender in with you as a cellmate. Really? Yes. You don't know this, and he offers you $500 to read his case paperwork? Yes, at that time in prison, I was doing, I had, study law I'd receive you know I, I need for you to understand I received my associate and my bachelor's degree and I was doing paralegal I was doing immigration cases divorce cases I, w I was in the law library I was a legal eagle as they call him in there and they put a kid in my cell and I thought he was a homie he looked like a regular OG kind of guy and 
he said, hey, I give you $500. I got 200 years in prison. Here's $500. If you could find a way to get me out, like you got Boxer out, like you got the other kids out. And I read the file, and for years he had been molestating his stepdaughter. The stepdaughter told a kid in school after five years of molestation. The kid told the principal. They arrested the they arrested the the stepfather, and here he was in my cell. And I'm reading how he sexually abused her and received the two hundred years. And and um, she had particular damage, didn't she? That you read about. She, there was so much scar tissue on her anus that they couldn't tell how long she had been molested. And when I read that, I pulled him off the top bunk and proceeded to, uh, I, he was my rag doll till the next morning. I did things to him that uh, no man should have done to him. Do you think the guards did that deliberately and put him in with you? Well, you know, that, that was my maybe 12th time I've done that to molesters. So maybe so, I, I, I can't say for sure. But after that I was never, I spent the rest of my sentence single-celled without a, a cellmate because I was prolific in attacking child molesters in prison. And I'll do it out here. 27 Even, in total. 27. And I think they should add it to my boxing record. Because no, no man, if you're a man, no man should touch a child or a woman. I could be the baddest son of a bitch on earth. I could get up right now and do whatever the fuck I want to do to anybody and nobody could stop me. But I would never touch a woman or touch a child. You could judge me for being the killer I was. But no one, no one, no child should be touched. No woman should be touched. And what do you think about these priests who get away with it because they just get moved around the country and the, the, the church doesn't? I think there should be more men like you doing more stories about that than guys about prison. Do about that. Do about a father, Dennis Lyons, in Los Angeles that he molests from the 1970s and gets caught, goes to prison, gets out, and the Catholic Church still gives him his retirement. They sent him, and, and I tell you, and I tell your viewers, Father Dennis Lyons, St. Genevieve's, 1973, molesting hundreds of children. And they send him, they promote him to other churches to molest other kids. It's like they're the minor league molesters in baseball, like a, like a soccer team. You got the little minor leagues and the majors, that's the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church says, hey, you're a winner. You're a, you're, you're, now you're a padre. Go get them. And the church knows about it. They've already passed out multi-million dollars. And why? Why? Tell me why they're not being held accountable. Because the church has got so much money, they use it to insulate them. They bring in fancy lawyers. I watched this documentary called The Sins of Our Father. He had about 200 victims going down to little, tiny, little, almost baby-aged kids. And all they did was move him 20, 30 miles from where they, they told the families, oh, this, will, this is stopped now, this is never going to happen again, blah. They just moved him 20, 30 miles, and he just did it again and again and again and again. And when the police did get involved, they have such high-priced lawyers, this guy was getting slaps on the wrist. All right, going back to May 2009 then, you had an appeals court hearing, and they said to you, with all due respect, and this is for you, I mean from this from my heart. And then he, President Commissioner Anderson just overrode you and said, let me tell you this, you had a chance to talk. Now it's my chance. Okay, now let me tell you this. It's not about you. It's about the state of California. This is not about your ego and all the things you've done. We recognize those things you've done and we've read them. This is not about you. You are no different from anybody else. You have complied with what the rules are in CDCR. The rules say you have to program. You don't have any special privileges. Nobody does. You're saying, I've been the best I can. He says, but I'm saying, and here's the problem for you, sir, that you need to work on. Your start date is 2004. 
here's the issue. You should receive a, a grant. Our charts allow us to calculate the grant from when the lifetime starts. They have it starting in 2004. Yeah. So you have to re they reset the clock completely on you. Like I, I just committed the crime. Oh my God. I mean, are they even able to do that? They're able to do whatever they want to do if you don't say something. It's like going out on a date and he grabs a titty and then he grabs your neck, then he grabs your ass. If you allow it, it's going to be done. I just refuse to allow it. And that's, that's, that's the fight I was in then, again. And here's some of your response. I'm amazed how saving this officer's life and being free for two years didn't even come out of either one of you. I'm amazed. I'm mind-boggled how I suffer every day getting beaten and saving her life and it just goes in the wind. I'm amazed I've been free for two years. I got denied for two years, the same two years I was free. Think about that. Mm. Think about that. Psychologically, man, that's just enough to destroy anyone. But you can't. You can't. You know, that, that, to be sentenced again to life and, and, and to explain to them, you know, it's, it's, I can't even speak on it. Did you have hope in your lawyer at that point? He, he said to you, I will leave a record for our appeal and I will get you free. No, because he wanted 150000 So I figured I'll do it again. And that's uh, when I took the... You know, it's, it's funny. As soon as you say that, Sean, I stop and I think, and, and I know it sounds bizarre, but Michael comes to mind. Michael. Michael Thompson. Yeah, because Michael instilled in me what to do and how to fight the fight. See, that's what I got from Michael. I don't, I don't care if he's you know out there, if he's, he's, a, he's a recluse, or egocentric. I don't care that. But he had a legal mind that was something I have never seen. <laughs> and he instilled upon me to fight the fight and fight the good fight. See, when you have facts on your side and you have truth on your side, and you could just get that. There's people in the world that'll see that. And that's what that warden did when he ordered his counselors in the prison to say, no, no, we're not going to do this. Sacramento said to put me under the prison. To bury you. To bury me. Even though you saved that woman's life. It didn't even matter. Some officers said the bitch shouldn't have been working here because they had just started letting women work in prison. I had officers say, fuck her, she should have been raped. So no, but I didn't do that. And I decided to fight the fight. And see, no matter what anybody could say, Mr. Atwood, no matter what anybody could say, when you can open your mouth and what comes out of your mouth can be factually verified, when I tell you something and you could read the court transcripts, how real is that? As real as it gets. It makes me feel so good when you read what they said, Mr. Anderson. Or they say, we don't know what you were doing for two years. You could have been committing crimes. And I was like, no. I was working with the FBI to fix fights. I was working with Senator McCain. You know, and it's so bizarre, but I had to do another 10 years. And, think you, of, think and, of you, that. and you wrote to McCain to try and help you. I wrote to him, but there was so much clusterfuck between him and his, his, his boy. I could never get directly to him. And that's what was sad. And I know if he would have, and I, I mean this with my heart, I really love Senator John McCain for what he went through in Vietnam and the man that he was and what he stood for. He's like one of the last standing monuments of America for me. I grew up with Senator John McCain from Vietnam, prisoner, Hotel Hanoi, the shit he went through. So when he, he told me, when the agent said, Senator McCain said he's going to name the bill after you. I believed it. And I thought I was doing something good and everybody was in my corner until I got sentenced to 25 years to life again as a new commitment. I shouldn't, I should, I, if I was, if I didn't fight this fight, I wasn't scheduled to go to the pro board till 2043. So me being here with you is remarkable in itself. But I said no, and I used what Michael taught me and Sirhan taught me to fight the fight, but to be true in it. See, that's the thing people get caught up in. It's a clusterfuck. If you speak the words, if I tell you I saved the life of an officer, yeah, right, right, right. 
If I tell you I was sentenced twice to 25 years to life and served 40 years, yeah, right, right, right. But I could show you the documentation and the court transcripts. And my response is, shut the fuck up. This is my life. Mm. What a life. A new man walked into Joey's cell. He hit Joey's right eye, then delivered a hook, then connected a headbutt and broke his... He ended up breaking his typewriter over the guy's head. What was that about? I don't want to talk about it. Okay. So, this last 10 years, Joey, what institution were you in? Um, when they sent me back, uh, be, be, because of what with the officer and my affiliation, and I was sent to Mule Creek State Prison in um, Ione, California, in the middle of nowhere. Did you have a cellmate at that point? No, I was on single cell status because of beating the child molesters. I'd be when you when you do what I did. They when you beat your cellmate. They make you single cell status, which is a beautiful thing. Oh, single cell is beautiful. I don't have to, <laughs> I don't have to hear you, smell you, or see you. Farting, shitting, pissing oh, all, all day, all stuff. night. Man. What was the cell like inside? Just the your bathroom. Mm. Imagine your shower being my your bathtub being my bed, and the same. You know, I, I reflect upon Paul Molitor, one of the great players, when you asked me that. And I remember that uh, I was told about all the cocaine and drugs he was doing. And he was a thousand hits away, a hundred hits away from 3,000. And uh, I told him, go in your bathroom. That's where I've been for 30 years. You're living next to someone who's, if you've got a cellmate, who's doing all that business as well. Uh. Yeah. So what were your neighbors like, though? Well, my neighbor, I had, I was next to Tex Watson. Oh, at this point you get next to Tex? Yeah. And you, you and him don't get along? No, you know, I'm cordial with him, but I knew that he was a facade. You know, he was, uh, you know, I love Jesus, here's my Bible, but, you know, you got a joint. You know, it just, it, it just, he, Tex just was a person that you had to watch constantly because he was watching you. Does that make sense? Did he, did he have his own clique? No, he was by himself completely. He didn't ride with it with the whites, the black. He just, he, he carried, the Bible let him. See, a lot of guys go to prison. People don't understand this. You can't be touched if you say that you're a man of God. So a lot of cowards go to prison and they pick up a Bible. They've never read the Bible, but they tell people that they're a Christian. So no, they're off. off off bounds, out of limit. And they even start getting the Jesus and Mary tattoos and everything, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. they have their own crew. Wow. And was he a quiet prisoner? Very quiet. Another Sirhan. Tex doesn't talk to anyone or anything. He's with his head down, he goes and comes, and that's it. But um, I, I, I wouldn't trust, I, I never trusted him as far as I could see him. So this period of your incarceration, was it calm, or were you beefing with anyone? You know, this this was calm because you have to remember, Sean, I just got resentenced to 25 to life and had a new prison number. They they disrespected me taking my old prison number because I was very proud of my old prison number. It had 30 years to it. And when you're in prison and you have an old number. Now you got a fish number. Yeah, now I got a fish number like I just drove up. And I'm trying to, and everybody's like, I mean, I liked having a, a C number, B number. You know, I, I was C47554. Now they're on AB6927. They've already gone. My number was 30 years old. And no, I was on a mission. At that point, I was on a mission because I knew that if I didn't fight, I was going to die in here. So the warden then, who helped you, years earlier, you got in a situation with him when he was a guard? No, you got to rewind it. It, it. it was um, it was two thousand and two, two thousand and two, and it was raining, and they called me to the warden's office, and I was thinking, what did I do? You know, I haven't done nothing. My mom and dad are dead, and everybody's gone. The this could not, can't be good news or bad news. I don't know what news it is. And it was raining, and I, I, I went in apprehensive, and I sat down, and he sat me down, and there was a young kid with golf pants on and a golf shirt, and 
And he goes, he's the one. He tells this young kid and he says, sit down, boxer. And I go, oh, shit. When they say boxer, I, I'm in trouble. And he goes, you don't remember me, huh? And I go, no. He says, does this remind you of me? And there's a scar. I go, no, sir. He goes, the year was 1986. We were in Tracy, DVI. You told me take the badge off and the vest off and come in my cell, and I did. And you left me, and then I remembered, boom, oh, yeah. That his partner was saying, enough, enough, let him off, boxer. Because that back in 86, you could tell a cop to come in your cell and you guys would fight. And then he told his son, he goes, that's my son. He's going to Stanford, and he's on the golf team, and I've told my son about you since he was small. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and he said, what, I, he said, I heard that you're back. I go, you know, you, you know, Warden, I, I, and I told him the story. I, I came back, but they tried me as a new commitment. He goes, no, no, no. You've been in since I was a rookie. He said, let me see what we could do about that. And there was a young counselor, just came back from Iraq, about five feet tall, ball-headed, little bulldog, hated everybody and everything. But he liked me. And he called the AG, he called everyone, because the warden gave him permission. And sure enough, one day they called me to R&R, &R, receiving and release. They took a new picture of me and they gave me my old number. Oh shit. They gave me credit for 30 years. But here it was 10 years later. Remember, this was 2002. Now we're at 2014. And I'm sick. You know, I'm, I, I've, I have hep C. I got cirrhosis. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm with Jimmy McElroy from the Westies. Mm -hmm. He died the next week. This is all in that same time period. And then Rick Stevens from Tower of Power. This is... Do you remember going to the canteen? Yes. Okay. I would go to the canteen with Tex Watson, Rick Stevens from Tower of Power, you're still a young man. <laughs> and he'd be singing songs while we're in line. <laughs> and James McElroy, Jimmy Mac, the meat wagon. The meat wagon. Is, and they're all dead. I'm the only one still alive, man. Wow. Is that incredible? Yeah. I'm so blessed that you're letting my story be told. The, pub <laughs> the public are blessed to hear it, man. They're going to be like. But you don't know what it means to me. Oh, brother, everybody, thank hey, brother, you. everybody's thank dead, bro. Thank you, John. Brother, everybody. Me and Michael Thompson are the only ones two alive, yeah. and he's in his 70s. Mm. Thank you, brother. Thank you for coming all this way. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Yeah. amazing. So, so another lady who, who played a role in this then was Sister Mary Sean. Sister Mary who, Sean. Who's she? She's a Catholic nun that would look out for the lifers and try to get you set in a program when you're released, if you're released. She worked with all the lifers. And I met her years earlier because um, she would do fundraisers. And they would do fundraisers to raise money, and I would donate my artwork. Mm -hmm. And then I'd have my celebrity friends donate memorabilia to raise money for the Catholic Church in Los Angeles. And with that money, she would clothe and feed the kids that got out. She was a big part oh. of my life, a big part. So how exactly did she help you? Wrote letters to the parole board, told them I wasn't what they thought I was, that I was a good man, all the work I had done with her and her, her children. I'll read a bit of a letter, actually. So, dear Board of Parole Hearings member, my letter affirms Joey in his release back into the community, has served 30 years in prison. He has used his incarcerated years well to grow into maturity, sensitivity, improve himself educationally, and to expand his marketable skills. He's an excellent artist, exceptional talent. Likewise, it would not be an exaggeration to say that the way in which he has used his talents to help at-risk youths is extraordinary. His involvement and presence in programs such as Boxers Against Drugs, New Mexico's Youth Development Inc. have given at-risk youths an example of hope and change. His dedication to helping others is remarkable. Through the Partnership for Reentry program, we support him in housing at Francisco Home, blah, blah, blah. Talks about the housing then. I also offer a position in the Office of Restorative Justice when he is released. 
The position is for clerk in the Partnership for Reentry Program, a mentoring program that supports parolees upon release. This is a volunteer position to help with the transition. The position would include filing letters, uh, write, letter writing, phone calls, computer work, generally supporting us in our work to reintegrate parolees into society. Additionally, PrEP works in partnership with blah, blah, blah. Um, Joey's years of detention have given him a new perspective of life and a desire to be a conscientious, law-abiding and self-sufficient citizen of the community. He has taken his re rehabilitation seriously and has proven this by his active involvement in BAD, YDI and countless other at-risk youth orphan organisations. Surely the prophet Isaiah speaks to the justice system when he says, Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says the Lord, speak tenderly to Jerusalem. He has served his term. I implore you to cons consider finding Mr. Joey Torrey suitable for parole release when he appears before you. I remain... Sister Mary Sean Hodges. I mean, having that support behind wow. you. How did it feel? Wow, that's powerful. <sighs> so then you got called to legal mail from loudspeakers and you were handed a letter from Vacaville. Um, you you read to the point you were standing in the, in the middle of the yard while a soccer game was going on with people yelling at you Councillor Bond had informed the old Captain David Arnold about your case and the lack of parole Captain Arnold was now Warden Arnold and violated the unwritten rule of state administrators and he went to bat for you because he felt he saw the change in you and he had known you as an inmate who had saved the officer. After everybody said I didn't do it, and I got assaulted, I got a plate put in my head and stabbed in the neck, it took Dave Arnold to say, he did that. That means a lot. And what was everyone's response to you after that? Why isn't he free? Why is he still here? 40 years later. So they tried to stop you getting out uh, based on history of violence, breaking the rules. The 76-year-old commissioner's voice rasped as she compared Joey to, blah, 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 to Mr. Ramirez, who served his time. Um, his parole was denied. Joey stated, Respectfully, ma'am, commissioner, how can I be considered a threat when I was released for two years Travelling the world and never even committed a traffic ticket. Good response. I was free for two years and every time my car went past 55 miles per hour, I slowed thinking of this day and how I was to turn myself in on the first 24th 04 and how proud you all would be of me. An old time life were released after serving 25 years and returned. The Commissioner responded unfortunately you were released but i am going to solve this right now because i'm tired parole denied until tw until 2013 oh. that must have been heartbreaking then in definitely at that point the hearing did ne not even mention the officer you saved from being raped whose, whose life you saved but don't they get rid of that commissioner as well in the coming years after that hearing and then you're able to get some play. On June 1st, 2012, Joey watched over at Life in Mitch, released on parole, who had served half the time he had. One had not even been born when Joey had arrived in prison. Each had served 15 years of a life sentence. Each of them had attorneys. But you'd spent many years pondering how to raise the 10,000 because you didn't have access to the resources anymore. I had given all my money to the youth and the kids, so yeah. I was broke. I should have given 10% like those those Catholic f freaks say to the church, but I didn't because when I heard that kids needed stuff, I went through all my money. I went through I went through I went through a lot of money taking care of kids because after I started taking care of kids, everybody would contact me to take care of kids. 
So I couldn't say no to kids. And I ended up, when I needed money, there was nobody there for me. Because in the system that if you don't have money, you can't be free. If you can't go to a parole hearing with an attorney that's representing you, you're fucked. I mean, I know some people that were looking at 200 years and, and they had the money to obtain an attorney and ended up doing four or six. That's because they had the money to do it. Well, how about the person that doesn't have the money? Justice shouldn't have a price. Justice should never have a price. The scale should be even. No man should be judged by his money or his color or the creed or his religion. But when you say that, when I see guys that came in with horrendous crimes and they were just doing 10, 15 years and they were lifers, that's because they were the kids that had family that had money. Money talks. So then McCain's boxing bill came into effect and we spoke early, you wrote to McCain. You didn't get any play there. And by now we're at 2012. So what changed then as you got closer to your release? I uh, diagnosed with hep C and being sick, you know, and knowing that if I didn't fight the fight, I was going to die there. See, that's the thing. If you do not fight, I think you understood that with me and Michael last night. You know, people don't understand that no matter what you're going through, if you do not put your foot down and say, this is enough, I'm going to fight the fight, then you're going to stay in a cell forever. I've left many of men back there that are going to die in there because they didn't have the fortitude or the balls to fight like I fought. If you know that it's right and you're right, then fight the fight at all costs. But do it right and do it proper. That's what I did. I was able to stand above and say, I can't tolerate this no more. Put my ass in the law library, filed to the court saying show of cause. The United States, California State Department of Corrections has to show cause why Joey Torres should not be released. They could not do it, and they ordered me released. They ordered me released because they were tired of fucking with me. I was litigating against them that the warden was saying enough is enough. What do you want? I said, I want to be home. And the courts, United States, California Supreme Court, ordered the Department of Corrections to say, in a repeal, show cause Arnold Schwarzenegger, show cause why inmate Joey Torres, he has received his associate, his bachelor's, he found it bad. He's anti-drug, triple A program. They, I went through every, it took me 40 years to obtain the degrees that I obtained. And yes, I am boxer from 18th Street, and I did it. And now the court ordered the parole board. So when the court ordered the parole board, and they, I went in there, and it was in front of, now it's not, it's not citizens. Now what uh, Governor Jerry Brown did in the state of California was, he brought in ex-captains, lieutenants, Captain Dave Arnold, and I went in front of them, and I loved it when they didn't say Joey, when they said, Boxer, I remember you. <laughs> Boxer, you shouldn't be here. We're granting your parole. But now it's up to the governor in 90 days to either grant it or deny it. Those were the 90th. <gasps> I was going to say, were they long days? I had a friend a great kid um, named Paul Tunis, another lifer, um, drug deal gone bad, murder, it is what it is. But at this time I had nothing. When I was in New Mexico, I would give people 10, 20,000 to hold for me and a year would go by and they'd say, hey, do you still want me to hold it? And I forgot that I even gave it to him. And I'd be like, wow, I really knew that. But that's how much money I was making selling boxing and sports memorabilia. And Paul Tunis, this this lifer, he um his family would send him packages and he'd give me half the package. He'd go to the store and say, Hey, hey boxer, you want a jar of coffee? Give me a list of thirty dollars what you need. You know how that goes, Sean. And he's still in and I'm still fighting for him. When I get returned, I'm gonna try to write a, do a writ of error quorum nobis for him, for a modification of sentence time served. 
So I, I see you and Mike Thompson teaming up when these restrictions are lifted oh, to help we, to help the guys you look, are still in. Not just the guys. I'm the whole sorry. system, changing the whole system. You got to change the system from within. You know, you have to. You know, it's like when you say break the cycle. Mom's a dauphin, son's a dauphin, family. But okay, that's staying with prison. Where I grew up at, everybody goes to prison like other people go to college. And people don't understand that. School to prison pipeline. That's what it is. I want to make a difference. If there's anybody out there that needs me, I'm there. You know, I have a passport. If, if you need me in Lebanon, if you need me in Tulsa, I'm there. I believe that I can make a difference. And, Sean, I believe that you're making a difference. I give you kudos, brother. Thank you. You know, I give you uh, what you're doing is, is so commendable, brother, because I wouldn't be here in England. This is a far away from 18th Street in East L.A., baby. <laughs> and I'm here. You know what I mean? And tomorrow I'm going to Rome and then on to Sicily. How many fucking gangsters could say that? <laughs> but I'm doing it because I have a message, and, and I, I thank you and I applaud you for helping me. And, oh. and in the future, if there's anything that I could do for you, I do. But this has been a moment in time for me yeah. because I've always wanted my story told. Mm -hmm. What a story. You know. It's out there now, brother. No stopping it. <laughs> Nothing but love, man. So what was your plan coming out after 10 years the second time? <laughs> he, he takes it as I'm always foreign him. <laughs> no, it's just that it's just like you don't you know you know how it is, Sean, in that cell. I mean anything near freedom, even the air smells different. You know, but I never thought that they were gonna resentence me to life. That's see, people need to understand that. It's like you get a traffic ticket and they go, Okay, you're gonna do a year in jail for a traffic ticket. You do the year in jail. Well then you go back to court, they go, No, we're gonna do another year. You go, No, that ain't part of the deal. So I already did a life sentence. I don't have too the human being doesn't have too many life sentences that you could do. <laughs> so I was like, you know, I'm 17 and now, you know, in 2004, I'm like, wow, I'm freaking 52 years old. And I'm like, I got to get in the law library. But see, I was blessed that I was, I, and it might sound a little bit bizarre, but I was a good inmate. I was an inmate where on the speaker when I had a visit, they wouldn't say, Joe Torres to the visit. they say, hey, boxer, you got a visit. So on the speaker, in the cops on the yard, when you're a lifer, a lifer, people cannot understand that. When you're a lifer, which means you're going to die in prison, you're respected so highly when you're a lifer. The youngsters, everybody, the guards... What does it take me to kill a guard? What are they going to do to me? Give me another life? They already just gave me two. But I turned it around, and I just became positive. And I made the sad moments happy moments because I believed that the best was yet to come. I had already, I had already beaten everything. And that's why in 2002, I just said, enough. And the warden helped me. Warden Subio helped me tremendously. I give him kudos. Wherever you're at, Warden Subio, I love you. Because he ordered his own people to say, this is wrong. When Sacramento said, when Senator McCain and the FBI and the federal government told the Department of Corrections, make him disappear. They told me that they were told to make me disappear. And I refused it. And it took people like the meat wagon. It took people like Rick Stevens, rest in peace. It took people that said, hey, champ, don't give up. Keep going. You're going to do this. And that's when I applied. And, I, and that's when that ordered. And that's when the judge ordered the Department of Corrections to release me. Enough is enough. So I'm here. I'm free. We're still fighting the fight. But I believe that there's a lot of kids out there and a lot of people out there that need to know. You know, the government is not your friend. When you, if you spoke to school kids then, what would you say to them? Listen to your mom, listen to your dad. They were once your age. And if you don't, listen to me. Do you think they know what a real gangster is, these school kids? No. A gangster is somebody that... Uh, 
comes in your home, eats your food in the fridge, and stands over your bed and asks you, what's up? Where are you from? You come to prison, you're going to shine my shoes, suck my dick, and wash my clothes. Kids don't understand that till somebody of my magnitude tells them that. And it's not scared straight. That That's a bunch of bullshit. It's sitting there and telling a kid, this is my story. This is who I am. I was 16 years old, the ABF champion at 16. And at 18, I was looking at life in prison. It could happen to you. It could happen to anybody. I used to tell the officers in there, don't drink and drive or you'll be here next to me. You kill one person, you're sitting in a cell. Just and you like wonder that. why, just like that. That's why my story needs to be told. And that's why I'm so blessed. I feel there's such a calm over me right now. I can't even put into words. You can see it in your eyes? Yeah, I'm so happy. Could you tell, tell us about the day of your release? What did you do? Well, the day of my release, I, I was so blessed because Paul Molitor, uh, before my release, he had bought me a car. And I had a car waiting for me. And... Uh, Daryl Strawberry, the great Daryl Strawberry, gave me a beautiful leather jacket, gave me ten thousand cash. So I was in I was different than any other inmate because I didn't leave with the gate money of two hundred dollars. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. See you later. I left in a limo, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I knew you. Uh, I'm sorry. I mean, I, you asked me, brother. I'm yeah, keep going. What, what happens next? Um, went to Vegas, went to, Shit. yeah, I just traveled, went up to the Omni Hotel up in the penthouse suite and called my friends and went to Vegas. And then I got a call from Top Rank. Do you want to make a comeback? And, Again? Yeah. Again? I was, like, what? I was like, no, I can't do that no more. Oh, <laughs> another fixed fight. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> but it, it, life's been good. Life's been good. I mean, life's been good. There's good there's so many good people in life. You know, you meet people along the way and you just know. <laughs> but uh, life has been good to me and people have been good to me. And if you're good to people, it comes out. You know, when you can say you have the same friends you had since childhood, that means something. When you can say that, you, you know, I left. I'm, I'm, I'm going to just tell you a little story. So I'm leaving California. I'm, I'm talking to my my best friend, Rick. Rick, Rick is, uh, I, I got to tell you this story. So I get out of prison. You asked me what happened. Yeah. This is a great one. I get out of prison, and because of my uh, post-traumatic stress of doing 40 years and not being able to get a job because nobody wants to hire a thug, I can't sing or dance. All I know how to do is fuck you up, and nobody's paying anybody to fuck nobody up. The beautiful state of California made me... Uh, uh, SSI, which is I'm, uh, I'm post-traumatic stress, and they give me nine hundred dollars a month to to live on, and they gave me a home, Section Eight HUD, and I was I was really grateful for that, and I was looking for a house. This is, this goes back to when I met you, Sean, <laughs> and I'm I, I I'm looking for a house that accepts Section Eight, which means the state of California will pay the rent, I don't have to pay rent, so I have free rent for the rest of my life. And I get $900 a month for the rest of my life. But while I was in prison, I had six figures. In yeah, prison, in prison, as an inmate. I was making six figures selling autograph Emmett Smiths and Daryl Stra and doing, representing some of the top world's athletes from prison. But now here I am released after 40 years I'm getting SSI, Social Security, $900, and free rent in the hood in a place that you wouldn't even park your car at or let your dog take a piss on. <laughs> have, I, have, I, have I come a long way? And I'm looking for this house, Sean, and I see it. It says, contact Ricardo Uribe. I go, wow, Ricardo, you okay? So I call him. He says, let's meet at McDonald's. I meet with him. He says, hey, uh, you, you could take my house. He goes, uh, so where are you from? I go, I'm from Los Angeles. And he steps up and he goes, no, where are you from? I go, oh, shit. I go, I'm from 18th Street. He goes, I'm payaso from White Fence. 
Now, I didn't expect it because this man's driving a Beamer. He's dressed as you are, you know, and he's come to find out this kid moved from where he lived in East L.A. to my neighborhood in 18th Street, and we protected him so his kids and his family could live there and go to school. And he said, here's the keys. You're my friend. Wow. And, to, and I'll tell you, since I've been out here, since I've been in Europe, across the pond, there isn't a day that he hasn't called me every night to say, are you okay? Are you okay? He's my landlord. He's my landlord. And we've become the best of friends. And you know why I'm so proud of him? And he tells me not to tell his children. And I get so upset at him. He raised his children from the my neighborhood. His son, summa cum laude, USC. His daughter, college grad. And this is a guy that was raised. And I said, the only difference between me and you, Rick, is that you went that way. And I went that way. He's married to a beautiful woman, Joya. They live in a million dollar property in West Covina. I mean, I mean, I tell him all the time how proud I am of him. But that's what good friends do. So I've surrounded myself and insulated myself with only the best of people that care for me. That's what I've done since I've been out. That's an important life lesson for anyone. So how have you found your stay in the UK? I wish I wish that I could stay here because it's the people are just so genuine and and so kind. You know, I, every place I've gone people are just so kind. How you doing? Good morning. Cheers. And I'm like, wow, this is like a fairy tale over here. It's peaceful, isn't it? You know, I told my wife last night, my beautiful wife, Arcelia. I said it's so beautiful. You don't see the cops anywhere. It's so beautiful that I'm not going to die today. Because where I live, if there's not a helicopter... You know, when you when you hear a gunfire every day... I'm sorry, excuse me. But when you hear the gunfire, and it, you're so used to it that your wife says, Oh, that's a forty-five, And I go, No, that's an AK-47. So we make comments on the gunfire that we hear, and then we look on TV to find out who died. That's the life I lead. So coming over here, I really don't want to go back, but coming over here, you guys don't know how blessed you are here. Mm -hmm. You don't know. You guys want to stab somebody? That's old school, you know? But you don't know how blessed you are here until you come to where I'm from. So if, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. It's quite safe here, but did some young lads ask you for a pound? Oh, <laughs> oh, you got you got well, me off guard on that one. I, I I was I wanted to go get some new no new kicks for the show here, and uh, I walked by a couple, maybe five or six kids, little hooligans at the corner, and they asked me uh, for a pound and. I stopped and go, I don't even know where the fuck a pound is. <laughs> and I kept walking. Because <laughs> I didn't. I just got off the plane. I thought it was euros. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck a pound is. So they're, they're coming like, what the fuck? And uh, it, was, it was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> brilliant. But then I, in my mind, I, I looked back and, and the old me thought, I wish you will say something. And that's sad that I still have that in me, mm. you know, but, you know, you can't break it. You know, where I come from, it's always about where you're from, what set you from, what hood you from, who you represent. And that's sad. And that's why I'm hoping that with Michael Thompson and with Sean, that we could try to break that cycle. You know, I would love to go to every public school in England and say, you think you know what you know? Oh, let me tell you a story. I wish that there was programs and there was ministers and people of defense because this is a matter of defense. We're raising our children. Think of that. Our generations are coming up thinking that they're hip-hop and gangsters and thugs, and they're not. And once they're sitting in that fucking cell doing life, they don't got to experience what I experienced. That's why I'm saying there should be more attention to the youth and more attention to stopping these pedophile priests. 
If they focused on those two, I think we could change a whole society. Definitely. But it stop. It starts with the children. The children. Because these guys that asked me for a pound, they probably lived in a $2 million house. <laughs> you know, these weren't ghetto kids. These were white, cracker, better living in Guilford, freaking England, asking me for a pound. <laughs> and I'm coming from the hood over here to do this. And I'm like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> That's because every, that's because yeah, I'm done. <laughs> Joey, so the people that have been watching this then have watched all your episodes. This is the the final episode. What do you want to tell those people that have been on this journey with you? I made it. I'm here. If I could do it, you could do it. If the car don't work, fuck it. If the wife don't work, fuck her too. Do what you do. Be the best you could be. Just be the best you could be, man. With all adversities, just strive to be the best you could be. You and know? I, and I've got some information I'm going to put below the video on YouTube. It's going to be an email address for you. It's going to be your Instagram. And if people, people you're, you know, you're open to people contacting you and you'll respond to oh, them. Oh, you know, I, I do it today. I have a friend that, you know, this kid is driving him. The kid thought he was a gangster and, and was telling the mother to shut up and... And I I took him in the journey in my neighborhood and and he's okay now. You know, you, you I'll do anything. If there's anything I could do for any parent, anybody out there, uh, I'm more than happy to help. I I do this from my heart. My life has been a journey and um I wanna give back because at the end of the day when they drop that lid, it's who you are and what you've given back and I hope I've given something back today. And I thank you, brother. I thank you. And Jen, thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. We're, we're deeply honored, Joey, that you've come all this way and sat down with us for days on end now and told all these stories. And it's just so inspirational for people to see what you've been through and just come out like a spiritual warrior, ready to talk to young people and help society and campaign for the guys who are still inside. What else is there, Sean? Sean, what else is there? Exactly. No, no, you just... It's the meaning of life, isn't what it? What else is there? Money's, money, all that stuff is bullshit, isn't it? It's, it's people. It's people, people is the meaning it's of life. It's what you've done today. Yeah. It's, it's like I told you when I went in that elevator and the woman looked at me and they grab their purse and they clutch it to their chest and then I go, good morning, my dear, and you see it like... Oh, good morning. That's what life's about. It's giving love. How many people can you hurt? You could go through life hurting people, but then you get to a point when you say, hey, enough is fucking enough. Let me do, try the other way. I told you when that guy flips me off and wants to fight me driving, I'm waving now and smiling at him. Where before I was attacking him. You have to give back. If you don't give back, then who the hell are you? What have you done today to better yourself and another? That's what you should think every time you go to bed. What did I do to better myself and somebody else? That's what you should think. I was going to ask about the tattoos. What sort of reactions you get of people? Oh, I, I get, I get, you know, these were prior to, you know, I, I get it all the time. But um, I get the stares and the, you know, but where I'm from, it's nothing. Everybody has them where I'm from. It's when I leave from where I'm from that I get pulled over by TSA and immigration and the police. And, and I pull out my business card. I tell them I'm the ex-champ and then I'm okay. But it isn't what you were. It's who you are and where you're going. The past makes you who you are. The scars in your body and your heart and your soul, that makes you a better person. So, you know, whatever you do in life, just try to better. I just try to better myself every day. When I'm at the hotel, I saw all those people staring at me when you dropped me off. But I hit them with a good morning, my dear. Mm -hmm. And that's all you have to do. Just show a little kindness. 100%. So if you want to contact Joey or go on his Instagram, links will be below this video on YouTube. And what a great way to end this on a note of love and, and some big hugs. Yes. Do you want to get up there first, Jen? <laughs> It's my people. I'll help you out. Oh, right. oh, absolute pleasure. Always, always. Oh, brother, man. Wow, fantastic. Yeah, well done, well done, well done. Let's make a difference. Yeah.